everyone, welcome to the Samsung AI Forum 2021. So my name is Jessica Lee and I'll be your MC for this special occasion. So it's very happy to greet all of you to the Samsung's fifth journey, finding A with all of you. And actually we're very fully packed with insightful speeches and words this year as well. So let's get started the first day of the fifth Samsung AI Forum. So today, along with world-renowned professors and researchers in the AI industry, we will share the latest AI research trends and explore innovative directions under the theme of AI research for tomorrow through programs prepared by the Samsung Advanced Institute of Technology or SAIP. And we do also have Q&A sessions and a panel discussion to satisfy your curiosity. And after that, the Samsung AI Researcher of the Year Award will be announced. So please stay with us until the very end and experience diverse events that we have prepared for all of you. First of all, we will start today's forum with some opening remarks by Kinam Kim, Vice Chairman of Samsung Electronics. So ladies and gentlemen, let's meet our Chairman Kim. Dr. Kim, the floor is yours. It is my honor to open the fifth Samsung AI Forum. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you joining us globally. As we did last year, we are meeting online again, but I sincerely hope that we can convene face-to-face -face meeting next year. Thank you to everyone who took time out of your busy schedules. I am especially grateful to our esteemed speakers from all over the world. The world is now transitioning to the post-pandemic stage. Consolidated worldwide efforts to count COVID-19 are finally taking effect. During the difficult times of the pandemic, our communities have adapted to a new lifestyle without physical contact. Digital transformation has been accelerated in every industry to which data science and machine learning are essential. I wish that we all emerge from this difficult period having learned valuable lessons, whether they are personal or professional. In recent years, artificial intelligence has shown both algorithmic advances and has had major impacts in the world, such as in medicine, the sciences, and industry. Continued research on transformer architectures went beyond natural language processing toward multimodal learning combining language and computer vision. Deep learning models of graphic data are intensely studied in the context of chemistry and materials. The unprecedented speed of COVID-19 vaccine development was only possible with the help of AI that analyzed large amounts of real world data. AI models have also revolutionized the long-held challenge of predicting biological protein folding. In industry, both startups and big companies are increasingly applying machine learning computer vision, and lava tips to improve their products, services, and in manufacturing while respecting privacy. In the future, AI may ultimately provide solutions to some of society's major challenges, such as climate change and environmental pollution. We expect the impact and the success story of AI increase in the future. But Challenges still remain to ensure AI is scalable, sustainable, and responsible. Samsung continues to be a key technology supplier to the AI ecosystem by providing memory and processing components that underpin many AI computing systems. We are also actively applying AI to optimize our development and manufacturing processes. We at Samsung are open to discussing how to tackle important common problems with researchers from all over the world 
and we hope that the Samsung AI Forum can help facilitate that goal. Today, we are thrilled to have an opportunity to discuss with seven of the most prominent and passionate professors and researchers from both academia and industry. I firmly believe that we can find inspiring ideas from the speakers and have fruitful discussions on the present and future of AI for the benefit of humankind. Thank you. Dr. Kim, thank you very much for your meaningful words. And the next, Professor Yoshua Bengio of the University of Montreal will deliver the keynote speech. So, one of the field's greatest scholars, he was the 2018 winner of the Turing Award, often referred to as the Nobel Prize of the AI industry. And last year, he was named as Samsung AI Professor, and he is currently co-chairing this forum with Ku Yongjin, President and Head of the Samsung Advanced Institute of Technology. So, let's meet Yoshia Bengio. Professor, now you have the floor. Hello, my name is Yashua Bengio, and today I would like to tell you about a new machine learning tool for scientific discovery called GFlowNets. So this is in the context of what people call black box optimization, or maybe I should rename it black box exploration. That can be applied in many settings of scientific discovery, and I'll give examples in the context of discovering new drugs, but the same methods could be used to discover new materials, to search for good control settings of a unknown black box process. Um, and in fact, one of my motivations for uh, this approach is in the context of um, causal discovery to discover good causal models and good explanations for observations. So in these settings, what we have is a an oracle, a black box that uh, you can think of um, a plant or the real world or an experimental setup that we can um, query, that we can make experiments over, that we can try some configuration of inputs X. So these inputs or queries X, they enter into this black box and we get some number out, F of X. So F is a scalar and F is an indicator of how good was our choice of X, right? So for example, how good is that molecule? And maybe the answer comes from an experimental assay. So that's F, we don't know what's going on inside it, but we would like to find high values of F. We'd like to find X's whose F is large. So we're looking for in one extreme, just maximizing F, but more generally, we like for um, obtaining a large number of good solutions, a diverse set of solutions. So there is a, a notion of diversity here. And there's also a notion of exploration because we're going to be able to query that oracle many times uh, through a number of rounds. Initially, when we don't know very much about F, uh, we're going to be more in an exploration mode. We're going to try different values of X that are diverse and allow the learner to get some kind of understanding of what's going on inside F. Uh, near the end of uh, those uh, rounds, when we have acquired information and it's going to be maybe our last chance to, to try something, we might be more in the exploit mode of uh, reinforcement learning. So there are connections to reinforcement learning, um, but also differences. But there are also connections to active learning. So the classical active learning, also called pool-based active learning, works like this. We, we have an oracle like before, so it's a function from uh, inputs x to um, some scalar. Here, uh, maybe it's going to be the loss that we make if we choose a particular um, uh, X. And uh, we also have um, a set, a pool of examples 
uh, a set of examples S um, uh, for which we don't know the answer and we would like to call the Oracle to know the answer. So at each stage of the active learning, the learner is going to actively ask for questions. Whereas in traditional machine learning, we just observe a set of examples and then we learn from it. Here, uh, in addition to the examples we already have, we can ask questions. We can say, well, for this image, what is the right label? So uh, this, is, this is active learning. And um, the problem with uh, that approach is in many cases, we don't have this fixed set of um, Xs of, of configurations. Instead, uh, we would like to be able to ask any question in a high dimensional space where there's an exponential number of possible configurations we could ask an answer for. Now, the important lesson from the literature in active learning is about how we choose those queries, those, those questions we're going to ask. And a central idea here is we, we want to estimate the uncertainty in our predictor F. In other words, we would like to choose questions that are going to give us as much information about the function we're trying to estimate as possible. And I'll come back to that. Now, the problem with uh, pool-based active learning, as I said, is um, uh, we can't enumerate, for example, all the molecules and then um, uh, you know, just query the ones that uh, have a high uh, uncertainty. We need to uh, somehow deal with an exponentially large number of possible questions. So the principle that uh, I'm proposing to follow and others have already started doing is what I call generative active learning. So this is maybe the most important message of, of this talk that when the learner can choose the questions on which they want the real world to provide answers, which experiments should be done. A good way of doing this in high dimensional space is to train a generative model that is going to sample good questions. Now, how are we going to train it? Well, okay. So first of all, with the questions we have already asked, so on the right hand side, you see the real world and, and we have asked some questions, some queries, uh, we've done experiments and we've noted the results of these experiments in a data set. So, so with that data set, we can do traditional machine learning. We can learn a model like uh, predict y given x. Now, um, that's good. So it, 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 we can use that model to uh, sift through potential questions. And, uh, and, and you know, if uh, we find a question that has a high score according to that, that model, like maybe high uncertainty, then uh, this could be a good question. The problem, as I said, is that there are too many possible questions. So having that predictor of how good a candidate experiment is, is not sufficient. So we're going to train this generative model, but we're going to train it in a way that's a bit different from usual generative models. Usually we train generative models with a fixed set of examples. Here we have a function that is the function computed by the, the world model that tells us how useful we think a particular experiment could be. So, so we're going to have this special way of training a generative model that looks for um, generating configurations that have a high score. And, uh, and I'll tell you more precisely how we can do that. Um, there are potentially many ways of doing this, but um, if the goal is not just to optimize, but to find a diversity of good solutions, then a reasonable approach is to convert the score we're getting from the world model into a kind of reward function, such that what we're trying to do with the generative model is not maximize reward, but rather sample questions that have a high reward. So sample them with probability proportional to the reward. And we can define the reward any way we want so that it's kind of, you know, it's monotonically increasing with uh, our, uh, what our model says would be a good thing. Um, but now we have a mathematical problem. How do we convert a reward function into a generative model 
that can sample uh, with a probability proportional to that reward function. So in principle, we can write it down, right? P, T of X, here's the uh, probability of sampling from our generative model uh, should be equal to R of X, the reward normalized over all possible rewards. But you can see that that normalization is huge. That's the problem we have in the first place. And there is a tool uh, in the toolbox of probability that in principle can do that. It's called Monte Carlo Markov chains. The only problem in, is that in these high dimensional spaces and for the kinds of data we typically care about, this uh, MCMC can be very, very slow. In fact, intractable to really find um, a diverse set of solutions because of what's called the mode mixing challenge. Let me explain a bit. So the way that MCMC methods work is that they start from an initial guess, like an initial question, and they will make small changes to it, um, local changes, small perturbations, and then they will typically accept or reject those changes such that you tend to make moves towards more probable configurations, higher reward configurations. And if you do this uh, with the right uh, mathematical methods, um, uh, eventually the, the chain of samples converges to samples from the correct distribution. But the eventually can be very long. In fact, it can take exponential time for this chain to visit uh, you know, the, all of the modes or just even a large majority of the modes, the modes being the regions of high reward, of high probability. And the problem is that when two modes are far from each other, uh, it, it could take a lot of time, uh, like crossing the desert, to go from one mode to another. So, you know, a decade ago, I would have said, this is hopeless. Uh, we can't apply MCMC on things like images or molecules or high dimensional objects like this, where there are many modes and they can be separated by, uh, you know, large spans and those modes occupy a small, vol small volume, so we can't just go and randomly try things. Um, but here comes machine learning. So instead of this kind of blind process that accumulates trials and doesn't extract useful information from them, we can use machine learning. So let's say we have already visited these three modes, uh, as we see on the right. And, and, and let's say we are lucky that there is structure in the distribution that, uh, in fact, uh, we notice, I mean, the learner notices that the three modes we have found are sitting at uh, points of a grid. So maybe like the fourth point on that grid here is a good place to try. So this is generalization, or in fact, this is called systematic generalization, where we can generalize far from the data. So that's it. That's the trick, right? We're going to use machine learning to generalize from the modes we visited that we've seen in places where it worked well to guess other places where it works well, All right? And we have been developing a particular method for this uh, that I call GFlow Nets, generative flow networks. So it's a kind of generative model and um, it's used to generate questions or objects that are structured so that the way that we construct the object is through a sequence of actions. We don't generate it in one shot. We generate it in a sequence of actions, adding pieces, for example, to a graph in the case of molecules or adding, uh, you know, appending um, uh, uh, values to uh, a, a high dimensional set of values. Now, um, the reason we call it a uh, generative flow network is that the whole theory of it is based on thinking of um, unnormalized probabilities, which are those flows um, that go through paths. Uh, and uh, one of these paths tell us how to construct uh, a question, one, an object X. So all the paths start from a root node and end in the sync node. Um, but uh, with different probabilities, we're going to go and, and you know, choose actions and then other actions. And if you look at this directed acyclic graph, 
Um, it has an exponentially large number of paths in general. Um, and what we would like to obtain that we sample objects in proportion to uh, the given reward function is that the uh, amount of unnormalized probability or flow on the edges that are like terminal edges, that is the last thing we do when we're constructing an object, um, is exactly what we want, is, is the reward function. So in, in a way, what we can do is fix those flows. And, and now, how do we you know, arrange the flow in other edges, which means the policy for constructing the object, such that um, uh, the whole thing is a flow network? And if we can do that, uh, we're going to have what we want. That is that the uh, probability of sampling the objects um, is going to be proportional to the given reward function. So, so that's what this slide is, is talking about. Uh, a, it's a bunch of definitions and, and propositions uh, that are taken from a, a tech report uh, that, that's uh, going to be online. And uh, what all this math says is that the flow uh, corresponds to a normalized probability for events, and these events correspond to uh, a, a, a you know a set uh, properties of these trajectories that tell us how to construct an object, and and so we can also define conditional probabilities that correspond to ratios of these uh, uh, flows, and. The most important thing is there is a local condition on those flows. So we're going to learn a flow function. We're going to learn a neural net that outputs a, a number, uh, a kind of score, um, that says how much flow is going through a particular edge or a particular node. And if we look at each node and its entering edges and outgoing edges and the amount of flow entering equals the amount of flow exiting, then, uh, and if this is true for all the nodes, then the flow function uh, is, is correct. It, 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 it has learned something that makes the whole DAG uh, have really nice properties. And uh, if, if that's the case, um, oops, sorry, if that's the case, then, um, we get what we want. That is the probability of sampling an object is going to be proportional to this reward function. And to make the flows having those property in the first place, it's a, it's a local property of what's going on in particular uh, points, which we call these states uh, on, on those trajectories as we construct these objects. Um, we can define a loss function, which you can see here in the middle, which we call the flow matching training objective. And there are other loss functions that can be defined, but uh, they're all local. And they're just saying the sum of the flows entering should a state uh, ST here should match the sum of the flows exiting. And what's nice is that uh, if you think in terms of reinforcement learning, this uh, training objective can be applied in a, a using trajectories that are sampled any way we want, so long as they give non-zero probability to all possible trajectories. In other words, this can be trained offline. It doesn't have to be trained using the samples um, uh, coming from the, the policy that, that visits uh, according to the flow um, uh, of the network. Now, there's something really cool with this um, and, and a bit unexpected, which is that if we generalize a little bit this, these definitions so that um, our neural net that predicts the, the flow into an edge or into a node is now conditional. So there's like extra variables as input. Uh, well, of course, we can compute conditional probabilities and sample with conditional policies. So that's kind of trivial. But the unexpected thing is um, the when we condition on events that are happening in the uh, uh, trajectory itself, for example, uh, condition on previous states that we have visited uh, in the construction of a question, uh, we can compute uh, a form of uh, marginalization, so uh, also known as a free energy. In other words, uh, our neural net can now output 
a, a, a number that is a, an intractable sum. In other words, it's a sum over all the successors, all the different ways to continue the construction from a state S uh, of the rewards associated to all of these different continuations. And of course, uh, that means we can also compute conditional probabilities, uh, given that we have uh, started constructing and we are at a particular point in, in the in the sequence of actions, uh, we can uh, calculate and sample the probability of um, you know, getting downstream of these sequence of actions to some other state. And in fact, we can use this to compute things that look intractable, um, uh, like entropy, conditional entropy, and mutual information. Um, and so all of these intractable quantities, you might ask, um, how come we are able to do these things. Um, uh, where is it? Um, because, well, how is it possible that, that we could compute something intractable, right? Um, well, what happens if you compare to Monte Carlo or Markov chains is we have taken uh, a problem that is fundamentally intractable here to sample probabilities uh, according to an energy function or a, a reward function. And we've turned it into something that once the network is trained is easy. So we've, we've turned an intractable problem into an easy problem. But of course, what's going on is we are hiding the complexity in the training itself. So all these results that I said, we can compute um, a, we can sample with the right probabilities, we can compute these uh, free energies, these marginalizations, uh, the um, um, uh, sorry, uh, the entropies and mutual information. Um, all of these are possible only to the extent that we're able to train the, this, this G-flow net. Um, so if there is no structure in the uh, reward function we're trying to uh, learn from, then it's hopeless, right? It, it might take exponential time to train this network properly. But if we're lucky, right? Um, if there is, uh, like here, right? If, if there is structure, if, if the modes are organized in a way that makes sense that the learner can generalize, then you don't need to visit the whole space, essentially. Like exponential means you're visiting the whole space. Um, and as soon as we are in a scenario where it is possible to generalize, then uh, we, we get this sort of free write. So if we can guess, um, for example, if you look at uh, GANs or, or VAEs that are producing novel images, they are generalizing to configurations of pixels that have never been visited. And they don't need to be trained on all the possible configurations of pixels for that to happen. So generalization is happening because there is structure in the underlying um, uh, world, right? So, so this is really what is going on. Um, and, uh, and we can use these things for potentially marginalizing uh, high dimensional joint probabilities. Uh, we can use these things to represent distributions over sets, um, over graphs, because graphs are just special kinds of sets. Um, we can also train the energy function if we have data. So up to now, I've said we, we have this uh, G-flow net, which is going to learn to sample um, these queries for our uh, scientific discoveries um, from a world model that gives us a reward function. Um, but where do we get that reward function? I said we were training it from data. Um, now, it turns out that it may sometimes, it, if you want to learn a, 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 a joint distribution over high dimensional spaces, learning the full joint um, is difficult. And um, we can use the ability of sampling from the energy function to train the energy function of the model. So, so this is a, another thing you could do, right? You could use the G-flow net to train the energy function from data using classical maximum likelihood gradient. So we've been um, experimenting a bit with this uh, in the context of discovery of new molecules. So here, the space of actions 
consists in adding molecular pieces to an existing scaffold. And then at some point, one of the actions is that the, the, the learner can choose is stop. I'm done. Uh, I, I think I have a, a good molecule. Now send it to the Oracle, right? So um, we've, uh, we, we've trained this and compared with um, uh, MCMC methods, uh, as I mentioned, as well as reinforcement learning methods, PPO. And what we find is that uh, if you look at uh, the sequence of rounds where the system is, is trained, um, the, the uh, supervised learner is trained, and then the um, GFLOW and it is trained to sample uh, new experiments uh, using the, the model uh, as a reward function. And then, and then we send those queries after the GFLOW is trained to the, the overcall, the, the assays, in our case, it's, it's a in silico uh, um, oracle, uh, we find that it converges to good solutions faster than other methods. And in addition, it finds more diverse set of solutions. It finds more of the modes, the, the, uh, the, 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 the diverse set of good solutions. Uh, if, you know, in, in, in some problems where we know where the modes are, we can just count whether it found something close to the existing modes. And it, it, it finds a lot more of them. So this is very encouraging. And we're very excited about the potential applications in uh, discovery in general. Thank you very much. Oh, um, thanks. Thanks for the interesting uh, presentation. Um, my name is Stas Polanski, and uh, I, um, I work for Samsung Advanced Institute of Technology, Russia. My background is electrical engineering. So uh, guess what? Uh, I'll ask you this simple question. Molecules are great, but they're kind of small. Uh, when we talk about uh, AI problems in electrical engineering, we're talking about graphs which are much larger than molecules. Uh, what kind of graphs we're talking about? Circuits, right? Uh, how to synthesize circuits or how to place and route available Boolean gates on silicon? These kind of questions. So. Um, this kind of problems. So my question is how your method would generalize to more, uh, to larger, to larger objects like uh, circuit graphs, not molecular graphs. Any, 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 any intuition on, on this subject that would be yeah. really interesting from practical perspective. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, it's actually a fascinating question how we can deal with uh, more complex objects in general in reinforcement learning. And uh, there is a, a general issue of credit assignment through uh, long sequences of actions that uh, describe a complex object like this. Um, what I'm working on is inspired by a long tradition of work in reinforcement learning, um, what's called the options uh, framework or abstract actions. Um, and, and you, you can see connections also in linguistics to like generative grammars. So the idea in all of these things is to decompose the problem into uh, simpler pieces like divide and conquer, right? So if you try to generate a very complex object in one shot, if you want, without any structure, it's going to be very difficult to learn that. And so, um, and so we're working on a mathematical formulation of uh, the GFlow net. Uh, that, that has these uh, same um, hierarchical decomposition structure, uh, modular structure um, that, that we think, uh, you know, has already shown to be useful in many fields, but that we, we want to adapt to, to that framework. And I think it's, it's feasible. And in fact, I even think that this is how brains do it. <laughs> um, well, if you think about it, uh, when you're consciously processing something at any one moment you can only um, uh, uh, sort of uh, have uh, in your mind very few elements uh, you can then focus on like some part of it and then you know like zoom into these things but you never see if you think about programming I, I don't do circuits but I, I did programs uh, when you program you don't 
actually have the whole program in your mind in one shot. You, 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 um, you see uh, the structure uh, each time sort of only looking at a few elements together and then you can, you can zoom in that kind of uh, uh, hierarchy. Um, and so we need to incorporate that kind of hierarchy, which can be learned also. I mean, of course, you could also use prior knowledge, but, but it can be learned, uh, which, which is a, a challenge. I'm not saying we're going to solve these problems uh, like tomorrow morning, but, but I'm pretty confident that uh, we have new tools now in our hands to, to deal with that. And it could really be transformative for many um, areas of application. That's what I'm uh, hoping anyway. Thanks for your question. Thank you for the answer. I see a question from Debasis. Hello, Professor. My name is Debasis. I am from San Jose, California. We have been recently seeing a lot of surrogate models that are being uh, being used and uh, generate a lot of um, you know, um, molecules and uh, does this um, reinforcement or award-based model fit into that? Because when you generate a lot of models, a lot of uh, samples uh, from existing uh, design, um, do you think this reward-based model can fit in there? Yeah, uh, that's that's um, that's why we have been uh, developing these kinds of methods, and other groups have as well. Um, so the reason the, the reward-based approach is interesting is that you can cook in the reward all kinds of information. In particular, I talked about um, a prediction of how good we think the molecule is going to be and a prediction of how much information we're going to get in the sense that the, uh, the predictor has uncertainty. And so if we don't know the answer uh, ahead of time. It's worth doing the experiment, how, you know, how many bits of information are we going to get? So that sort of uh, uh, heuristic uh, can be cooked into the reward function. So now, now the uh, learning policy can um, be trained to generate molecules, I mean, molecular candidates like graphs that have a high reward. Um, and uh, the specific approach that I presented today says that, well, we don't want just one good solution that has a high reward. We would like to be able to generate many good solutions. And that's kind of new. And the reason why having many good solutions is important is because um, the evaluation will make might not be the final word. So in the case of, uh, of a material, maybe uh, our simulation says it's, it, it's going to be good. But uh, when we try it out, we may have some surprises. And so we better have a number of different candidates um, that correspond to different types of solutions. So we can, we can uh, try more than one and not, you know, have a bad surprise later. Thank you so much. So we'd like to extend our sincere gratitude once again to Professor Yoshia Bengio for the keynote presentation. So with that, we will start the presentations of our forum. So there will be three sessions and each session will have three presentations respectively today. So without further ado, let's get started with the first session. The topic of the first session is scalable and sustainable AI computing. Chang Yuche, a senior vice president of Samsung, Professor Kunle Alukaton of Stanford University, and Andrew Feldman, the founder and CEO of Cerebra System, will take turns presenting. To begin, Chang Yuche, a senior vice president of SAIT, will open the first session with his presentation. Toward energy efficient AI computing. The servers pictured here are a part of the supercomputer in Samsung Electronics. Samsung's high-performance computing system is used internally to simulate materials and processes and develop AI algorithms to extract the knowledge from publications in an attempt to gain knowledge from unstructured sources. Today, I'd like to talk about computing systems to support large-scale applications as AI technology continues to advance. 
Recently, AI technology has gone beyond audio, video, and text understanding. It is now being applied to solve scientific challenges, such as reducing drug development timelines, predicting the density distribution of dark matter in the universe, and analyzing astronomy data to discover new planets and galaxies. These new applications require a huge amount of data, yielding AI models that can have several trillion synaptic weights. However, the related increase in energy consumption needed to run these models emerges as the biggest challenge. For example, the GPT-3 model for natural language processing has 175 billion synaptic weights. Training that model once consumes about 1.3 gigawatt hour, which is the same amount of electricity that South Korea consumes in about one minute. In addition, the resulting carbon emission from training the model once equals the daily carbon emissions of 84,000 cars and would require 85 million pine trees to offset those emissions. To ensure a healthy planet for future generations, we need a community effort by academia and industry to pursue innovative approaches to sustainable AI computing with a strong focus on energy efficiency. Thus far, most efforts to increase energy efficiency have focused on dedicated AI hardware. However, even with the state-of-the-art GPUs, the overall utilization for training a human brain scale model of 125 trillion synaptic weights is expected to drop down to less than 10%. The decrease in utilization, even when using dedicated AI acceleration hardware, is driven by performance degradation due to memory bandwidth that does not scale as efficiently as compute capability. The von Neumann architecture requires repeatedly taking instructions and data from memory, performing computation, and then storing the output back into memory. Assuming it takes one second to process one instruction in the computing unit, it takes 2.2 hours to read one megabyte of continuous data from DRAM memory, and one and a half days to read the data from an SSD. To make an analogy to space communication, can imagine that it's like making repeated calls from a processor on Earth to memory on Mars to get data for computation. Samsung has been working to solve this scaling challenge between computing capability and memory bandwidth through innovation in memory and storage products. We are also developing near memory processing products that minimize data movement between the processor and memory and improve the effective memory bandwidth by utilizing the internal memory bandwidth. HBM PIM is a representative example of achieving this goal by executing parallel operations on a memory bank through an AI engine integrated into DRAM cell design. AXDIM applies the PIM concept to DIM memory, where an AI engine is embedded in the buffer chip this time. It is clear that energy efficiency is critical for the sustainable AI computing and the scalability between compute capacity and memory bandwidth. In addition to the innovations from Samsung, Academia and industry are also conducting research to support the same vision. Today, we are honored to have two renowned speakers in this session. Professor Kulne Olukotun, a professor at Stanford University and co-founder of Sambanova, and Andrew Feldman, founder and CEO of Cerebras. Hello, my name is Kunle Olukotun, and I'm a professor at Stanford University and also the co-founder and chief technologist of Sambanova Systems. Thank you for inviting me to speak at the Samsung AI Forum. Today, I'd like to talk to you about the future of AI hardware. There are two big trends in computing. The first is that Moore's law is slowing down, but more importantly, the companion to Moore's law, Denard scaling is dead. This means that computation is fundamentally power limited and conventional ways of building systems like using CPUs are becoming are so inefficient that they are no longer providing the performance advantages that they used to. The other big uh, uh, trend in computing is the overall overwhelming success of machine learning. We've seen incredible advances in image recognition, natural language processing, and knowledge-based creation enabled by machine learning algorithms. And these are having societal scale impact in terms of changing the way we do scientific discovery and enabling autonomous vehicles and personalized me medicine. Turns out there's an insatiable amount of computing uh, demand for building ML models, both for training 
large, huge models and for providing inference and serving large numbers of users. So the grand challenge we have is developing uh, more capable ML systems in this post Moore's law era. So what we need to do is, is provide increasing performance for ML algorithms uh, with the fact that, that Moore's law slowdown means that we are fundamentally power constrained, which means that any improvements we make must be power efficient. They must improve performance per watt. So how do we do this while providing uh, the performance uh, and programmability that you need to make sure that ML systems can continue to advance. Ideally, what we'd like is fixed function ASIC capability in terms of performance and performance per watt, coupled with processor-like flexibility uh, to allow you to develop algorithms uh, uh, very easily. So in order to provide this sort of, develop this sort of system, we need a full stack integrated solution that consists of understanding ML algorithms and their trends, understanding how to convert these ML algorithms using domain-specific languages and sophisticated compilers to run on hardware which is optimized for ML applications. Turns out that the rise of machine learning and improvements in computational power are intimately linked. This graph shows uh, on the x-axis the data size uh, and, and model complexity used to train machine learning or neural network models. And on the uh, y-axis, we see accuracy in terms of uh, solving the problem that what we're trying to solve. Could be a natural language processing, it could be image recognition. So what we sort of see is that neural networks have been around since the 50s and they've been using back propagation to train them since the early 80s. So the question is what has changed between 1980s and today to enable neural network uh, accuracy to surpass the accuracy of conventional algorithms. The key thing has been the increase in model complexity and size and the, uh, the uh, more data you use to train these models. And this has been enabled by the huge amounts of computation provided predominantly today by GPUs. So we look at uh, machine learning model trends, the overwhelming trend, of course, is the larger, more complex neural networks that are used to gain higher accuracy. And, the, you know, this is a really good example of where this is true is in transformer-based uh, natural language processing models. What we've seen with these models is that over the last uh, three years, model size and compute required to, to train these models has been doubling every two and a half months. Uh, today we have uh, GPT-3, which is a very capable model, capable of generating natural language. Uh, it's 175 billion parameters. It takes uh, multiple terabytes uh, to, in terms of, of, of memory requirements, and 1,024 GPUs and four months. And at the rate of two and a half, of doubling every two and a half months, clearly this is unsustainable, given the fact that we are already at, at the trillion parameter size. So in order to, uh, so, so what has to happen with these transformer models in order for them to be able to be, uh, to, to train ever large, more accurate models is we have to embrace sparsity. And so the idea with sparsity is instead of having a dense connection between all the neurons in the neural network, the neur uh, neurons are sparsely connected. And this put, uh, gives you a factor of 10 less computation uh, in order to train the model. The problem with this is that with densely connected uh, neurons, you can use dense matrix multiplier, which is very efficient. And with sparsely uh, connected uh, neurons, you need to use sparse matrix multiplier, which doesn't work well on conventional architectures. Another place where uh, sparsity is being used is uh, to support graph neural networks. And here the idea is to model the world uh, uh, more accurately to end up with more accurate predictions, more accurate models. And graphs, of course, can represent uh, natural language, social networks, uh, chemical networks, and so on. And uh, so recent advances have shown, shown that these GNNs can uh, result in very accurate models, but again, they need sparsity uh, and sparse computation to be effective. Another important trend in uh, machine learning is the convergence of training and inference. Currently, uh, machine learning pipelines consist of training, both pre-training and fine-tuning uh, uh, on GPUs with using large batch sizes. And then the uh, 
inference is usually done on CPUs because CPUs are efficient for batch size one where a single request comes in and an inference is, is uh, generated. In a converged platform, both the training and the inference could be done on a single platform. And this has two advantages. One, it means that you don't have to re-qualify the model when you go from the training infrastructure to the inference infrastructure. And more importantly, it allows continuous training so you can adapt the model as the data, uh, the, the, the nature of the data changes that you are trying to infer on. So there's lots of advantages to a convergence uh, of training and inference. If you look at ML algorithm uh, development, it's done using high-level frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow. And the result is a data flow graph composed of nodes that are uh, kernels, or computational kernels, and the connections between the nodes are the tensors that, that flow between the kernels. An example of the productivity gains of this kind of, of software development is shown with Google, where they reduced their language translation code from 500,000 lines of imperative code to 500 lines of TensorFlow code, which is data flow. And so we see uh, that the requirements for next generation ML hardware are, of course, massive computation that has to be energy efficient due to the slowdown in Moore's law. Support, they must support uh, terabyte sized models to uh, get state of the art accuracy. Sparsity is becoming more important both to limit the uh, size of, of large transformer based uh, models and also to support graph neural networks. And we see the convergence of training and inference being an important uh, capability. And lastly, data flow graphs are a natural ML execution model. So let's look at energy efficiency. So the key to energy efficiency is really compute and memory specialization. And if you look at CPUs today, you see that a lot of the energy in a CPU, as shown by this pie chart here, is actually not uh, spent doing computation, which is the green arithmetic slice here, but it's spent doing overhead things like uh, fetching instructions and decoding them and fetch and fetching data and the clock and control. So if you are able to minimize these overheads, then you can get uh, uh, efficient energy efficiency improvements and uh, throughput cores like GPUs uh, get to efficiencies that are a factor of 10 better than CPUs. But if you could build a specialized ASIC for your application, then the advantage in energy efficiency could be 100 to 1,000 times. If we look at GPUs, we see that a big benefit that GPUs uh, get is by having a stacked memory located on a, on a interposer, which is very close to the GPU and provides up to two terabytes of memory bandwidth between the off chip uh, high bandwidth memory and the GPU uh, die. And uh, we see, you know, on the latest GPU, uh, six stacks of HBM providing up to 80 gigabytes of memory. If you look inside of the GPU chip itself, what you'll see is a number of streaming multiprocessors that are optimized for SIMD execution and also 40 megabytes of L2 cache. So the point here is that even though you've got lots of high bandwidth memory here, 80 gigabytes is not big enough for the terabytes of, of memory that you need for these large uh, transformer-based models. Another way of uh, designing a a machine learning accelerator is the more ASIC approach uh, that has been uh, followed by, by, Google, by the Google TPU, the Google Tensor Processing Unit. And here the goal is to do very efficient matrix multiply. Uh, so they've got 128 by 128 uh, dense matrix multiply unit, which is implemented as a uh, systolic array. And uh, so there are two of them on the TPU V2 and uh, the uh, uh, guess is that there are four of them on the TPU of V3. And then coupled with uh, the, uh, uh, the, the matrix multiply units are again HBM uh, memory providing in, in the case of the TPU V3, uh, 32 gigabytes of, of memory. And there are a few instructions that can be executed because of course it's an ASIC, so it doesn't have the full flexibility of a, uh, a traditional programmable uh, device, but there are a few instructions that can be executed uh, to perform the acceleration required uh, for ML algorithms. The approach that we're taking at San Bonova kind of lies between these two extremes. It's called a reconf reconfigurable data flow unit. And the first one that, that uh, has been de developed is the Cardinal SN10. It was developed in seven nanometer 
uh, TSMC, has 40 billion transistors, over 300 teraflops of uh, floating point computational capability, and 300 megabytes of on-chip memory, and direct interfaces to terabytes of uh, uh, memory off chip and also direct interfaces to other RDUs. If you look inside the RDU, what you will see is a tiled array of specialized units for compute that we call patent compute units, PCUs, and specialized units for memory that we call uh, patent memory units, PMUs. And then they are connected together with a programmable switch. And this allows you to uh, tailor the configuration of the RDU to fit the application that you're executing. Uh, and then of course you've got uh, interfaces uh, to, to off chip. And so to understand how, reconfig how reconfigurable data flow architecture uh, provides improvement, let's look at how we execute a, uh, a graph uh, uh, from a machine learning application, right? And so the key, the key thing of course here is to get high performance by exploiting both locality and parallelism. And so if you look at, at a conventional uh, GPU architecture. Deep GPU architectures execute the uh, uh, graph, the convolution graph in this example, one kernel at a time. First convolution one executes and dumps its uh, results in the off-chip um, HBM memory, and then the pull uh, kernel executes and picks uh, the results from the uh, HBM memory and sends it back out to the uh, to to the HBM memory. And so what you have is a lot of off-chip memory bandwidth and the overhead of switching between kernels as you execute the uh, convolution graph. Contrast that with the way that we do things in a data flow uh, fashion. Uh, here what happens is that you lay out the whole graph in space on the uh, reconfigurable data flow unit and this eliminates the memory traffic between the kernels because communication happens off on chip and enables the fusion of execution uh, between multiple uh, kernels at the same time and pipeline execution. So you get very efficient use of the, uh, the, uh, the computation uh, on chip and you also get very low bandwidth off chip. So you minimize it the, the bandwidth off chip. So compiling for a data flow requires a fundamentally new way of thinking about your compiler. If you think about traditional compilers, uh, they map operations to the accelerator one at a time. So we just, you know, each operator consumes the whole of the uh, accelerator resources. And so, and then of course, as, as, as we already mentioned, the communication happens through off-chip memory. Uh, in the data flow fashion, what has to happen is you analyze the whole graph and you map the graph in space and time. And you, you have to map it in time, of course, potentially because the whole graph may not fit on the uh, uh, resources of, of the RDUs that you have uh, available. And so, you, of course, there's both a time and space component, but overall this requires a global model optimization. Of course, uh, you don't have to consider the complete graph. You can cut the graph into sections and analyze the sections uh, and then stitch them together. So we look at uh, what we're uh, able to, to do uh, with, with uh, the RDU. We can connect multiple RDUs together and each of the RDUs can be connected to terabytes of memory, in this case 1.5 terabytes of memory. And so the combination of the high co compute co capability uh, over 300 teraflops per, per RDU, the data flow efficiency provided by the spatial layout and the large access to off-chip memory enables uh, you to, to uh, train and serve very large, complex uh, models for a variety of tasks. So uh, in this case, uh, we've got a, a quarter rack uh, data scale system composed of uh, eight uh, RDUs and 12 terabytes of, of uh, off-chip DDR memory. So what we enable then is we enable you to train very large uh, natural language processing models. So for example, you could take, uh, go to a repository, repository like Hugging Face and pick up a model and, and train it. And so in, in this example, what we see is that uh, uh, 
to, to train a very large model would take uh, over 400 GPUs and 32 terabytes of HBM, and the same model could be trained on 32 RDUs and 48 terabytes, and it would be a much simpler uh, modeling exercise, right? You wouldn't have to go through the complex system em em engineering in order to exploit model and data parallelism on 416 GPUs. It would be a simple matter of using the Samba Flow compiler to take your model and map it uh, out of the box uh, onto uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the RDU. Another advantage of uh, the capabilities of the RDU is to enable true resolution full image analysis, and full image pathology. So today, to handle very large images, 20K by 20K, you need to break them into tiles or reduce the resolution. And this leads to lower quality, uh, lower accuracy models. But with true resolution, you can handle the whole image and build a, uh, one a big, uh, and build a model uh, based on the whole image. And this gives you higher accuracy, higher rep reproducibility, and uh, reduces the labeling cost because you don't have to think about labeling each of these individual 512 by 512 tiles, you can think about labeling the whole image. And so you get much higher accuracy and, uh, and a much, you know, in this case, if you're trying to find cancer, you'd uh, be able to find uh, the, the cancer much with a much higher accuracy uh, with this type of uh, uh, full, true uh, resolution image analysis enabled by RDU. And then if you look at the uh, other example, uh, I talked about this convergence between training and inference. So this shows you how you can do inference very efficiently. In this case, the deep learning recommendation model. And what we see is that uh, we can, uh, with uh, the uh, Sambanova RDU, you can be 20x better throughput and latency compared to an A100, which means, of course, that you can both uh, do inference and training on the same platform. So the future of AI hardware requires that we have massive compute with uh, high uh, energy efficiency, uh, the ability to train and serve terabyte size models, uh, the ability to support sparsity very uh, efficiently for graph neural networks and for large sparse transformer models, the ability to do training and inference as efficiently, large batch training and, and single batch inference very efficiently, uh, convergence, and so naturally and natively support data flow graphs, which is the uh, ML execution model that we get from the frameworks. So the future of AI hardware is here today with the Sambanova Systems Cardinal SN10 reconfigurable data flow unit. Thank you. My name is Andrew Feldman. I'm one of the founders and I'm CEO of Cerebra Systems. Today I'm going to talk about way for scale AI and the path to efficient compute. Cerebrus was founded in 2016. We have more than 350 engineers and offices in Silicon Valley, San Diego, Toronto, and Tokyo. Our mission is to transform compute forever. We build deep learning systems that deliver orders of magnitude more performance than the graphics processing unit. And importantly for this discussion, we deliver compute at a fraction of the power in the space. Our systems require no changes to AI software. In August of 2019, we announced that we were delivering the largest chip ever made. This was a 1.2 trillion transistor, 46,000 square millimeter part with 400,000 AI cores. In April of 2021, we announced that we had shrunk this part to seven nanometer. This is now a 2.6 trillion transistor part on 46,000 square millimeters of silicon with 850,000 AI cores. This is the largest chip ever made. And to give you an idea of just how much bigger it is than the other uh, leading players, this is our seven nanometer way for scale engine with a photo. And next to it is the largest graphics processing unit. Our part is 2.6 trillion transistors. The GPU is 54 billion transistors. So the way for scale engine two is 2.55 trillion transistors larger than the nearest competitor. Larger chips provide a platform for more resources. We have 123 times more cores, 1,000 times more on-chip memory, 12,000 times more memory bandwidth, and 45,000 times 
more fabric bandwidth than the leading competitive graphic processing unit. At Cerebrus, we put our, our wafer scale engines into an enclosure, a chassis, that's the, the saleable unit. And here's a deployment uh, in Santa Clara, California, in which you see our, our CS1s, which is our, our computer, uh, an AI accelerator uh, deployed in a, in a large infrastructure. We have customers around the world, and here are some of the nice things they've had to say about us. Argonne National Labs, the Associate Director Rick Stevens writes, we have cancer drug response prediction models that are running many hundreds of times faster on Cerebrus than on conventional GPUs. At AstraZeneca, head of AI Nick Brown writes, AI training, which historically took over two weeks to run on a large cluster of GPUs, was accomplished in just over two days. This is the type of performance our customers are enjoying with the Cerebrus CS1 and CS2. Let's turn our attention now to the exponential growth in neural networks and the concomitant power issue. On this chart, you see the x-axis is memory and the y-axis is petaflop days of compute. In 2018, the largest network was BERT. It used 340 million parameters and required about eight petaflop days of compute. In 2019, the largest network was T5. It used 11 billion parameters and about 900 petaflop days of compute. In 2020, GPT-3 at 175 billion parameters and Microsoft's 1T each set the new bar. What you can see here is that over a very short period of time, over two years, models have grown a thousand times larger and used a thousand times more compute. Today, GPT-3 with 175 billion parameters is trained on a thousand GPUs for four months. That's megawatts of power for months on end. What are we going to do in the future when we're looking at multi-trillion parameter models? The path to energy efficiency in AI is deceptively simple. Step one, build with efficient building blocks. Step two, find efficient ways to scale. Step three, don't do useless tasks. And step four, use more efficient algorithms. We're going to focus this discussion on the areas in green here, efficient ways to scale, not doing useless tasks, and using more efficient algorithms. The GPU scales notoriously poorly, and the power impact is large and troubling. Here are some data from Professor Tim Rogers in a paper he and his associates wrote. Uh, I read it in ACM uh, SIGGRAPH, and what you see here on the x-axis is the number of chips, and on the y-axis is the speed up. This is what we care about in AI, how fast the neural network trains. The y-axis is normalized to 16 chips. And so what that means is that the black line here is perfect linear scaling. Unfortunately, the TPU and the GPU perform much less well than linear scaling. In fact, what we can see here is a massive inefficiency gap. To achieve 50x the performance of 16 GPUs, you'd like to use 800 GPUs, 50 times 16. But when you use 800 GPUs, you barely get 10x the performance. Let's put this in a little table. And what you see is to get 5x the speed up, perfect scaling would be 80 GPUs, 5 times 16. But in reality, you need 300 GPUs to achieve that speed up. To achieve a speed up of 10x, you, instead of 160 GPUs, you need 800 GPUs or you need 50 times the power draw to get a 10x speed up. In other words, to do work 10 times faster, you use 50 times the power. That is brutal inefficiency. At Cerebrus, we demonstrate near perfect scaling. Here's our scaling with speed up on the y-axis, number of CS2s on the x-axis. And what you can see is that whether you want 5x speed up or 10x speed up, you use five or 10 systems. In other words, at Cerebrus, to do work 10 times as fast, you use exactly 10 times the power. Now let's look at not doing useless work. Seems obvious, but in fact, useless work is frequently done in AI by AI processors. The most notorious of these is multiplying by zero. This is a useless task for a computer. It produces no new information. It consumes power. It takes time, 
and is done frequently by the graphics processing unit. Existing sparsity research by the likes of MIT at CSAIL, Google Brain, and others, it shows a massive opportunity to improve efficiency by reducing the number of flops necessary to achieve an outcome. However, in the hardware world, there are many who believe much of the sparsity is out of the reach of hardware vendors. In fact, in this paper called Accelerated Sparse Neural Network Training, published it in the uh, Archive X, they write, modern hardware cannot efficiently utilize such a form of sparsity for reducing computational resources. In fact, this is exactly what we do at Cerebrus. We show near perfect speed up as sparsity increases on a GPT-3 layer in this graph. We are capable of accelerating all forms of sparsity, structured and unstructured, dynamic, fine-grained, and even in fully random patterns. This is a massive opportunity. Finally, let's turn to the ability of using more efficient algorithms. Kwok Lee is one of the leading algorithm designers, works at Google, and he developed a new network called EfficientNet. And what he writes is compared with the widely used ResNet, EfficientNet uses the same number of flops while improving accuracy by 6.3%. And that's what you see in this graph here. However, because of the structure of the computation, it takes GPUs vastly more time and more power to train this model. This is an area of tremendous opportunity, both for algorithm designers as well as for the hardware community in working directly with algorithm designers so that our hardware can benefit from and efficiently utilize these dazzling new algorithms. That's just a little bit on this topic, but I think uh, I'll wrap up for now and we'll turn things over to the session, the Q&A session, which is uh, about to come forward. I want to thank you for giving us some time and we wish you well. If you have any questions, then uh, please uh, click the uh, button, raise your hand button. Yeah, let's see. Okay. Um, Mr. Maxim Ostapenko, um, could you start with a question from him? Uh, hello, uh, I have a question uh, to Professor Alakutum. Uh, thank you for your great talk. Uh, I have a small question about uh, new software stack for data flow. Um, the question is, uh, how do you think, uh, would it be possible to reuse some existing compiler and runtime infrastructure, for example, MLAR or TVM, to implement, implement this new, entirely new uh, software stack, or can we reuse? Uh, thank you. Hi, Maxim. Thank you for that question. Uh, so. We are using, in fact, MLIR as the infrastructure for designing our, our compiler. MLIR serves as the interface to the, uh, well, we've got an interface from existing frameworks, PyTorch and TensorFlow to MLIR, and then MLIR serves as the basis for doing all the optimizations that we want to do, right? So in terms of deciding how to map the graph, how much data parallelism, how much uh, model parallelism to use, how much recompute to, to use to minimize the bandwidth. Uh, these are all components uh, of the uh, uh, optimization that are done in the MLIR framework. So these things you can think of as the ML optimization uh, components. And then there are things that you want to do expressly for data flow, such as how you're going to tile the computation, how you're going to make use of the multiple levels of, of pipelining. You can think of pipelining within the compute units, pipelining across the, the compute units, pipelining across multiple RDU chips. And then, of course, the sizing of the parallelism and the matching of the different uh, components of, of the pipeline to make sure that everything's balanced. And, and these are all optimizations that are done in the sample flow uh, framework, but they're all using MIR as the infrastructure. Okay, thank you very much. Ho hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Mr. 
Sun Wang Wang, uh, would you like to ask your question? For your nice presentation, uh, I'd like to ask to Feldman. Uh, recently, major companies that need AI model training are building their own AI data center systems according to their workload characteristics. Do you think this kind of trend will continue? That's a really good question. I, I, I think the largest of players have taken very different strategies. Google has built their own. Amazon has built their own. Microsoft chose not to for a long time. Uh, I, I think uh, those different strategies are uh, dependent on whether they give away compute for free, like Google does, right, in its primary infrastructure, uh, how much uh, the AI uh, tools and models that they have designed can be used to improve internal performance, right? You know, Google doesn't just have to put their TPUs in the cloud, they're using them to improve search and they're using them to improve and that changes the economics for them. They're using them for internal gain, not just putting them up in the cloud. I, I think the challenge, of course, is that it is both good and bad for accelerator makers like ourselves. Um, it is good in that uh, if you want to compete with uh, Google, uh, you need to do better than a CPU, better than a CPU, better than a GPU, because the TPU is better than both. So it, it pushes competitors who want to do AI away from the GPU towards other accelerators. Obviously, on the downside, it removes large opportunities. Right? The the, the Google. Uh, it is using some of its, its internally developed technology for its own use, makes the market, the total addressable market, uh, smaller by removing part of Google from uh, the available opportunity. So it's a dual-edged sword. I think mostly it makes it better. And it makes it better because it advances AI. It puts pressure on laggards and others to do better than the GPU, right? If you want to be a leader, if you want to be advanced, right, you have to be able to beat what Google's doing for themselves internally, what DeepMind is doing. And that means you have to look to alternative vendors. And that's really a, a very interesting part of the market dynamic. The other thing to remember, of course, is that uh, only a portion of the AI work is, is in the cloud. There are whole industries that you can't put data in the cloud. That can be in the pharmaceutical business, in the life sciences, in military and intelligence, uh, in heavy manufacturing, in all sorts of industries have on-prem data. And those solutions are, are not viable and not available if you want your data on-prem. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm afraid the time is up. Um, so this is the end of the Q&A session. Uh, thank you, uh, CEO uh, Andrew Feldman, uh, Professor uh, Kulia Oletkun, and uh, all, the, uh, all the audiences. Thank you very much to join this Q&A session. Thank you so much. Thank you to these three speakers for their presentations. And now let's move to the second topic. The topic of the second session is AI for scientific discovery. Yong Sang Che, a vice president of SAIT, a professor Garvin Sater of the University of California, Berkeley, who was appointed as Samsung Distinguished Chair Professor this time. Last but not least, Bryce Meredith, the founder and CSO of Citrine Informatics, will take turns presenting. In order to begin, Yong Sang Che, a vice president of SAIT, will start the second session with his presentation, Expediting Materials Development and Predicting Pollution, 
AI for Science at Samsung. I would like to introduce current research activities in Samsung for applying AI to scientific discovery. As artificial intelligence advances, scientific research, which has been regarded as a domain of human intelligence, has also adopted this new technology to accelerate its progress. Materials discovery based on AI has received lots of attention. For example, Professor Cedar of UC Berkeley discovered the properties of various inorganic ternary metal nitrides using machine learning. Significant progresses are also being made in biology. As many of you know, the mind has applied machine learning to the protein folding problem and accomplished much better prediction accuracy. There are still many important problems such as finding materials for safe and efficient batteries to which AI can contribute. Among many areas of scientific discovery, we are very interested in AI-based materials design, which has huge potential impacts to Samsung and the society in general. Over the years, SAID has developed useful layer technologies such as Bixby speech recognition and face recognition, and applied them to various Samsung products, including Galaxy smartphones. We are integrating these experiences with expert knowledge and real-world data in designing materials for semiconductors, display, and batteries. Discovering novel materials with desired properties requires a lot of time and effort because it relies on both human expert knowledge and carefully performed chemical experiments. High throughput screening through DFT calculations is widely used for the faster design process and we believe AI can further expedite it. We are building AI algorithms for designing, synthesizing, and evaluating novel materials faster than conventional approaches. The materials discovered by AI can be used in numerous Samsung products, such as OLED display, but the research methodology can be applied to other fields, such as drug discovery. Our AI-based molecule design process consists of following steps. First, we create databases from internal and external information sources. Second, we train machine learning models with this data to predict the properties of molecules and generate molecules having desired properties. Finally, we synthesize selected molecules through chemical experiments. The results from experiments are gathered and used for training better models, so we can design increasingly better molecules. In order to develop AI algorithms that design molecules and predict their key properties, it is necessary to represent the molecule structure into a form that can be understood by computers such as smile string or graph structure. Then we can train neural networks with this data for property prediction and molecule structure generation. We have developed neural networks based on transformers, a promising algorithm in natural language processing, and graph neural network models to use molecular input as graph data. After we train the neural networks with our molecular databases, we can predict various properties of the newly designed molecular structures. While the existing state-of-the-art DFT simulation took several hours to estimate a molecule's properties, our deep learning model can quickly estimate the properties in seconds, thus vastly accelerating the process. In addition to the property prediction, we can design new molecular structures. For molecule generation, we developed encoder-decoder architecture. The encoder learns the structure of the molecule, and the decoder can generate a new structure using the latent space of the encoder. This model helps materials researchers design new molecules which are expected to have the desired properties. Chemical synthesis is a big bottleneck in materials development. We are developing an autonomous materials development platform to synthesize organic molecules. As you see in the video, we are performing fully automated chemical experiments using robotics to expedite synthesis and verification. We can also minimize risks of hazards during the experiments. First, the robot selects and prepares the reagents for the synthesis of the target material. During the chemical reaction, the reaction condition is carefully controlled by the system followed by post-treatment to obtain the final product. The experimental results are stored in the database to help us design better materials in the future. We are also interested in contributing to society through AI research. Air pollution is one of the biggest threats to human health in many parts of the world. We have established the Samsung Particulate Matter Research Institute to help solve this problem. We are developing machine learning models to predict fine dust distribution in the atmosphere. To train the model, we collected satellite data and 11 types of weather condition data as input. For output, 
we also collected the fine dust concentration data measured at the ground observation stations. We trained a random forest model and have successfully predicted the concentration of fine dust in all regions of Korea. To raise the interest of students in the exciting area of AI-based materials design, we held the Samsung AI Challenge. 222 teams competed in developing machine learning techniques to predict material properties, such as energy band gap, in which we are interested. The winner will be announced later. As I introduced, SAIC is conducting AI research to address scientific and social issues. The only results are promising, but there are many obstacles that need to be solved. To this end, we are collaborating with various research institutes, such as MILA, NYU, and KAIST, and we expect that this cooperation will lead to better research results. Thank you. The next speaker is Professor Cedar, one of the pioneers in AI-based materials design. Thank you for the invitation to speak at the symposium on artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I'm going to show you some of my ideas and work on machine learning for the advancement of materials research and how that can lead to the laboratory of the future. Uh, materials innovation is really important for society. Uh, we see uh, the importance of materials in many applications, whether it's sort of consumption, communication, health, security, transportation, visual visualization. A lot of these areas that are important to society are driven by materials innovation. But what we know about materials innovation, that's a very slow process. Uh, a while ago, a study was done to see how long it took for materials to come from a discovery all the way to commercialization, and the average time is 18 years. Uh, that's been the case for basic materials such as Teflon, polycarbonate, Velcro. But even the famous lithium ion battery took almost 15 years from its initial conception to the very early commercialization uh, by Sony. And so uh, in response to this problem, about 10 years ago, we launched in the United States what's now called the Materials Genome Initiative. And the objective of this was to reduce the development time for new materials by 50% and thereby make it much more attractive for companies to step in and commercialize technologies based on new materials. So, so what is really the problem with materials development? Well, the problem is in part that we very often have a lack of information. We know very little about the properties of most compounds that we know. We know little or nothing about how to synthesize them or uh, which defects occur in them or how to scale them up. And so a lot of materials research and development is done by trial and error. So now that we've gone through 10 years of material genome, we can look a bit back at the successes and where we need to go next. And one success that we've really had is on the early discovery side. So using ab initio computations, we have been able to make very large databases of computed properties of compounds, which then can, then can be used to search for other materials, and as I'll show later also to do machine learning. The best known example of this is definitely the Materials Project, which was founded by Christian Pearson uh, at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in California, and is also the director of the Materials Project. Um, the Materials Project does high throughput computing, has millions of computed properties of existing and novel compounds, and clearly has satisfied the need in the community. Uh, today, there are more than 160,000 users of the Materials Project. Uh, that's remarkable given that it's a field of science. This is not Facebook, this is not WhatsApp. Uh, and of these 160,000 users, uh, two to 5,000 of them log on every single day to pull data from the Materials Project. Uh, the Materials Project downloads uh, more than 2 million records through their API every single day and serves now over two terabytes of data each month to the community. So there's clearly a need for data in the community. That has led to a lot of discovery. Here's some examples. The Materials Project has uh, discovered materials for carbon capture, for magnetocalorics. These are materials that can use magnetism to do refrigeration. So you can do magnetism without compressors, without moving parts. Examples in thermoelectrics, in piezoelectrics, and of course, in my own field, which is uh, energy storage. So uh, why is this development so important? The reason is that now we all talk a lot about machine learning. and in machine learning, data is really the fuel. The idea of machine learning is that rather than developing the fundamental physical laws that determine a property or a behavior, you use data to try to learn how something behaves. So data is really the fuel. 
And in a field like materials, materials has been a very data scarce field. In general, we don't have a lot of data. It is not well curated or collected. So it's been very difficult to do machine learning. So I'm going to show you a few examples where that actually has recently been successful and really shows how this bodes well for the future uh, of our exciting field. So one thing that machine learning is good is to deal with complexity. By right? developing physical laws that, that, that encompass complex behavior uh, is sometimes difficult to do. And there machine learning can really step in. And I'm going to show you one example. This is from Professor Pearson's research uh, at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. It's on figuring out the chemistry of the SEI layer. The SEI layer is an is a important component of a lithium-ion battery. Uh, the electrodes in a lithium-ion battery in their native state are actually quite reactive with the lithium electrolyte. But what happens when you bring them together, and in particular here the carbon or the graphitic anode, is that they react and they form a passivation layer with, which blocks further reaction. It's a bit like the protection on, on stainless steel. And it's therefore a uh, critically important part of making long-lasting uh, lithium-ion batteries. People have known about the SEI layer for 30 years, but the specific reactions of how it builds up and what chemistry is present in it has not been particularly well known. This can now be done with machine learning because with machine learning, uh, one can basically start from the basic components that react, lithium ions, uh, PF6 anions in the electrolyte, in ethylene carbonate, which is the solvent, and of course some water impurities, and show and see what happens when they come in contact with carbon and literally write down or have a computer write down every possible reaction path, every possible bond that can be broken and react with something else. And once you have this landscape of all possible reactions, you can navigate through it if you know the energetics of which bond can break more easily than others. But that's something that's much too hard to do by humans or even by ab initial computing. So this is the part that's done with machine learning. What's done with machine learning is that you basically first calculate a few thousand bond breaking energies in organic molecules. You calculate them with ab initio computation so you get an accurate answer. And then you train a machine learning model to start mimicking the response, to start learning which bonds are strong, which bonds are easily broken. And then machine learning can start to guide you through this path of what reacts with what and what it forms. And then you can again calculate more accurately with uh, ab initio computation. So machine learning is used a way as a sort of surrogate model that operates much, much faster than the ab initio computation. And through this work, we now for the first time understand the actual reaction path, how the electrolyte and the carbon and the salt react to protect the graphitic anode in lithium ion battery. So a good example of how machine learning can make you so help you sort through complexity. Um, but a lot of data is not computable. A lot of data in, in material science has been worked hard and, and is sort of written up in millions of research papers, it's sort of locked up in there. There are no databases made of it. And a good example is material synthesis. Uh, there are no, no good databases that tell you how organic uh, compounds are made, inorganic compounds are made. And so we don't even have a good database to train things on. It's all written up in, in, in description with words and verbs and paragraphs in papers. Same thing for a lot of properties and say the structure of materials. So the question we really asked a while ago, can we train a computer to actually absorb this knowledge? Can we train a computer, a machine learning algorithm to read through millions of paper and absorb material science knowledge? I'm going to show you two examples that this is actually possible, the beginning of that this is actually possible. So one is uh, one from a few years ago showing that um, simply by reading words without associating any chemistry, we can actually learn things. And here we read 3.3 million abstracts of scientific papers in the materials field. And we trained uh, what's called BIRD or what was early on version uh, word to vec which is essentially an encoding of language. And it's essentially a sophisticated algorithm that, that learns word associations and through word associations can learn meaning. And once you do that, you start to encompass incorporate basic materials concept. For example, you can ask the question, what is the frequency that PA, the symbol PA is to pressure? And BERT will recognize that essentially PA is the unit of pressure, so it will answer Hertz, because Hertz is the unit of frequency. You can ask it basically chemistry questions after it's been trained. Aluminum oxide is to aluminum, what is to zinc? And the answer, of course, is zinc oxide. So BERT, the natural language encoder, learns that aluminum is oxidized to aluminum oxide, 
but zinc is aluminum is oxidized to zinc oxide and you can train it to uh, understand even more device related questions so if you say a cathode is lithium cobalt oxide and you ask it was well, it is the anode it will answer graphite and it has learned these things not by embedding meaning into the coding but by simply word association it, it, it notices that things appear together in uh, sentences and that they have a similar relation to each other for example that the relation from graphite to anode is similar as the relation from lithium cobalt oxide to cathode so that's a simple way that natural language processing can can start to extract very very basic material science concepts uh, and it can do other things if you actually ask it to organize elements by their word association so it doesn't actually even know these elements in their chemistry it just knows them as labels and you ask it to give to make the best two-dimensional representation simply based on vocabulary and how they appear in sentences you see essentially what appears to be like a periodic table you see for example the alkaline metals appear together here right you see the lanthanides appear together here a lot of the transition metals appear here the main group elements the chalcogenide ions again this is simply based on how these things appear together in language in vocabulary the question is can you do better and can you actually make predictions and it's remarkable that you can so here we did a test where we made the computer read papers only up to a certain year which we will call the learning cutoff and then we ask it to predict which materials will be discovered in the later literature and we did this here for thermoelectrics and it's remarkable how well it does so for example if we cut off at a certain year say you know 2003 here okay then we use that information to predict which materials will be discovered in the next 10 years in the literature and of all the materials we predict indeed 25 percent of all the materials that appear in the literature in the next 10 years can actually be predicted from reading the literature before even though they are not explicitly studied as thermoelectrics so the question is how does natural language processing do this how does it learn that some materials are going to be good thermoelectrics even though it doesn't understand any physics well it makes word associations for example this thermoelectric that it predicted it understands that that's related to things that are typically observed for example many thermoelectrics are Heusler compounds and it may have seen the association between this compound and Heusler compounds many thermoelectrics have indirect band gaps so what it sees in the literature that some key properties that may lead to thermoelectricity are being noted and measured and predicted and from there it makes the step aha I think soon somebody's going to claim that this is a good thermoelectric sometimes that relation is more based on chemistry so as in the case where it predicts copper uh, telluride so it's remarkable that simply by word association we can actually make predictions about materials but we can do more complicated things we can extract structured data from the literature and then use that for machine learning and here's a problem that is dear to my heart you know we have become very good at synthesizing at predicting materials and through ab initio computing and the materials project we now have sort of more materials that we predicted but we have a long queue of materials that we want to make in the lab because we don't have a theory we don't have guiding recipes how to make new materials but of course how do you learn how to synthesize new materials while well, you read the literature so the question is again can we make a computer read the literature extract codified synthesis recipes and then actually learn from that on how to synthesize new materials so the first thing we do is that we build algorithms where it finds where in this paper of 10 pages or so where is the synthesized described and that can actually do be done with BERT or with what's called local density approximation methods but the fun part comes once you have this paragraph humans would easily understand this but uh, because humans are very good at understanding what comes in what order but how would a computer interpret this so what we have done is train neural networks to recognize when they get a synthesis paragraph to recognize the meaning of things and whether things are for example the target of the synthesis and here it's even harder here it says the GZO target so it's actually an abbreviation GZO stands for gadolinium zirconate but you can even teach neural networks to interpret uh, in context dependent uh, acronyms but it sees other chemicals zinc oxide and gadolinium oxide and it has to learn that these are not just chemicals but that these are the precursors from which you start the reactions and then it learns to recognize operations in this case ball milling calcining sintering 
and then it learns to recognize attributes to these operations. So you didn't just ball mill, you ball milled with zirconia balls in ethanol at 300 RPM for 20 hours. So we can now interpret this and put this essentially, codify this in a flow chart of operations so that a computer can now operate. So we have done this, we have done this, uh, we've read through millions of papers, we have published the first very large data set on solid state reactions. So we have published over 30,000 solid state reactions, the precursor to the reaction, the atmosphere of the reaction, the temperature of the reaction. So this is now the first very large data set on synthesis of inorganic materials. We have the next one is submitted for publication, which is on solution synthesis of inorganic materials. So what can you do with that? Now you can apply machine learning to see, can I learn synthesis? Can I do what a human does, right? If I ask one of my students to make a new material, what, what are they going to do? They're going to try to look up papers on related materials. And with machine learning, we can do this in a, more, in a much more mathematically rigorous way. So we can train the machine learning on these 30,000 known reactions and start to predict things for new reactions. So how well do we do? Well, when we do a typical cross-validation test here, for example, we try to predict a reaction temperature, and this is the real temperature. And what you see, there's a reasonable linear relation. So we do reasonable well, we don't exactly predict the reaction temperature, but that's quite reasonable because reaction temperature is, is typically a distribution when somebody makes a material at a thousand degrees. It's not like you can only make it at a thousand degrees. You can probably also make it at 950 or 1050, right? And so we can now reasonably well predict, say, the synthesis temperature for a new material. But we can also interpret the machine learning model and, and, and understand how, say, chemistry has an effect on synthesis temperature. And that's what's shown here. The elements in blue tend to bring down the synthesis temperature from some average. The elements in red tend to push up the synthesis temperature. And for example, a really great example here is lithium. Lithium is very blue, so when you make compounds with lithium, on average, the synthesis temperature is a little bit lower. And this makes perfect chemical sense because if you go too high, lithium oxides will evaporate and you will lose them. So clearly the machine learning is picking up uh, important uh, physical and chemical mechanisms that, that control synthesis reactions. We can also use machine learning to interpret experimental data, especially when we can train the machine. And here's a good example where I think a machine has become better than a human. So very often we go in the lab and we do a synthesis and we make something. And of course, when you make it, it looks like this. It's a bunch of powder in a vial. And how do you know what you made? So for that, we do what's called X-ray diffraction. X-ray diffraction is essentially a scattering method that gives us a fingerprint about the material. And this fingerprint, where you have these high peaks as a function of scattering angle, this is essentially like your fingerprint. This is the fingerprint of a crystal structure. So we can compare this to known patterns and then figure out um, what crystal structure might be. But humans do this by visual comparison. So because we can solve what's called a forward problem, we can actually train a machine to do this. So if we have a lot of known crystal structure, we can predict what fingerprints they will make. That's what's called a forward problem. So that means we can do this for tens of thousands of structures and we can do perturbations of the structure. We can add noise, we can add deformation, and we can present the machine with hundreds of thousands of diffraction patterns and make it learn the relation between what structures, what crystal structures are present in your sample. And when we test that with multi-phase samples, so these are things that are not phase pure. This is the biggest challenge in, in material science. You get like say three phases in your, in your sample. Uh, what are all their overlapping fingerprints? When we look at the prediction accuracy, which is seen in blue here for the machine learning, when we have a single phase, we can with 95% accuracy say what phase there is. And that's doing better than humans with commercial software, which is only about 80%. But when we have complex multi-phase samples, we can get up to 80% accuracy with, when there's three phases present, but uh, uh, humans using commercial software only get about 50% accuracy. So this is a, 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 a detection problem in which machines have become uh, extremely good. So to end, I want to show you how we want to put all this together for the lab of the future. So imagine we have now these computational engines like the Materials Project that can really guide us in what would be good compounds to make? The question is, could we now drive that automation and machine learning also in the synthesis? Could we make essentially a machine that I tell it what it should make and it iterates until it makes it? And of course, that machine will use our text mine data, which is tens of thousands of synthesis recipes to get a good starting point. And it may start from that to try to do something 
then robots would handle sample of to say the XRD that I showed you, the characterization. And then we would use our machine learning algorithms to detect what we have. Well, and if it's the right thing, that the thing that we wanted to make, we say hooray and we hand it off. But most often in synthesis, the first time it's not the right thing. So we would then use AI decision-making algorithms to decide what is the next step to do in the synthesis. So when you put all this together, what's on this slide here, this is what we are building now. We will have a fully automated lab where computation and machine learning drives actually the, the experiments, the interpretation of the experiments and the decision making. So I hope with that that I've shown you some of the exciting things that machine learning can already do today and that it will hopefully do in the future to accelerate materials research for the benefit of society. So I thank you and I look forward to seeing, and taking your, seeing you and taking your questions uh, on the panel. Thank you very much. I'm excited now to take you deeper into the world of material science and engineering. Uh, I'll be discussing how we apply AI to industrial materials design. To give you a sense of the perspective I bring to this topic, I want to give a brief introduction to my company, Citrine Informatics. We're a materials informatics software platform company based in Silicon Valley in California. And our, our core product, the Citrine platform, enables our customers to bring all of their materials data and knowledge into one place and then use AI to systematically glean insights from this data and drive innovation faster than they could before. It's been quite a journey at Citrine being one of the founders uh, back when we started in 2013, very small company. Uh, now we've grown to close to 100 people and I think that's a sign of the tremendous demand for this kind of industrial AI that we provide. If you've never seen what it looks like to apply uh, AI or machine learning to materials discovery, here's a movie that you can use uh, to visualize what's going on. Uh, and there's a lot here, so I'll make sure to walk you through it and the video will repeat itself. Uh, on the far right hand side, you can see a number of materials that we're asking AI to screen through. Uh, this ha these happen to be oxides, uh, nominally for solar applications. The middle panel shows the two uh, property targets that we have. So on the y-axis is the band gap of the compounds that has to be within a certain range for solar. Uh, and then on the x-axis, we have the thermodynamic stability of these materials. The gray shaded window is our target region. Uh, and every time AI recommends a material that falls within that target region, it lights up in red, and otherwise it remains gray. Finally, on the left-hand side, of the, uh, you can see a plot of the progress of sequential learning or iterative machine learning driven materials design. The red curve illustrates the number of target compounds found as a function of iteration. And the teal curve illustrates that on average, the distance between the compounds AI is recommending to us and the target window is decreasing. So even when the recommendation doesn't fall precisely within the window, it is on average getting closer. So now that you have this uh, mental model for what we're doing, uh, I want to address this key question, which is why off-the-shelf AI doesn't immediately unravel major uh, challenges and questions in material science and chemistry. And for the rest of the talk, I'm going to go into a couple of these domain-specific challenges and how we think about addressing them with method development. So the first topic I want to discuss is how we think about addressing sample bias and the extrapolative nature of materials design by tailoring cross-validation methods to these applications. So let me give you a bit more background on what we're doing. So in an ideal machine learning application, we would have a training set that might look like this. Of course, in reality, the training set would be uh, potentially very high dimensional, but I flattened it here on a, on a 2D on the screen so we can see it. And in a straightforward application, we would be asking uh, for predictions of the material that's shown notionally here in orange. We would, I think, share the intuition that this is a highly interpolated prediction. There's nearby training data, so the prediction is well supported. Unfortunately, though, most materials data sets, uh, data sets don't look anything like this. Instead, they look more like this. They're highly clustered. There's a strong tendency for sample bias. Uh, and if you're wondering why this is, there are a couple of reasons. One is that in material science, whenever we find a material that works well for a particular application, a particular uh, parent compound, it's very likely that we're going to do follow-up experiments in the neighborhood of that compound. So slight modification, slight doping of that material. If we just throw all these uh, materials, these variant materials into the training set together, they're going to fall into these well-defined clusters that you can see here. Another reason you see this kind of clustering or sample bias is that uh, in um, most fields of science and engineering, negative results are stigmatized. So if you have a hypothesis, you test it and you obtain a negative result, uh, these, was, these uh, outcomes tend to not be as valued as positives. When of course, for, in an AI and machine learning context, the negatives are extremely valuable and often we want more examples of negatives, materials that didn't work, so that we can train a model that does a good job separating the, the likely uh, winners from the less interesting materials. So, uh, in materials discovery, we have these uh, challenging data sets, and we're often interested in making extrapolative predictions, uh, as you can see here. 
Now, this uh, scenario is going to have significant consequences for how we think about doing cross-validation. And of course, the standard, the default uh, gold standard cross-validation method usually involves partitioning train and test materials randomly. So you can see that here on the slide. Uh, and, and that has a, a particularly thorny consequence when we're uh, using materials data that are highly clustered. Because you can see when there are examples of training test materials that are very close to one another, that training material is going to act essentially as a lookup table for the test material. So it, in uh, a configuration like this rewards a model for memorizing data rather than uh, actually learning and, and generalizing. So in order to address this kind of situation, we proposed a, a very simple cross-validation technique that we call leave one cluster out or loco CV. And in this technique, all we do is we simply pre-cluster the data set and we keep entire clusters together in the train set or the test set. And we think this does a good job of mimicking materials discovery because we would have a set of known materials or families of materials that we train on and then we ask the model to extrapolate into these unseen clusters. As you might suspect, the difference between random CV and loco CV has a significant impact on uh, the metrics we use to quantify model performance. So this is an illustration of that for a, a particular material science data set about steel fatigue strengths. And you can see we've looked at three different algorithms. There are three curves near the top of the plot. That's the Pearson R value between the machine learning predictions and the ground truth experimental values when we do random CV. And the three curves towards the middle of the plot are those same Pearson R values, but when we uh, use loco CV. So you can see there's, there's a significant decrease in reported performance. Uh, and we would argue that this, uh, this uh, lower, sort of more modest performance does a better job of quantifying how we can expect our machine learning model to perform when we're doing extrapolative materials design. So again, the theme here is that the CV methods ought to be very well paired to the particular applications we have in mind for our models. The next topic that I'd like to address briefly is uh, how we think about addressing the very small data volumes that we have in material science, uh, in particular by domain knowledge integration. It is unfortunately the case that we typically in our field have uh, training data sets that are orders of magnitude smaller than are commonly encountered in the computer science research community, for instance. We might have order tens or hundreds of training points. This is because uh, experiments in material science are, are extremely expensive in terms of time and money. So how do we think about bringing to bear the enormous uh, existing physical knowledge of our field uh, on, on the problems of interest to us in order to mitigate this small data problem? Well, one of the ways we do that is by transfer learning using data from physics-based simulations. Of course, we can run many more simulations than we can do experiments, and this is going to enable us to train more predictive models. So imagine we want to predict the band gap of a compound that's just like the example I showed for the uh, solar materials previously. Uh, we can do that with just the experimental data, but the experimental data are likely to be scarce. You can see on the right-hand side a learning curve uh, when we do, uh, do this model training just with experimental results. Uh, uh, and the y-axis is the, error, the root mean squared error of the model in electron volts. If we instead say, well, we have a lot more information available to us than just the experimental results, we can run density functional theory simulations on these same materials, uh, actually a much larger selection of materials, and, uh, and use that as, to help us, uh, the, the, the DFT uh, band gaps, or model trained on the DFT band gaps, to help predict the experimental band gap, which is the property that we ultimately want to design for. You can see that when we add this physics-based simulation knowledge to the model uh, modeling framework, our error goes down considerably. And in particular, I would, I would uh, draw your attention to the fact that for a particular level of error, as we've shown, for example, with that dashed horizontal line, there could be many tens, if not hundreds, of experiments difference in the amount of uh, experiments that we had to undertake in order to achieve that level of error. So anytime we can use uh, ex uh, physics-based simulations to offset the need for experiments, this is extremely exciting and, and worthwhile to do. To give you a, a more, even more elaborate example, this is an actual screenshot from uh, Citrine Software. Uh, here the problem of interest is modeling the corrosion resistance of steel. This is an extremely practically important, industrially important problem. Uh, and of course we have experimental data on the corrosion resistance of steel, but again this is a case where we say we have more physical knowledge available to us that we can bring to bear on the problem. And there are two kinds of knowledge that we're highlighting in this particular example. And the, the art, uh, image on the right shows a hierarchical uh, combination of models trained on the Citrine platform. Uh, the two categories of knowledge that we're going to bring to the table here uh, are the um, the PREN, which is uh, the penning resistance equivalence number. This is a simply a linear regression, as you can see on the slide, uh, that does a reasonable job describing the corrosion resistance of certain kinds of steel. You can see there are specific elements that it is fit to. If you want to use other elements, PREN isn't going to be a good choice for you, but this is uh, essentially state-of-the-art, has been used for decades. It was originally published in the 1960s. So we don't want to try to relearn PRAN, or we don't want to throw away the data, uh, the information that's available there. We want to use that to help us predict uh, corrosion resistance for a broader variety of steels. The other category of information we can use is information from computational thermodynamic simulations. Uh, that's CalFAT as shown in the pink. 
And what this is acknowledging is the fact that if you zoom in on these materials microscopically, they're not homogeneous. You might have a situation where you have a matrix phase that's highlighted in gray, and then precipitates, those are the black dots. And those two materials, if we know their identities and their properties, we're going to do a better job of predicting the, uh, the properties of the overall alloy uh, with that kind of information. So anytime we can access that through the, running these simulations, we want to do so. So with all this uh, it, uh, behind us now, I just want to summarize that uh, from, from our perspective, certainly at Citrine, AI has become a widely used tool for industrial materials design. Uh, I gave you some examples of how we have to do domain-specific method development to get the most out of AI. Uh, and in particular, it's an exciting area to look at injecting domain knowledge into our models uh, in order to en uh, enhance their performance and address this small data issue. So I want to thank you for your attention. Thanks again for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, we're going to move to a question and answer period now. So I'd like to reintroduce uh, Young Song Choi, who's a vice president at Samsung and Professor Sater of UC Berkeley. Now we're going to have some time for questions from our audience. So if you have any question, please raise your hand by system or your actual hand. Oh, uh, I see that uh, Dong Jin Zi has a question. Dong Jin Zi, please unmute your system and ask a question. Right. Uh, thank you. My name is Dong Jin Zi and I am a researcher at SITE. Uh, first of all, thank you all for the great presentation. And I have a question for Dr. Cedar. So, what would the possible implications, be it like positive or negative, be for speeding up the development time for new materials? So, like, for instance, uh, I, my understanding is that the current electronics technologies are limited by the energy density of batteries. So would we be able to see massive improvement in this regard, thanks to AI-based uh, materials design? Um, I definitely think so. Um, thank you for the question. I definitely think so because um, there are many good ideas out there for developing higher energy density batteries. But as I pointed out, uh, the time to bring them to a reasonable state where they are ready for, you know, scale up and testing by a company uh, and and, build, and 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 scaling up into large production, that time scale is way too long. So I think that if we could earlier on uh, decide on uh, which materials to pick, how to handle them, what their challenges are, right? Because one thing is not every material is not perfect. There's always some challenge with it. If you know what that is, you can now maybe handle that with other ways. For battery materials, for example, you can look for coatings or you can modify the device architecture to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the, the data revolution, I think, in materials design will really be that we will get a lot more information early on and therefore we'll be able to make better choices and faster scale up, right? Thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Meredith, could you add some your insight on this question? Yeah, I, th I think one of the um, areas where AI can be most helpful for helping us uh, commercialize and deploy new materials faster than we could before is in helping us solve uh, multi-objective optimization problems. So um, as uh, Garrett alluded to, the, the challenge of materials design never boils down to a single parameter, and there are always trade-offs. Uh, and uh, from, from our experience at Citrine, a typical industrial materials design problem could have six, eight, 10, 20 uh, uh, parameters of interest, properties, uh, uh, constraints around cost, manufacturability. And we're trying to find those, uh, those unicorn materials that satisfy all of these requirements, or at least many of them. Uh, and and uh, uh, I think AI, 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 AI driven, driven or, or sort of computationally driven, driven uh, design process can be very effective at helping uh, identify for a researcher the, the um, materials that are the likeliest to meet all of our requirements. Thank, Thank you. Peter. I see that uh, there's a question from Shashi Adiga in India. So my question is to both, actually. So I just wanted to, uh, you know, um, Give an assessment from both of you uh, regarding the readiness level of uh, AI and ML for industrial application right now. So, you know, if uh, are these models ready for deployment uh, for materials discovery? Um, I'll let Bryce answer first. 
Yeah, yeah well, I, I think um, my answer probably won't, <laughs> won't be too surprising. Uh, but, uh, uh, certainly I would say, I would say yes, um, uh, that, you know, these, these, uh, approaches are being used today to solve materials design challenges, um, at, at a, a wide variety of, of companies across a wide variety of materials classes as well. Uh, so, so it's not kind of specialized to just one, one type of problem. Uh, and I think going forward, what, what we're going to see is that, um, a larger number of people within a given company, let's say, uh, ma uh, materials company or manufacturing company, you'll see more and more people begin to be trained on AI-based tools and be able to deploy them in their day-to-day -day workflows so that, it, it, th so that these tools aren't limited to uh, people with computational backgrounds, people with programming backgrounds. I think we really need to be thinking about having um, all material scientists and chemists able to use AI in their work. I think if I can add to that, uh, first of all, I, I tend to agree. And like any model, it, it depends a bit on what you're trying to do with it, right? One can sort of um, have be overly confident that AI and ML will sh solve every model. And I think the training of people becomes important. And I think, as 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 Bryce Meredith showed, uh, the biggest problem with AI, I think, in in materials and whether that's industry or science, doesn't really matter, is data bias. That uh, you can, first of all, only learn what's in your data, uh, but you can also learn an awful lot of things that you think you learn that are not really in your data uh, because of the, the data bias. So I think today, when you do these kind of discovery models, I think there's definitely a certain amount of critical thought and training needed. But my guess is that as, as models get better and better, they will become more and more sort of foolproof. I think there was a peril with that initial modeling. I think if you go back 30 years ago, you needed to have an enormous amount of expertise on how to converge the electronic structure and how to design, pick your K points and cutoffs and things like that. And today, you know, you still need a certain amount of knowledge to run ab initial codes, but it's not nearly as much anymore, right? It's become much more of a robust technology. And AI will become that as well, right? But I think there are already very promising applications, right, if they are well chosen. Uh, I think it's already time for finish this Q&A session. Thank you for all your insightful talks and good answers to these questions, Dr. Cedar and Dr. Meredith. And thank you for all your good questions and your time for general audiences. Thank you. Thank you very much to these three speakers for their presentations. And then we have the last session for all of you. The topic of the third but last session is Trustworthy Computer Vision. Che Jun Han, Vice President of Technology at SAIT, Professor Antonio Turalba of MIT, and Daniel Viviriata, a Vice President at Landing AI, will take turns presenting. Che Jun Han, the Vice President of Technology at SAIT, will start the third session with his presentation. What makes computer vision trustworthy? So let's take a look. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jae Jun Han, and I lead the Computer Vision Lab at SITE. It is my pleasure to be opening the third session about trustworthy machine vision. The advancement of the deep learning technology was a tremendous breakthrough in the field of computer vision. Facial recognition is a widely used AI algorithm in several different areas, such as unlocking smartphone screens, mobile payments, and yes, even including surveillance. However, as face recognition has been widely adopted in the real world, various questions have arisen, such as how robust is it? How secure is the algorithm? Can it identify the real me from the fake examples of me? Lastly, does the algorithm guarantee the same performance across the different ethnic groups? These questions are important factors to make AI more applicable in the real world. To emphasize ethics and responsibility in the real world, there are efforts from the wide range of groups to define what makes AI trustworthy. There are six keywords as defined by them. To better understand exactly what makes AI trustworthy, I will break it down into two major areas. The first one is humans as a user. 
and the second one is uh, machines as the user. With the uh, humans as a user, privacy and fairness are two of the most important concerns regarding trustworthiness, and they are being addressed by the research community. In the case of machine users, what might we be missing? Before we answer the question, let's look at the manufacturing industries where the machines are the dominant users. According to the recent report, about 64% of the manufacturers in industrialized countries are currently utilizing AI in manufacturing. Additionally, about 66% of the manufacturers are expecting to rely AI more in the future. So this is not a small group. For example, in semiconductor manufacturing, most of the production processes are highly automated. Yet, there are enormous efforts to make it even more efficient. However, when it comes to the quality assurance, we are still depending largely on the human involvement. So, AI is not used equally across the manufacturing process flow. This figure shows a generalized semiconductor front-end process flow. Scaling semiconductors makes the devices smaller and more complex. In return, this makes inspection and metrology even more difficult. To overcome this issue, there are large efforts toward developing inspection and metrology algorithms using AI. As shown in the figure, inspection and metrology uses data that has gone through several analysis steps. In addition, there are constant equipment adjustments during the production, and any commercially deployed algorithms should offer robust performance in the face of these adjustments. The following three highlighted elements are what we think are the most important factors in trustworthy machine vision systems. Let me explain in more detail. First, robustness. We are expecting to operate our processes with a high yield rate. Therefore, even though large volumes of data are generated during the production process, abnormal data is scarce and may not be reproducible. So, it is important to have an algorithm that can determine anomalies using only the normal data. Once again, this is important because an incorrect decision by AI algorithms could lead to major yield and monetary losses. Second, explainability. To adopt AI successfully, the machine vision system should not only find the defects in the process, but should also provide the causal relationship identifying where and why the defect happened. Lastly, continual learning. Counter to our desire for robustness, when the data distribution changes, it is impossible to avoid performance degradation due to the limitations of data-driven algorithms. To overcome this problem, continual learning is one of the most important components for developing trustworthy machine vision systems. In conclusion, we believe that it is important to develop trustworthy algorithms for the future benefit of both human society and industry. Now, Professor Taraba will provide his insights into trustworthy algorithms from an academic perspective. I'm going to talk now about how to teach computers to see. So computer vision has experienced a large number of advances in the last years, and in particular, thanks to the rise of big data. Nowadays, we have available a large amount of data in order to train computer vision systems to see. In fact, since computer vision started in the 70s until now, we have experienced an exponential growth on the size of data sets that we use to train current computer vision systems. And also uh, the rise of deep learning. We have now big architectures and a large amount of computing that we can use to train systems that are able to extract very useful information from images. But one of the challenges is that now we have these systems that work really well. However, we don't really understand what is that they do in order to provide their output. So if you have a system that is trained to recognize images, that system has become a black box and it's hard to know exactly what is the representation that is being learned for the system in order to answer the particular task that we have teach it to solve. So for instance, one of the challenges is that when a system fails, we might not know why. For instance, here is an example of a system that has been trained to do action classification, 
and the system for this image outputs that the task, that the, that the action is washing dishes. And it's just not clear why the system thinks that this image is depicting someone washing dishes. It could be that it has misunderstood the context or it's not detecting the dishes properly. We don't really know what is the reason why the system fails. So in order to build system, computer vision systems that are reliable and trustworthy, we need to address a number of challenges. Uh, on one hand, we have the problem of data. We need to collect data in ways that are fair and unbiased, that preserve the privacy of users, and also that are cost and accessible uh, for a diverse set of groups, in particular research groups that might not have all the resources of big companies. It's important that they are also capable of performing research. And also when you build AI systems, we also need to worry about the problems of fairness, uh, developing tools that allow you to build systems that can address some of the biases present in the training data. We need to build systems that are explainable and describe why is that they reach a particular output. We also need to build systems that are robust and that they, you know, that we are aware of the social impact that those systems might have. Here in this talk, I'm going to focus mainly on the problem of datasets and how to build datasets that address some of the issues that exist nowadays. So when you think of a data set, there are two aspects of a training set. One is the images, in particular for computer vision systems, and another is the labels that you need to provide in order to uh, provide ground truth data to the system that needs to be trained. And we have the challenge that both images are hard to collect, and they have privacy issues, there might be copyrights and so on, and then the labels are also hard to produce because producing detailed annotations of images can be costly and very expensive. So one of the questions that we have and that the community at large has is, do we really need labels to learn to see? For instance, we know that humans can learn to see, understand the scene, recognize objects, and do that without having their parents providing labels for every single pixel that reaches the retina. The way that they learn is by having a battery of different tools that allows them to do unsupervised learning. And the community has done a lot of research in trying to build systems that can supervise themselves. And this is what is called self-supervised learning. Well, you devise a task that the system will learn to build an important and interesting visual representation, but you don't need to have any type of labels in order to train those systems. One of those tasks is to learn to see by drawing images. And this is a task that is generally solved using generative adversarial networks. GANs, they learn things about the visual world just by learning to reproduce images that should look real. And the way they are trained is you start with a database of images, like the ones I'm showing here that contain, let's say, churches, buildings, buildings, palaces. And then you train the system to be able to generate images that a discriminator should be unable to tell you if the images are fake or real. And through that adversarial game, systems learn very effectively to draw images that look real but are not real. Once it's trained, a GAN works by taking as input a random vector of numbers, let's say 512 dimensions, and the exact dimensionality of the vector depends on the implementation that you use. And then the system will take those numbers, it will recombine them, increase their dimensionality, recombine them again, increase the dimensionality, and it will continuously do that until it reaches a size that is big enough that if you rearrange it into a square and you visualize it, it actually looks like a real image. And it's just pretty surprising now that this process actually works. So here's an example of an image that is generated by a GAN that has been trained to reproduce uh, castles and palaces and so on. And now once it's trained, if you change the random vector of input, then you generate a new image that again looks real. And you can sample many, many, many random vectors and you get all the time different images that look real. So the question then is, well, this system has learned to draw images, but what has it really learned? What is the internal representation that this system has built in order to solve this task? I mean, it's pretty amazing that it can draw these images that look so realistic, but is there an internal representation that has learned to draw trees, b uh, buildings, rivers, grass, sky, or is all mixed up and there is really nothing important or nothing interesting to see inside the representation? So in a series of work, what we have done is to try to find out if we can actually find meaning inside the representation that a GAN 
has learned in order to draw images. And what we, what we found is that indeed we can find units inside the neural network that are responsible of drawing specific objects. For instance, we have found that there are units that are responsible of drawing towers, trees, sky, and so on. So that opens a number of different things that we can do. On one hand, for instance, we can actually check if these units are responsible of drawing those objects by manipulating the representation that the network has built. So let's say that there are a group of units that we know are responsible of drawing windows. What happens if now we intervene here and we modify the activations of those units? So for instance, one thing that we can do is we can take one of the images that is generated by the GAN, like the one that I'm showing here, and now we can go inside the network and look at the units that are responsible of drawing windows and we can turn them off. What happens if we do that? Well, this is the new image that gets generated. Here, the only thing that we have done is to turn off the units that are responsible of drawing windows. The rest of the units are unchanged and then we we'll let the rest of the network to process the inputs as it would have normally done. And what we see is that the windows are gone and instead of the windows, we see a wall that has appeared. And the wall has a painting on it. And we have not specified that. The only thing that we have done is to turn off the units responsible of drawing windows. But the network was prepared to draw other objects instead. So what is really interesting here is that the representation seems to be meaningful, and this allows us to perform interventions on this representation. So actually, you can play with this. Um, we have a tool that is called GAN Paint, and it allows you to visualize images that are generated by a GAN and manipulate some of the concepts that we have identified inside the network. So for instance, here, you can select uh, the three units and activate them, and a tree will appear. Or you can select the grass units and select a region, and it will activate the units only on that region. And you know, the bottom of the picture will replace by grass. And what is interesting here is that these transformations of the picture, they are done exclusively by manipulating the activations of the units inside the GAN. So on one side, what is interesting is that we are capable of extracting some meaning outside of the representation that the GAN has learned automatically. And the same thing can be used for classifiers, providing a tool for explaining the behavior of a network. But this also gives us also a path towards learning from very few training examples. And this is uh, what I'm going to describe now, is the result of a collaboration with uh, Sandia Fiddler's uh, group at NVIDIA, a paper that we call Dataset GAN. So, when you have trained a GAN, we have seen that the internal representation seems to be meaningful. Here, what I'm showing is a GAN that has been trained to generate images of cars. And the image that you see here on the middle is a car that has, gener has been generated by the GAN, so this is not a real picture. And we can see that it's very realistic. This car has wheels and windows and doors and the ho door handles and mirrors and so on, so it's very, very accurate. So the GAN really knows all these different components that made up a car. The only thing that is missing is the names that we provide to those parts. It's just, it just knows how to produce pixels. So one thing that we could do now is we could go and annotate manually some of the images that are automatically generated by the GAN. And the question then is, how many images will we need to annotate in order to teach the GAN what these different parts of an object are? So one thing that we can do then is generate a bunch of images. We can annotate them manually. And we will annotate only a few of them. So instead of annotating just the shape of a car, because we will annotate just a few images, we are going to provide a lot of detail on the composition of the car. We will annotate lots and lots of different parts, something that will be really expensive to do if we had to produce a large training data set. But the goal here is just to teach these concepts to the GAN that it seems already knows what they are. So what we'll do here is we will only annotate 16 images. And then we will train a very shallow network, in this case it's composed just by three layers, that will take as input the internal representation of the GAN, and it will learn to regress these labels that we have provided for these 16 training examples. The point here, the hypothesis, is that the internal representation is so robust already and it contains so much semantic information that this classifier doesn't need to do a lot of work. And in fact, it will already generalize to many different viewpoints and changes of appearance. And in fact, 
what, happen, what happens is that once we have trained this branch, we can sample new images and the GAN will automatically produce images with pixels, but also the labels. And we can produce an almost infinite amount of training data. And here on the right, I'm showing you some examples of images that are automatically generated once this labeling branch has been trained. And we have done this for cars, faces, birds, and indoor scenes. Here there are some examples of a synthetic data set that is just produced by sampling images from this GAN, in this case, a GAN trained to generate cars. And you can see the amount of details that the label that the label segmentation has. And you can generate millions of images like that. It's just a question of sampling more and more images. And now you can use this to train your favorite segmentation algorithm. And then once you have trained that algorithm, you can run it on real images. And we have shown that it actually works fairly well. So what I'm showing here is the performance evaluation of a system that is trained to detect parts on cars. The vertical axis here represents the intersection over union, a standard measure for the quality of segmentation. The higher it is, the better. The red line represents the performance that you get if you supervise a system with 2,600 training examples. And the horizontal axis represents the number of training examples that we are going to use to train our GAN. In blue is the performances that you get with a system that is trained with the dataset that we generate synthetically by using just a very small number of training examples. And we can see here that first, we perform much better than other models based on transfer learning and, and semi-supervised learning. And we only need around 18 or 16 training examples in order to train that label branch that will then reproduce lots and lots of images that we can use to supervise a system and will reach the same performance that a system that has been trained with thousands of training examples. But this is just using 16 training examples, which is a very small amount of, of data. The community has done a lot of progress in trying to build systems that can learn in an unsupervised way. One of them is unsupervised contrastive learning, where you can train systems to build visual representations that are very powerful without using any kind of label data. So we have shown that recent advances actually allow you to get rid of the labels, or at least use a very small amount of label data. So now the next challenge that we have is, well, the images are still problematic. It's still costly to obtain, and they have a number of issues. So do we really need images? Can we build a vision system that learns to see without using labels and without using images either? So that seems kind of challenging, but we'll see how we can do it. So the first thing is for some of the results that I will show here now, I'm going to focus on a standard task, which is the ImageNet 100 classification task, which consists on given one image, you have to classify that image according to 100 possible classes. Generally, when you learn a visual representation, what you have is a neural network that will take as input your image and it will output a visual representation, which is going to be an encoding of that picture and you expect that encoding to be able to be discriminative of the different classes that you have. So now you can train a linear classifier on top of that and classify the input image according to one of the 100 classes by just using a linear classifier and your visual representation. Contrastive learning is one way of obtaining that visual representation using only images without any labels. And at the end, the only thing that you need to supervise is the last linear classification layer. However, if we want to have a system that generates, that has, that has the proper visual representation, but it has never looked at an image. Our challenge is, how do we obtain these weights? How do we build the weights that we need in order to build this visual representation? What are the weights that define our neural network? Okay, so here is one example of something that you can do to build a visual representation without ever having seen a single image. You could just use random weights. Okay, using random weights doesn't sound like a really good idea because the network is just behaving a little bit randomly, but people have shown that even random weights are capable of building interesting visual representations. And in fact, if we evaluate the performance that you can get on, on this image, ImageNet 100 classification task using a randomly initialized neural network, performances are already much better than chance. So what I'm showing here is a it's a table that we will be filling over time, as I'm showing different methods. The vertical axis is the performance on classification on this task, and the horizontal axis are the different methods. Here, what I'm showing is the performance that you get 
when you use a random linear initialized network, and you can see that it's slightly over 20%, which is much higher than chance. But the network has never actually looked at any image, only the last layer has. As an upper bound, we can think of what is the performance that you will get if you were, used to real, you were to use real images, but coming from a different data source. In this case, we will use the Places database, which is different than ImageNet. And that reaches around 55% performance. So it's unlikely that we will go beyond that performance. So our goal is to try to close the gap and try to have something that has never looked at an image and try to get the performance as high as possible. One possibility is to use simulated worlds. Here I'm showing images from the Clever dataset and from Minecraft, and they are both able to generate images that seem pretty real. And in fact, when you train a system to learn just the visual representation using these images, you get performances uh, that are much better than random initialized network. For instance, Clever reaches around 25%, and Minecraft, it goes up above 40% performance. But can we actually learn to see by looking at noise? People have shown, actually, that if you use fractal images, you can actually train a visual representation that is very powerful. Using fractal images, you can reach already above 30% classification rate on this task, which is pretty impressive, because these images, they look like nothing like real images. But can we learn to see by just looking at noise, like the one I'm showing here, or noise with different structures, different statistical properties? In fact, we know that biological systems generate no noisy-looking patterns before opening their eyes in order to learn visual representations that are useful. Like here I'm showing recordings from the mice, retinal waves that emerge before opening their eyes, and it seems to be a signal that is used to train the system. So there is actually a lot of research in, in natural image statistics showing that you can use processes to generate images that have characteristics that are similar to the ones of real images. Here, for instance, I'm showing one process that is called the dead leaves model. This was introduced in the 60s, and it consists of images of squares on top of each other of different sizes and colors. So here there are just examples of images that are generated by this process. You can change the orientations of the squares. You can also insert new figures like squares, circles, triangles, and you generate big data sets of images that look like this. And if you use those to train, you actually reach performances that are even higher than the fractals. Here is almost reaching 40% performance rate by using these mixtures of different shapes. And this process is really easy to reproduce. And these images are very powerful for learning visual representations. There are other properties that we know are intrinsic to natural images. For instance, we know that the power spectrum of natural images follows a 1 over f power law. We also know that if you take natural images and you filter them with zero mean filters, the responses are sparse. Most of the responses are zero with some high values, and these are well-known properties of natural images. We can use those to generate noise processes that will capture those statistical properties. And here there are samples of a noise process that captures some of the properties that we know exist in natural images. So what happens now if we train a system to learn to see through those images? Well, we get actually really, really close to the performance that you get with Minecraft images. But here, we didn't have to code an entire virtual environment. It's actually just noise processes, and the performance is, is almost there. And finally, there is another thing that we can do. We also know that GANs are really good at producing real images. What happens if we use a GAN to produce noise instead of real images? And the way that we can achieve that is by randomly initialize the weights of the GAN, or by using clever initialization that will capture some of the statistical properties that define natural images. So this GAN has never been trained with real images, it's just generating noise. And the images that I'm showing here are samples from this generative process. And here I'm showing more. These images actually capture even better properties than the ones I was showing before. And when you train with these images, you get the highest performance, which is above 40%, around 43-44% recognition rate, which is already pretty high. We still have a gap to close with real images, but it's getting really close. And the goal of this research agenda is to find noise processes that do not require any type of real images to one day be able to produce a training set that is capable of training a, a, a neural network with the same performance that you will have with real images. So the goal here is to build systems that will be robust and reliable and they can explain themselves. And we are trying to study ways in which we can get rid of the need of data that we need to train these systems nowadays. So thank you for your attention.
Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Bibirace and I am the VP of Engineering at Landing. I have been working on deep learning vision systems for the past five years. In this talk, I would like to share with you a few of the lessons that I have learned while building deep learning solutions for visual inspection problems. So let's get started. Deep learning is transforming visual inspection. Uh, in fact, the global deep learning machine vision market is estimated to reach $34 billion in 2023 by, uh, according to ABI research, and it is growing at a fast pace of 20% year over year. Let's take a look at automated visual inspection. Uh, it has been around for quite a few years, uh, first in the form of traditional machine vision and more recently as deep learning vision. So let's compare the two. In traditional machine vision, you have uh, rules and parameters that are tuned by a human expert. Uh, these systems are great for detecting regular patterns, uh, such as uh, I don't know bottle caps uh, on a production line. It works very well in a controlled environment, uh, though it needs to be retuned or maintained um, whenever conditions change, such as fabrication changes on the production line. By contrast, an AI deep learning based vision system uses labeled pictures of defects to learn automatic and learn automatically from them. Um, it, in that way, it can learn even very complex patterns and it's great at detecting such uh, patterns. It is robust in uncontrolled environment and through continuous learning, it's able to learn over time and maintain uh, performance when conditions change, uh, such as a change in the fabrication process for that production line. And best of all, it is able to match human level uh, performance over time, uh, where the human would be the human quality inspector on that uh, production line. So what are the challenges though with AI-based visual inspection? 75% of the executives acknowledge that they struggle to scale AI beyond a pilot project, according to Accenture. Where do this struggle come from? Well, teams are usually able to successfully build proof of concepts to demonstrate baseline capabilities, but they are generally unable to uh, iterate perf AI performance to the level that is required in production. And even as they, if, they, if they are able to reach it, it is also hard to maintain it in the production line under the changes that, you know, that may occur over time uh, over there. So, what can we do about it? Um, we actually have faced this problem ourselves, but before I tell you a bit more about that, so let me share one success story. A year or so ago, I had built uh, an AI vision system that was deployed uh, to detect uh, leaky compressors, like there was a tank in which you lower a compressor and you look for bubbles um, and if you see bubbles, the compressor is leaky. So for that system, we have uh, uh, set it up on the production line and we collected data for three months, which is the time we needed to collect about a hundred or so defective parts. Uh, and then after that, the AI system was deployed in production for a month and worked alongside the human inspector. We inspected 10,000 parts so in that month and there were five disagreements, surprisingly little, but there were only five disagreements between the human and the AI, the human inspector and the AI. So we were curious about that and we looked at what happened. Uh, and uh, when we looked at the videos, we noticed that the AI missed one leaky compressor. It was, a, you know, a true-false negative. It was a hard-to-detect edge case. It was barely visible in, uh, in the video stream. However, the human inspector missed four leaky compressors and all those were actually easy to see and most likely it was due to lack of attention on the human side. So it's very important, it's an example, you know, where AI can uh, match a very careful human, but usually be able to outperform a normal human on an inspection line who may not be paying attention all the time. So what have we learned um, um, while working on visual inspection pro uh, projects? Well, in the early days, we were focused a lot on what I would call a model-centric approach. We were training our models and continue to iterate on them, uh, work a lot on model selection, hyperparameter tuning, we'd spend about 80% of our time on that. Uh, and after we've done all that work, we would always hit a wall, we would achieve a baseline performance like 75%, but then it was very hard to iterate beyond that. So we stepped back and we took a look at how we can improve our process. And as a result of that, we came up with uh, the life cycle of an AI project, a more comprehensive end-to-end -end life cycle. 
So the first step that is very important is to scope out the project that you are about to take as a computer uh, vision uh, solution. Particularly, you need to define uh, target metrics and make sure that they are feasible for the, um, for the type of ta visual task that needs to be performed. Then once you establish that, then you go and collect data and label it. In order to label it, you need to understand the defects, the defect types, and have very consistent labeling uh, rules as well. Once you do that, then you, you go, you train your model, and your model may not perform um, you know, very well from the very beginning. So you look at the cases that it misses and then you iterate back usually in the data by you maybe add data that it is missing or you, uh, you fix some of the labels that may have been incorrectly um, labeled by the human labelers. Uh, and then finally, after the model achieves a decent performance, you deploy the solution to production in shadow mode and monitor it uh, compared to the human operator on the line. When we went through this process, we noticed that we are spending 80% of our time on uh, collecting and labeling data and only 20% on training and iterating the model. So we call this the data-centric approach and it is very important when, when you have a deep learning based vision project, it is, uh, especially for the field of visual inspection, it is extremely important to focus on the data part and follow a data-centric approach. So what are the challenges with the data? Well, it is possible for defects not to be well imaged and if a human cannot uh, see them by looking at the images, neither can uh, AI. Or it is possible for the defect definition types to be ambiguous if human experts cannot agree whether a particular uh, scratch is def if defective or not, then there is no way for AI to learn a consistent way about that. And finally, even if the rules or the labeling rules are well established, uh, the defects may not be labeled consistently uh, because of the uh, inconsistency of the labelers, right? So we need to detect that as well. Uh, if any of these things happen, uh, then it is hard for AI to learn. So the data-centric approach is about making sure the defects are well imaged, the defect uh, definitions are very clear, and the labeling is consistent on your data set. Here in is an example from still sheet uh, uh, defects. Here I show you uh, a couple of uh, scratches and dents and edge defects on uh, actually on a steel production line. The customer that came to us with this problem, they uh, had a baseline accuracy of 76% for their system, but they wanted to achieve 90% and they didn't uh, have a path forward for that. So we stepped in to help them. So to recap, the baseline was at 76%. The customer has already iterated and tried multiple models and did a lot of hyperparameter tuning, yet there were no improvements, so it remains at 0% uh, uh, increase over the baseline. So when we looked at the data, uh, we noticed a lot of inconsistency and we noticed defect classes that were very close and hard to distinguish from each other and uh, there was no business reason to keep them separate, so we actually merged some of those classes together. So after we did a couple of uh, data-centric iterations, uh, just pretty much by um, clarifying the defects and um, uh, improving the labeling, we were able to achieve about a 17% improvement over baseline up to 93%, making that solution ready to go to production. And we did similar with other um, uh, type of inspection projects. So to show you very briefly, what does labeling consistency mean? Uh, let's say that uh, we've got a couple of defects, uh, like the black dots here, and three labelers, they label, but in highly inconsistent ways. Uh, labeler one does very tight bounding boxes around the, um, uh, the defect. Labeler two groups multiple defects in, uh, in one bounding box. And labeler three does uh, larger, a little bit looser bounding boxes. So if we get them to agree and we establish a rule for everybody and we communicate that rule clearly, then all the labelers can label consistently among themselves and this will give a chance to the model to learn a lot better than in the previous case. You can see that if you present this kind of data to uh, a deep learning model, it's much more likely to learn how to do object detection more accurately than, uh, than in the previous case. Um, so the key takeaways from this uh, talk is that you have to start small and build a POC first. Um, use a data-centric approach to iterate. It is very important to focus on data and not on models. Models tend to perform about the same. Uh, and you have to handle the full uh, AI project lifecycle from the initial scoping to the data management to uh, model iteration and finally model deployment. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your time. So this is me, Daniel Biberazza. I'm uh, the VP of Engineering Atlantic. Thank you very much.
I think, uh, hi, this is Jae Jun. This is the uh, end of the, all the talks in session three. So now let's start Q&A session, uh, Q&A for session three. I will take questions from audience. So please use raise uh, hand button in the meeting if you, have, if you guys have any questions. Okay, uh, Songan, it's it's your turn. You can ask questions to anyone. Uh, okay. Uh, hi, my name is Songan Park from Site, and I have some questions to Daniel. And uh, in your talk, you emphasize that collecting good quality data is very important for building a great AI system. So I have two questions related to this. And the first question is, uh, how can we measure or evaluate the quality of collected data? So what do you think is the characteristics or conditions of the good quality data? That's my first question. And the second question is, uh, how can you actually get this good data for visual inspection problems? So can you provide some best practices for a data collection process? Thanks. Sure. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, so this typical uh, part of the imaging uh, setup to solve a computer vision problem uh, is quite commonly handled by uh, system integrators. Um, uh, when when a, you need to set the right camera in the right resolution and uh, with the right uh, lighting uh, conditions and uh, depending of what you are imaging uh, you may have or not have kind of a depth of field issue to deal with whether the object is is planar or uh, it has 3d information uh, as well the the most basic rule of thumb for, um, for for setting up a good imaging system is to just make sure that once the image is captured, it is as easy in the image to detect that defect as it is when you can look at the actual physical part. Uh, and when you set things up like this, it is important to have a variety of defective parts, including harder defects, like maybe if it scratches, you like look for smaller or more faint uh, scratches. So it's important to get some of those harder cases and prove that your imaging solution can have a very clear uh, shot and highly visible by a human. So leaving aside the machine learning model, a human should be able to relatively easy see the, um, uh, the defective region almost as well as it can see in the uh, actual physical part. Um, and, uh, and to your second question, um, Sorry, can you actually repeat one more time your second question? Yes. Uh, can you provide some best practices for data collection process? Yes. Uh, so it's usually system integrators who help set up uh, uh, cameras on, on production line. Um, they... Um, they usually know. So the things that I mentioned is uh, depending on the defect that you need to image, the minimum size and the size of the part uh, that you need to, to capture, you have to pick the right resolution. You need at least a couple of pixels in uh, each direction for the even your smallest defect in order to be able to, to capture it, right? Uh, you need good lighting condition and proper exposure. You don't want your defective regions to be either over and uh, underexposed. Uh, and you need to be well in focus and if depth of field is an issue like you need to capture like a like a range of uh, of distances then there are you know the proper cameras and so you can set the aperture you know and the camera in such a way so you can capture the defect in the entire depth of field range that you are interested in uh, yeah so i hope this answers your question okay yes thanks for the answer okay next question would come from uh, Hyung Sok. Yeah. Hi, I'm Hyung Sok Soon from SITE. I have a question to Professor Toralba. Um, you showed that there can be a way to develop deep learning algorithms without using real world data. But uh, in my opinion, to solve real world problems, it seems that we still need real world data. How much data do you think is the minimum required for uh, your world problem. Yeah, so when you are trying to solve a real world problem, it is true that you are going to need uh, real data at some point. 
Uh, well, it depends on what the problem is. It could be that you can actually build pretty good simulators for that, and you might get away with actually not using actually any real data. But um, but the most likely thing is that you will need some real data. The point is, um, in order to minimize the amount of data that you need, you want to start with a visual representation that is powerful enough that you don't need to train the whole visual system by using the data that you know focuses on solving one particular application. There are a lot of parts of the visual representation that should be more generic and that one expects that um, you know, it's like in, you know, for you, when you uh, study a new subject, you don't need to learn to read every single time that you study a new subject. Now, there are a number of things that you already know. And those things that are very generic and shared across many different tasks is the part that we believe might be possible to learn without actually using real data or at least get really close. But at the end, you always have to close the final, the, you, you need to take the final step that is going to need real data. How much do you need? Well, that really will depend on how complex your task is. You know? You really want to have data that covers a number of possibilities that is diverse. And, and you, you know, depending on the task and how complex it is, you will need more or less. So it's, it's hard to put a number. Uh, Thank you, Kilo. Thank you. So let's uh, finish this Q and A session for now. Uh, thank you, speakers and audience, uh, for Q and A session again. Thank you. Thank you to all of our three speakers for their presentations. And next, I'll briefly introduce the results of the Samsung AI Challenge for Korean undergraduate and graduate students. This is the first competition related to machine learning algorithms that can predict energy band gaps by using a database of material molecular structures. About 220 teams participated in the Samsung AI Challenge and the top three teams which derived the most accurate learning algorithms were selected as winners. So congratulations! Kwangun University took first place, followed by Seoul National University in the second place, and Songgyunggan University in third place. Congratulations once again to all of our winners! Now it's time to award the Samsung AI Researcher of the Year. So the purpose of the Samsung AI Researcher of the Year Award is to encourage young AI researchers under the age of 35 and the winners were selected after an in-depth evaluation of renowned professors and experts of Samsung. First, before we announce the winner, Hyo Young Jin, the president and head of the Samsung Advanced Institute of Technology, will introduce the meaning of the award. Dr. Jin, please. Hello everyone, I am Kyo Young Jin, head of Samsung Advanced Institute of Technology. First of all, I'd like to thank all of you for tuning into this forum from around the world and the speakers for their inspiring presentations. Samsung Advanced Institute of Technology is a corporate R&D research hub conducting advanced research in various fields such as AI, devices, materials, environmental topics, and many more. In the field of AI, we are working on developing AI algorithms for computer vision, speech, and language, as well as deep learning and machine learning. We are also strengthening collaborations with the university and the research institute all over the world. In this session, we are going to announce the winners of the Samsung AI Researcher of the year 2021 and have the opportunity to hear from them. Samsung AI Researcher of the Year was launched last year with a mission of identifying and supporting rising stars in the field of AI under 35 years of age. Last year's award went to Professor Kyung Hyun Jo of New York University, Professor Chelsea Finn 
and the Jian Zhu Wu of Stanford University, Professor Seth Flexman of Imperial College London, and Professor Zhou Ru Xian of UCLA. We have seen a rise in the number of applications for this year, with more than 150 applicants globally. I would like to thank you all for taking part. The selection process was led by a committee consisting of eminent professors along with AI experts with Samsung Electronics. A careful review was conducted based on the applicant's recent research achievement and its impact to the community. I'd like to give my special thanks to Professor Joshua Benjo for co-chairing the forum with me and reading the award committee. I also would like to thank Professor Robert Cipolla from the University of Cambridge, Professor Catherine McQuan from Columbia University, Professor Kyung Hyun Jo from New York University, Professor Victor Limpinski from Stockholm Tech Russia for participating in the selection process. Okay, now it is both my pleasure and honor to announce the esteemed winners of the Samsung Research of the Year 2021. Dr. Jin, thank you so much for the great introduction. So with that, we will announce the winners for Samsung AI Researcher of the Year. So now, let's meet who got this year's award. Congratulations to all of our winners. So next, let's hear some comments from Professor Yosha Benjo, the chairman of the jury. So Professor Benjo, could you please come back again? So it, it gives me great pleasure today to be part of this process um, to tell you about the, the, the new awards. The criteria that the committee followed in, in the decision were uh, the following. First of all, we had a focus on early career researchers and the diversity of groups inside the AI community. Second, of course, we looked at the scientific impact of the papers of the candidates uh, and the originality of their work. Uh, one way that uh, we can look at each other's work is, uh, you know, a few years later, looking at uh, what followed up, uh, whether that work seemed to have foresight and scientific significance. So, of course, uh, more years will tell, but, um, and it's difficult to tell these things ahead of time, but th this is what guided us. Um, looking not just at our reading of their work, but also the evidence from um, other organizations, signs of recognition by the scientific community. So our uh, committees uh, shared the pros and cons of the different choices. And at the end of the day, it was very difficult to make those choices because there are really a lot of very strong young researchers in our community. So uh, thanks, uh, Samsung, for uh, setting this up and, and funding this. Uh, it was uh, great to be part of this uh, effort. Um, it gives me great pleasure to announce the Samsung AI Researchers of the Year today. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you, Professor Vengio. And now let's have a brief talk with winners of the Samsung AI Researcher of the Year. Hi, I'm Philip Isola. I'm an assistant professor at MIT. And I'm really thankful and honored to have received this award. I'm thankful to, to Samsung, uh, but also especially thankful to my students who, whose work is really what's being rewarded here 
their work is what I'm talking about um, in the recorded talk. And also to my mentors and colleagues over the years in grad school and during my postdoc. So to introduce myself and my research very quickly, I am interested in the problem of understanding intelligence. I especially study visual perception. And I would like to make AI systems that operate more like natural intelligence. I think there's a lot of differences right now between AI and natural intelligence. Uh, one is that natural intelligence is emergent. It comes about through some evolutionary process and unsupervised learning process. Another is that it tends to be more general purpose than our current AIs. And another is that it's embodied in a physical ecosystem. So on those three fronts, we're trying to make progress to make AI systems that are closer to you know, human-like, animal-like abilities. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Judy Hoffman. I'm an assistant professor at Georgia Tech in the College of Computing. I'm really honored to win this award and want to thank Samsung and the entire selection committee for this recognition. A big thank you goes out to my students and collaborators for making all of this research possible as well as to my mentors, family, and friends for their continued guidance and support. My research lies at the intersection of computer vision and machine learning, and my overall goal is to create vision systems that are reliable and accessible for everyone. I do this by introducing new learning mechanisms that enable vision systems to be resilient to the visual changes encountered in a diverse world. Such systems can withstand or quickly adapt as visual domains change, like a self-driving car that recognizes pedestrians on rural roads, despite being trained primarily in city centers. Increasing the resiliency of vision systems will make automated recognition tools accessible to those with limited resources and reliable across the large diversity of our world. Hey, hello everyone, my name is Yarin Gal. I'm an associate professor in machine learning at the University of Oxford. I'm excited to be one of the awardees for the Samsung AI Research of the Year 2021. My research is on building tools uh, that can tell us when our models are guessing at random or when they make unsubstantiated guesses, when we should trust our models and when we should not. We have worked together with, uh, we have worked in medical domain, in astronomy, uh, with NASA, in autonomous driving, with Toyota and others. We work with practitioners and with industry to build and deploy safe machine learning tools, machine learning tools that we can deploy and trust. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jacob Andreas. I'm an assistant professor at MIT, where I work at the intersection of natural language processing and machine learning. I'm interested in building AI systems that can communicate effectively with humans and learn from human teaching and guidance. We build models that use language to guide their actions, describe their observations of the world, and explain their decisions. I'm honored to have been included as an AI researcher of the year in this incredible group of researchers. And I'm grateful to my students, without whom none of this research would have been possible, and to Samsung, uh, both for this generous award and for their sponsorship of artificial intelligence research more broadly. Hello, everyone. I'm Di Yang, currently an, an assistant professor at the School of Interactive Computing at the Georgia Institute of Technology. It's a huge honor to be here and I'm very excited to join this group of the Samsung AI Researcher of the Year in 2021. My research focuses on natural language processing, machine learning, and computational social science, especially around how we can build NLP models for low-resourced data, dialect, and language settings, and around how we can enable NLP models to be more user-centric trustworthy, and responsible for social good applications. I look forward to meeting you all. Thank you. Congratulations once again to all five winners of the Samsung AI Researcher of the Year. And for your information, you can also watch each winner's contribution speech 
either on the Samsung YouTube channel or on the 2021 Samsung AI Forum's official website immediately after this forum. And now we will move on to the panel discussion. The discussion today will be moderated by Vice President Yong Sang Che. So, Vice President, please lead the session. Thank you for joining us uh, for this panel discussion of Samsung AI Forum. Today, we invited six valuable panelists, Professor Yoshua Benjo, Professor Herbrand Cedar, Professor Kathleen McCowan, Professor Antonio Toralba, Professor Kunne Olukotun, and Mr. Andrew Feldman. Thank you for coming to this panel discussion. So today's uh, panel discussion, uh, we prepared some pre-selected questions. And next, we will get some impromptu questions from the audience. The first question is to Dr. Benjo. Do you think we can build multi-purpose monolithic artificial neural network like human brains that can perform various tasks if it is trained properly with enough data? Yeah, um, I don't think the human brain is monolithic. Uh, but uh, a lot of the neural nets that we have built in, in AI are monolithic in the sense that they're not structured into a bunch of uh, modules. Um, it's kind of the same pattern of connection, for example, that's repeated uh, uh, over and over. And in principle, I think these kinds of networks could learn any function Right? We have a lot of theory and, and even experiments that supports that as you grow the size of the network, as you grow the amount of data, they can learn pretty much anything reasonable. Um, the problem is uh, it gets more and more expensive in terms of the size and the amount of data needed um, if, you, if you want to learn more complex uh, functions. And we're seeing this in language modeling, for example, where the the value added by bigger and bigger networks uh, diminishes. So there's diminishing returns there. And if you look at the human brain instead, um, you have a lot more structure. For example, you have modular structure, you have specialization, you have areas of the brain that are uh, uh, really specialized to a particular tasks. They're like uh, expert modules. And they, they, they don't, connect to every other part of the brain. There's, well, it wouldn't work, first of all, physically. So um, so my, my money, my bet is on more structured architectures that are not monolithic. And that's important to reduce what we call sample complexity, like how many examples do I need to get a particular performance? And uh, right now we have machines that require much higher sample complexity than what humans need for learning some, some new task. Thank you, Dr. Benjo. The next question is to Dr. Tralba. Do you believe that it would be possible for AI algorithms to achieve human level data efficiency in training? Uh, yes, I, I am an optimist. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that we can beat humans. Um, but I think that one important question is, uh, in order to achieve that, we really need to understand also no, how how efficient really humans are? I don't think humans are that efficient necessarily. And what, one of the important things is that uh, when humans, when we think about the data that humans uh, have, it's not just visual data. They really, you know, they really sense the world through a lot of different mechanisms, and and you have uh, touch, and you have audio, and you have a smell and taste. And all of these senses are gathering data in parallel at the same time. So the amount of data that you have at each episode is huge. And if you think of uh, current AI systems, like in particular in computer vision, the most typical data sample is one picture and one label or maybe one caption. That's really extremely poor as a form of data. So I think that uh, when we say that efficiency, I think the data needs to be first needs to be a lot richer. Uh, and then, you know, we will be able to start reaching human performance. Also, humans actually uh, 
are not passive observers of the world. They are actually interacting with the world and, and performing all kinds of experiments. And that's, that's key on, on, the, on, on the learning process that a human has. And I think that in order to achieve that level of efficiency, we need to incorporate all of these things and make them really like the main characters of, of the movie uh, that you know, AI is, 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 is playing now. But, um, and I think that most of AI systems not tackle one aspect of this. This question is to Dr. Cedar. What is the most promising direction for dealing with out of distribution samples, especially in material science? For example, it is difficult to estimate properties of a molecule, which has much different property values from the training samples. That is true, but I would argue that whether something is out of sample depends on the feature space in which you, you characterize it, right? So things that look out of sample in one feature space may look remarkably similar to 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 the sample in another feature space and this is probably where the low hanging fruit of integrating physical models with ai will come in sort of picking inte intelligently picking feature spaces um, there's obviously some work going on on pushing models more into exploration than exploitation mode but you're correct that even such models would never find, say, a completely unknown class of materials. But what I would argue is to maybe pick on a point that the, the, the previous guest brought up, that there's a peril in science that I think what we have learned that rapid iteration uh, of a model that can actually do its own experiments also seems to be the success in science for discovery. So if we take just static input like all the known data that's computed or that is extracted, we can only predict so much. But as we build models that now do an attempt at a prediction, we close that loop by doing experiments and learn from that, um, we get actually a much more effective prediction engine. So it seems like se rapid sequential learning may be the key in science as well to success with AI. The next question is to Dr. McCowan. Do you think there is any limitation in performance or capabilities for learning under a very large amount of parameters like GPT language models? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I, I don't think we've seen yet that GPT language models can uh, solve all problems that we're looking at. I think we can definitely find cases uh, now um, and as well going forward where a GPT language model um, does not solve the task as desired. Uh, uh, in fact, sometimes we can be surprised with the output that we get. So I think the question is, uh, why does this happen? Um, it can be that the task is more difficult than is represented in the data, and we need to augment the language model with um, other more specific models, for example, using multitask learning. Um, or it could be that the data is biased, and this is often a problem in uh, language. Um, because here we rely on data that has been collected over many years. Um, so if we consider, for example, the case of determining what a pronoun refers to, uh, we might note that our data can represent stereotypes that we've learned over the years. So for example, it uh, may represent that most people, in many cases, doctors are typically male and nurses are typically female. And so when doing machine translation, this may mean that the model uh, may generate a male pronoun when referring to a doctor, even if we know from the doctor's name that uh, she's a woman. Uh, so, so I think there are still um, a lot of outstanding issues and interesting uh, directions to go in. Thank you. This question is to Mr. Feldman. Will the AI models continue to grow beyond hundreds of trillions of parameters after GPT-3? What GPT-4 and 5? Thanks for the question. I, I think we've seen all sorts of interesting progress from GPT-2 to GPT-3. I think we're going to see 
some continued progress. Um, you know, the guys at OpenAI have a have a hypothesis about how how uh, these models will behave as they get larger. But I, I I think Dr. McEwen's point about whether there's a, a a problem either with the data or with this the way this type of model attacks the problem and it might benefit from uh, a different type of model to augment it makes a great deal of sense. I, I think there there are very few approaches uh, that solve all problems or even all within a class, very few approaches that solve an entire class of problems. And so while I do think these models will continue to get larger and we've built infrastructure today that, that supports uh, 100 trillion parameters, I, I think that uh, uh, over time we, we will augment these with, with other approaches and come out with, with, with better results for it. But in the near term, I think you can expect them to keep getting bigger. Thank you. This question is to Dr. Benjo. From a sustainability point of view, will the analog neuromorphic processes replace current NPU? Well, I don't have a crystal ball, like none of us does. Um, but I do think there is a huge potential for uh, greater efficiency in terms of power, uh, space, and, and so on um going analog now people have been um attracted by this possibility for decades i remember in the early 90s at uh, bell labs uh i was there and we were experimenting with that and and it, you know it's still it's still on the horizon and um, we we haven't found the recipe that beats the uh progress of uh digital hardware but but i do think it's worth continuing um and uh, of course, I've been involved in a particular research direction that is trying to think uh, more abstractly about how a physical dynamical system in continuous time with devices that are imperfect in the sense that they don't do exactly what's uh, written in the book because they, they're, you know, physical, um, could be optimized using and a gradient estimator, which is different from backprop, but but uh, turns out you could compute even without knowing like the true mathematical formula um, of each device. Um, and so I think these kinds of directions are interesting because if we can uh, make them work, we could train large analog circuits, uh, uh, not being bugged down by the imperfections of the circuits or even the noise in the circuits and thus have, um, uh, you know, uh, avoid the discretization that is very expensive uh, energy-wise that we normally have in, in our uh, circuits. And, and, and I know, of course, some uh, companies are starting to explore this for um, design of new uh, hardware that's uh, analog. Thank you. Dr. Benjo, for biological brains, higher intelligence does not necessarily require a huge size such as the whale's brain. Can we enhance AI not requiring gigantic computational resources? I certainly hope so. Uh, for one, I'm an academic, so I don't have access to huge computing power, and I'm focusing my research on uh, new architectures and training frameworks um, that can deliver, hopefully, lower sample complexity and, and more efficient computation for the, the, you know, the outcome we get. And more specifically, in your question, there is a word that's really important to me, and that's high-level cognition. Um, I think this is a key to a, a different type of neural nets, uh, inspired also by human brains, but to the, the kind of computation we do consciously um, when we uh, manipulate abstractions and we reason. In we, uh, I want to connect this to the previous discussion on GPT-3 and language models. Uh, to me, one of the ingredients that's missing in these large language models is reasoning, is systematic generalization, is um, a structure in the... Um, the way that knowledge is represented, 
that allows to recombine pieces of knowledge on the fly in a very flexible way, but also in a way that reflects the structure, uh, the causal structure in the world. And, 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 and by the way, I think it's not just a question of architecture. I think that uh, another related but big missing piece in those large language models is they don't experience the world. And, you know, they only see texts. Um, and of course, uh, combining text and images is a first step and video would be even better, but even better would be systems that can interact with their environment. And we've discussed that a bit earlier with uh, Dr. Toralba. So um, I, I think that the current recipe in the GPT family of models is, is missing a lot of ingredients um, in that we can uh, take clues from uh, how humans do it uh, at a high level, how they uh, structure knowledge, how they uh, manipulate it on the fly using attention mechanisms, for example, in order to build uh, a really different brand of, um, of deep learning. At least that's uh, what I'm putting my money on. Thank you. This question is to Dr. Toralba. How much trust can you give to the deep learning algorithms that you dis developed? Yeah, I guess uh, this is a trick question. No, so <laughs> I think that uh, uh, trust is uh, is uh, generally something that we think of. Um, it's a word that we use to describe systems that have some responsibility that are going to be deployed in the world, and. In our case, like in my case and, and, and many of us, we work really on fundamental research. So the algorithms that we developed are not meant to be deployed immediately. Um, but in that case, the, the word trust is also very important, but it has a different meaning. So when we trust an algorithm that we produce, uh, the service that we provide is that the algorithm should be reproducible. Uh, others in the community should be able to, to reproduce the experiments that we did. Uh, the, the, the results should be robust. They should generalize even beyond the experiments that we did in the lab. And that's kind of the expectation when you publish a, a paper or when you, when you develop an algorithm. Um, the, you know, it should inspire others to build new pieces. Uh, it should be open so that others can find out what is wrong with it and what it you know, needs to be improved. And all of these pieces are what you know the word trust means in in fundamental research when when you think of trusting uh, a particular algorithm. So in that in that sense, you know, I trust my algorithms very much. At least uh, that's what we aim for. Um, but I think that is. You know, knowing that these systems are far from being deployable in the real world. So if you had to deploy them in the world, would you trust them? No, not, not yet. I think that in order to trust these algorithms, you need to perform a lot of different analysis. Uh, and not just the algorithm, but how do you train it and you know, what implications will it have and so on. So that's a much, much more complex problem and it requires a lot more research. Thank you. This, this question is also to uh, Dr. Toralba. Do you think the trustworthiness of an algorithm can be evaluated? What would be the proper metric to trustworthiness? Um, well, so, so yeah, I think that we can measure uh, trust. Uh, you know, how trustworthy is a, is a particular algorithm. Um, the challenge really is going to be, you know, can we trust the measure? Um, like, for instance, you know, we really know how to measure the performance of systems, but we can trust you know, those measures. Well, we know that they don't really generalize when you, you know, when you measure performance in a particular setting and then you deploy it and you check what happens, then you see that the performance is different. Now you have uh, data set shift problems. You have uh, a number of issues that make makes the performance to be different. And here we are talking about a very well understood and accepted measure of performance of a system, you know, clear metrics and so on. Um, trustworthiness of a system is, is a much more complex problem. Um, and so can we trust these measures? I think that you know, we can evaluate maybe how trustworthy is, is a system in a particular setting but how is going to behave in a, in, in, when, when the setting is different because we are deploying it on the real world? It's just going to be very hard and it will require 
to do experiments, you know, maybe deploy it little by little so that you can actually measure what is going on. And the problem is that trustworthiness is, 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 is also something that is dynamic. It's not a measure like performance with that you get a number and it always means the same thing. Trustworthiness changes over time uh, because it, 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 it is, it's a multidimensional problem. It's a, it, you're trying to measure something that has many dimensions. So you're not going to have a single number and it's going to be about uh, how robust the system is, how fair it is, how, what is the societal impact that it has. All of these aspects are part of this measure and they evolve with society. They don't mean the same thing in one place than in another place. And it's just going to be complicated measures. So thank you for your ideas. Dr. Benjo, can you add some ideas? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I agree very much with Antonio on this. Um, I would add a couple of things. Um, uh, there, there is an aspect of trust, which is uh, quite interesting. And, and I've been thinking about uh, recently. And th that goes under the label of epistemic uncertainty. In other words, how much does the model know about its you know, itself, like how, uh, how, how does the model trust itself? Um, and, and there are a number of methods that have been proposed to estimate that, that sort of thing. Um, and it can be useful uh, to say, well, I don't trust my own answer in this region, for example, and ask a human to come in. So that's, that's uh, one, one aspect I wanted to mention. And the other aspect, uh, Antonio mentioned briefly is, you know, the social aspect of trust, um, which, which gets hard to, to put metrics on. And, it, uh, and it's not going to be just computer scientists uh, being involved here. Like we need to talk to people who understand the social impacts, um, people who are, you know, even the users. Uh, wh what is it that can go wrong? Um, the fairness issues that he mentioned, the discrimination issues, but but all kinds of uh, consequences that we don't necessarily envision and, and it's hard to put numbers on, but we still need to do those things. At least some people need to do that. Engineers, uh, like are more like the people who are used to thinking about the safety issues, for example, and deployment issues and so on, and, and running these tests. Um, and it, it, it's, it's not easy to formalize that into a simple mathematical uh, equation, unfortunately. Thank you. This question is to Dr. McCowan. Because deep learning is data driven, it is important to have proper training data for a trustworthy algorithm. What do we need to consider for the training data acquisition and augmentation if necessary? So um, when I was first thinking about the answer to this question, I was also thinking, well, how do we define trustworthy so that we know what kind of um, data requirements we have? And initially, I was thinking uh, just in terms of performance that we trust an algorithm if it gives us the right answer. Um, but I, I do like all of the discussion that has come before this. One thing that I would add in terms of trustworthiness, especially when we have interaction with the user, is the ability for the machine to explain how it came up with its answer. So this would be um, interpretability or explainability. And Certainly, we can think if we're interacting uh, one human with another and we're not sure that we trust a response of, you know, yes or um, 100, you know, that we might ask how they came up with that answer. Um, so, in terms of data requirements, um, I guess I would think of um, several things. Um, if we want to be able to trust whether the results of um, are accurate, first, um, of course, all machine learning algorithms have some level of error in them, and we can reduce that level of error it, um, in a number of ways. One, if we collect 
data for training that has a distribution that's similar to what we expect to find in the wild. Um, if we collect a large amount of data, um, if we're using data augmentation, which is very likely to have noise, then if we can reduce the noise that we have in that process. Um, but if we also want to have interpretable algorithm, um, algorithms, then uh, we may think about augmenting our data not only with um, labels for learning um, how to answer, but with rationales as well, which can provide uh, some um, reason for why this label is, is being selected. Um, the big problem is that for many tasks, we don't have adequate amounts of data and we never will. Um, and we can think about, you know, how to get substitutes for the data that we need. Uh, but another approach would be to turn to and begin work on developing um, zero shot and few shot models that uh, can enable good results with very small amounts of data. Thank you. This question is to Dr. Olu Kotun. Recently, to train AI models, major companies such as Facebook or Google are building their own AI data center systems according to their workload characteristics. Do you think that the trend of proprietary systems will continue or there will be another standardization coming? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. So clearly you've seen the uh, development of specialized AI uh, uh, infrastructure at Google and to some extent uh, at, at Amazon. At, at Google, of course, it's very focused on, on their particular uh, internal uh, applications, their search applications, and, and uh, you know, may not be as uh, applicable to uh, you know, people outside of Google. And, you know, there's lots of, of benefits to doing that for a company of, of the scale of Google. So you can Im you imagine that, that if you're a large um, uh, uh, hyperscaler and, and you've got the, the capabilities and you really understand your application and you've got enough scale, you can make it worthwhile. But I think for the other, uh, most of the other, you know, uh, uh, commercial entities and and, and uh, government uh, labs, they're going to need an alternative that's more efficient than, than what we have in the marketplace today uh, in the form of GPUs. But necessarily that approach uh, that, that provides the capability for training large uh, types of, of different kinds of, of models, language models, uh, uh, image models, recommendation models, and, and uh, other models that are, are yet to be conceived, it will require some sort of flexible substrate, right? That, that's very programmable, right? So if you've got a search problem uh, and you've got a very specific uh, target application, you can make something that's very specialized, but it's not going to be flexi flexible enough uh, for, for others uh, to use. And so I think that, that you're going to see both you know, I think, I think what, what, what we've seen in this whole ML space is this proliferation of new architectures, new ideas, and you're going to see both uh, 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 the use of specialized architectures for, as I said, companies that are large enough, and you'll see some new standardization of much more flexible uh, uh, infrastructure that can be used by a large variety of other companies and, and uh uh, and research uh, institutions and government uh, labs. Thank you. This question is to Dr. Cedar. For AI-based re materials research, data acquisition cost is very high. How can you drastically increase the amount of training data? Well, I think you hit the, the nail right on the head, right? In the physical sciences, data is expensive. So I would say that we are probably today less limited by the development of new machine learning models than we are uh, limited by by data um, and i think until we have ai that can build frameworks in which we learn the way humans does which is a topic that was brought up before i think we will always require uh, a lot of data there are some solutions that make some impact for example 
we, because we are physics, we study physics-based systems, there are physical laws in place, and we can compute data to some extent approximately. We can, for example, solve the equations of quantum mechanics and compute data. And, and you see most of the machine learning done today has been done on these very large computer data sets. They, they somewhat defeat the purpose because if you can compute it a million times, then why do you need to machine learn it, right? But what it can be used for is in transfer learning models. So you can compute the band gap of materials inaccurately, maybe, you know, 10,000 times, and then use the whatever, five or 700 experimental points that are known to make predictions. Um, the other thing we see, of course, is uh, use, making use of historical data through text mining, through natural language processing efforts. Um, sadly, in physical science, most data is locked up in publications, uh, the rate of which is exponentially increasing. And the only solution to that is probably is natural language processing. But in my opinion, where the real solution lies will be in the self-learning systems. Mm -hmm. Because in experiments we have done, doing three iterations with 20 samples brings you much further than doing a single iteration with a with 100,000 samples. And that's because uh, physical science, again, is about iteration. It's about learning and then decision-making and then learning again. So I think the sort of AI-driven laboratories that decide on their own experiments to do is really how you're going to solve the data problem. You're going to solve the data problem by not solving it, by working with small amounts of data in every iteration, and then decide what to do next, this sort of guided exploration. Because it's unlikely we're going to get to a scenario where you have millions of data points on physical samples. Professor Cedar, can you use simulation to help there? Yeah, and that's being done, right? So in, in some aspects, we use simulation and train machine learning based on that. But of course, you can only learn things as accurate as the simulation is or as relevant as the simulation is. So that still leaves you with, A, properties that cannot be simulated well, uh, because you may not even know the basic physics. So today, we can pretty much only simulate well the things where we understand the physics. So if you ask me for a band gap, I can get it reasonably accurately. If you ask me for, you know, 20 year fatigue resistance of an alloy, I have no idea how to, how to do the forward simulation. So I can also not do the backward learning. And there you could in principle learn from data, right? If you had a hundred thousand structured data points, you could learn, but that doesn't exist in the physical science today. So it's really only going to be by this kind of selective path searching, I think, through the physical space that we're going to get anywhere. You know, like the example of the baby that learns, right, I, 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 I fire this neuron and my knee just moved. Uh, and so this is why there's a lot of excitement around robotic labs, but robotic labs that are driven by AI because they, the math shows that we can probably speed up physical experiments in inorganic in, in inorganic materials by probably about two orders of magnitude. Uh, in organic chemistry, it's probably even higher, and so that is that is a significant advance in in, in the physical science in terms of the learning you can do. Right. So today it's uh, it, it's about eighteen years from materials development to commercialization, and that is largely iteration time. It's really number of iterations times iteration time and iter. And no, sl reducing number of iterations is being smarter and reducing iteration time is using AI and robotic labs, right? So that's where this field is heading, in my opinion. Thank you, Dr. Cedar. Uh, so now we gonna, uh, we're going to forward to the getting questions from our audience. So uh, if you have any question, please raise your hand. The next question is from Connie Kim. I have a question to Professor Olukaton and other panelists as well. Kind, it's a kind of general question, <laughs> but if we say a large scale computing system consists of um, processor and memory and network, and then which one between memory and network would be a critical bottleneck in the future? Well, I mean, I think in terms of uh, cost, the network is, is clearly the, the highest 
you know, you're typically going to be the most expensive component. Uh, I, you know, but the question is sort of how big a network do you need and how much compute do you need? How What's the ratio of compute to memory to, to network uh, bandwidth is going to be, uh, you know, application or model dependent, right? And, and so, uh, you know, what one can imagine uh, you know, uh, you know scenarios where you're you you're, you're you're training your model and you've got you know lots of data parallelism and you are communicating uh, gradients uh, in a very sparse way. Uh, you you know all you really need is a lot of compute uh, and 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 uh, you know maybe the memory to service that compute and the network requirements would not be that high. But then you can imagine a different scenario where you know the model. Needs that needs to be trained requires a lot of model parallelism and has a lot of communication, and so it's a hard question to answer because it's so model dependent. And even within the model, it, you know, the the, the 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 particular data that you're using to train the model is also going to change. Uh, so you know, what one what will build the systems that are balanced, right? And uh, and then uh, you know, try and and develop algorithms that uh, uh, you know live within the confines of, of the architecture that you have. Mm. So is there a no clear trend between um, clear trend between my memory and network? I mean, if I change the question of which burden will grow faster between memory and network, then the answer would be same. If, if, can you repeat that? If you, you change the burden? Uh, burden burden of the network which of which burden will grow faster i mean between oh, memory which and will network. be more more constraining yep yeah it's ultimately well it's ultimately going to be the network but you know you could come up with a clever algorithm that makes the network a lot less of a constraint right so it, it all depends so, so a lot of it depends on how clever you can be in using using the different components uh, and so, you know, you want to build a, a flat, high bandwidth network, and, and that's certainly what we're doing uh, at San Bonova Systems. Uh, but ultimately, your scalability is going to be dependent on uh, using that network efficiently by developing algorithms that minimize communication. Hey, thanks for your answer. Thank you. The next question is from Jinwon An. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, my question is a general one for all panelists. Um, so the size of model parameters is becoming ever bigger, uh, especially in the natural language processing domain. Uh, the GPT, GP3, uh, GPT-3 model has 175 billion parameters, while the GPT-4 model is expected to have 100 trillion parameters. This implies that the computational budget for training these models could be too expensive for many students in academia. Uh, due to this gap, do you think that the research area in deep learning could be divided into two parts? Um, first, uh, what the industry with big funds and uh, computational power can research, and what the students or organizations in the academia can research. Thank you. I think it's a really interesting question. I, I think there are two things we have to do as an industry. We have to drive down the costs and make available the largest language models to students, number one, right? I mean, that, that, that's extremely important. We, and Dr. Bengio said earlier that if it takes three, three or four months, it's hard to do science on to run one experiment in that amount of time. So we've got to find ways, and that's something we do at Cerebra Systems, to drive down the amount of time it takes to run those big models to a week or two. At that point, it's easier to do science on them. We then have to make them available to uh, young scholars. I think at the same time, we've had trouble with that as an industry. Chip design is a great example. The cost of chips got too high. And so it was very hard as a graduate student to study and tape out a chip. And so a lot of people began to work on FPGA is not because they were better solutions, but because you could do work on them in the amount of time there was in your doctorate. And I, I think that's a model to be avoided at all costs. It, it has set us back as electrical engineers. It set us back the fact that, that we, we, we kept 
young scientists, undergraduates, graduates, from being able to, to do many of the things that we would love them to do and they can do in industry. And so I think all three of those, we've got to drive down the amount of time it takes to run these big models, right? We have to make them more available. Um, th those are, are key elements for us to be successful uh, in this domain. Or you guys just study something else, right? Um, that, that, because th there are practical realities about how long it takes to get a doctor, how long it takes to, to, to write your paper. And we, we have to avoid that at all costs. So I want to jump in here. Um, uh, with GPT-3, we're already at a point where it's too expensive to do this research uh, at universities. Um, but I think we also are at a point where it's often too expensive to do it in industry either. That's true. Um, yeah. So, um, I think, you know, when you're thinking about at a university, what you can do on the language side of things without, I, I think, I think you do need to think about um, how you can do things uh, with, without making use of these very large language models or um, use them pre-trained and then think about how you can add to that. And I think tonight's um, conversation opened up many possibilities to think about. Um, you know, one is the issue of small data. How do, how do you do things when we have very small amounts of data? And I think that's a, a place where a lot of people are beginning to look. Um, one of the things that came out tonight, which I think is something that people in the NLP field are not looking at at all, although they should, <laughs> is um, interaction. Uh, the, the fact that, you know, most NLP algorithms are trained by these very large corpora, which are static and, and don't change. And yet people learn through interaction and through multimodality. So, I mean, there are three very interesting directions to go in that, you know, would be um, quite different and valuable. Thank you. The next question is from Ji Huan Kim. Hello, I am Ji Huan Kim from SITE. And I want to ask some question to Dr. Toralba as I'm currently working in the field of vision and scene understanding. Uh, as deep learning technology is used in the real world, the boundaries between academia and industry seem to disappear at, in deep learning research. And my question is, do you think that role of academia and industry should be different? This is my first question. And my second question is, I wonder what role do you think is important for developing reliable algorithms in academia and industry? I want to hear your opinion on this. Thank you for the question. I think this relates also to the previous question. Um, I think that, uh, so first, one thing that is happening in industry is that uh, as you mentioned, the, the boundary is getting very blurry between academia and industry. And in particular, I think that there are a lot of industrial labs that are really academic labs. The only difference is that they are not part of a university, they are part of a company, but they do research, uh, open research in the same ways uh, the academic lab will do, they value publications. So they are really academic institutions to some degree. They have other constraints, but uh, many labs actually behave like academic institutions. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, going, going back to you know, the, the, your question about what are the different roles that they should play, I mean, in part, the, the roles are, are um, there are different aspects. You no know, industry has a, a responsibility with respect to, to the workers in the company, the fact that the company needs to to, to perform well economically and so on. In university, uh, the, the performance is measured in terms of uh, contributions to science. You know? So it's a very different, it's a very different objective. And that's going to create a difference also on, on how research, uh, you know, the boundaries that you put into research. Uh, so that's one aspect. Um, 
But then there are also the aspect, uh, the, the question about resources and, and that relates to the previous question, no? the fact that industry might be able to, because they have income and if they have enough money, they might be able to train like a huge model and, and, in, and universities might not have those resources. Um, but universities have other resources. For instance, a university in general is an inter, is a multidisciplinary environment where you have people that focus on many different areas. In industry, you will find mostly people that work on a particular area that is the one that is of interest to the company. Um, it might have some diversity there, but you know, in general, that, 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 that will be a little bit more constrained. In the university, you can talk with people that study physics, chemistry, biology, engineering. You can, you'll have like a, a very wide set of uh, expertise around that, around you. And then I think that what Joshua was saying before is very important. You know, there are a lot of foundational questions about AI that don't require the resources that a company has. But still, what they require is to have the diversity of thought that university provides. So I think that, you know, they provide different benefits, one or the other. So I think that was the answer to your first question. Um, then you had another question about reliability. I don't, I, I didn't, I don't remember very well the question. Uh, my question was, what role do you think is important for developing reliable algorithms in academia and industry? Yeah, and, and here, I guess that this goes already back also to, to one of the questions uh, during the panel. Um, reliability or trustworthiness, you know, I, they have different answers in industry and in research. And, and I think that for us, one important aspect, you know, is to be open about what you do, uh, open about uh, the, the, the algorithms and the sources of data that you are using so that people can reproduce your results. And, and I think industry, when they, when they do research and they behave like academic labs, they should have the same, you know, the same type of behavior. No, they should open, be open and, and allow reproducible research and so on. Thank you. The last question is from Sasha Adiga. Yeah, uh, thank you. My name is Sashi Adiga. I'm from uh, SAIT, India. So this is a general question to the uh, whole panel. Uh, so what is your take on the need for new type of um, hardware for advancing AI? So for example, uh, either, uh, you know, more biomimetic that, you know, uh, mimics the brain itself or quantum computing. And if, if, you know, for such a potential change, a significant shift in the hardware, do you think the algorithms of today are uh, ready? Uh, so uh, I'd like to hear your comments. I, I think that we are, uh, several of us on this panel build hardware for a living. <laughs> and we are definitely in favor of, of building hardware for large, exciting workloads. I, I think, um, and... I think the opportunity in front of us for AI is very, very large. I think you, you pointed out additional or, or additional technologies, I think, that are much further in the future for solving general problems, wh whether that's quantum or, or other. I think they're really interesting problems to work on. We should be investing societal resources in research towards quantum. I'm not sure AI will be the first application of quantum. Uh, and historically, to, to date, it hasn't been in the, the very, very early work. But I, I, I think uh, each time a new workload emerged, we got a huge amount of interest in new computational methods to, to solve that problem. You know, in the 90s, we moved from software-based uh, routing to hardware-based switching and routing. We moved to a different type of processor. When we got phones, we're moving to different types of, of computational substrates in AI. I, I think as you look forward a decade or two decades, uh, there are going to be other types of compute that are out there trying to compete for this part of the, the, the workload pie. And I, I think as AI becomes a bigger and bigger part of the total computational landscape, we're going to have to withstand the competition from all sorts of different other approaches. And that, that's what's so fun about this space is that it will be rigorously competitive. And whether it's our approach or other people's approaches, whether it's a, 
uh, an analog approach, whether it's a digital approach, whether it's a quantum approach. I mean, th that's the exciting part of, of participating in a, in a large and growing market. So if I may add also, I think that when we talk about uh, hardware for AI, we also immediately shift our attention into computing. But there is another very important piece of hardware, which is sensing. And, and there are sensors that are extremely underdeveloped, in particular tactile sensing, which is, is just probably the most important sensing that humans we have. And there is very bad hardware out there to, to do sensing with tactile information. And I think that's part of uh, something that will make a difference in the future if we want to have systems that really ground their learning experience on interacting with the world, we really need to start developing better tactile sensing. And there is some research out there, but not very much, and clearly not, not at the level of uh, how efficient we can capture images with cameras. Uh, this is an area that is just st started, basically. I mean, there's been work for a while, but the sensors are really, really uh, poor. That's a hugely interesting point and just an entirely new vector of data, right, to, to add to our analysis. And that's really super interesting. Before conclusion, Dr. Benjo, could I ask you to give some advices to young researchers and students in the field of AI? In light of the discussions uh, we had today, um, I would say don't be afraid to go in directions that, uh, that are very different uh, from what has been established as the uh, state of the art and not be afraid of exploring in, in areas where maybe you don't, you know, you don't have the compute power, but you have the brain power. Uh, and the brain power is the thing that's really behind innovation and the amazing progress that science brings us. So um, don't 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 be afraid to try things. Don't be afraid to uh, question what has been apparently established for years or decades. And and that's how we're all going to make progress. So. Thank you. Uh, so for a very long time, uh, there, thank you for your all lively discussions and insightful ideas. Face to face next year. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So once again, thank you to Dr. Che and our panelists for making this forum very fruitful. With that, this brings us to the end of this year's Samsung AI Forum. Once again, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us today despite your busy schedules. We hope that the contents of this forum was very meaningful to all of you. And we prepared a small event for all of you, so if you visit the website of the Samsung AI Forum 2021, you can participate in a post-event survey. We will select 100 participants and provide them Amazon gift card, so we look forward to your participation. Your valued opinions will be reflected in the next year's forum, so we'd appreciate it if you could answer sincerely. Tomorrow is the second day of the 2021 Samsung AI Forum. We have prepared diverse programs about AI on day two as well, so we hope all of you can participate in tomorrow as well. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much once again and goodbye. Hi, I'm Philip Isola. I'm an assistant professor at MIT, and I'm really happy to be able to share my work with you today. I'm going to talk about what I like to call data plus plus. So this is really more of an ambition than something that fully exists, but the goal is to make new types of data for AI systems. So what I work on is computer vision and machine learning. And machine learning is essentially all about data. It's data-driven intelligence. And over the last decade or so, we've seen so many dramatic examples of how big data 
can drive rapid progress. So that raises the question, can we continue to improve the data? Rather than making some fancy new algorithm, what if we just make fancy new da data? And I'm really interested here, not just in making bigger data or adding more annotations, but making kind of fundamentally new types of data. So let's look at the types of data that we have right now in my own field of computer vision. I think that these trends also exist in other fields of AI as well, but I'm gonna focus on vision. So the main source of data that we have is real data sets of photographs, real data. This has driven a ton of progress, but people have start, started to notice that there are various problems associated with data sets. And one of the problems is data set bias. There's a great paper from a few years ago from Antonio Toralba and Alyosha Efros called An Unbiased Look at Data Set Bias. In this paper, essentially, they found that if you show a computer vision researcher just a few photos from one of the popular data sets, they can tell you what data set it came from. Basically, what that means is that, is that the data that we're using, the data sets, are not some representative sample of all the photos that anyone might ever care to uh, analyze. These data sets are narrow, they're specific, they have their own particular look and their own biases. And that can be somewhat innocuous if we're looking at cats and dogs, but as was pointed out in the Gender Shades project down here, this becomes an issue um, when the data is going to be used for applications that have social implications. So if we train our models on one demographic of people, it might not transfer so well to other demographics of people, and that could, be an, that could end up having negative consequences. Okay, data sets have bias, uh, but there's more problems beyond that too. Another one is that data sets are often private. Medical data sets often uh, are private for ethical reasons, uh, for good reasons. So I'd love if I could show you some scans of COVID patients and we could analyze that kind of data, uh, but it's not easy to do so unless you make certain arrangements and go through all of the regulatory bodies. Data sets can also be copyright. The ImageNet data set is one of the big data sets in computer vision, but a lot of the images are copyright and cannot necessarily be used for commercial applications. And data sets can be very valuable, so companies might make them private just because that's where the value lies. So the clip data set from OpenAI as a private data set is 400 million images, but it's not available to us publicly. And even if it were, I don't think that my group would have enough GPUs to be able to analyze all of that data. So real data can just be very encumbered by all kinds of issues like these, which has led people to think about an alternate way of getting data, which is synthetic data. This is a really exciting area, and there's a long history of using synthetic data in computer vision, but the synthetic data, data that we've used in the past has almost entirely been video game data, CGI data from movies, physics simulators, graphics engines. And this is really only a semi-synthetic because the rendering is synthetic, but the assets, the content, is usually modeled by a human or scanned from the real world. Okay, so I wanna make data that is more completely synthetic, and one source of that kind of data is generative models. So generative models are models that are fit to data, but then the process of sampling new data points is entirely automatic uh, in, as encoded by a deep neural network. And these, these systems can make these beautiful photos on the right. This person does not exist, and yet she looks perfectly photorealistic. So this is a really cool category of data that's just come online in the last 10 years or so. It's only become uh, you know, impressive in the last decade. Okay, so you can make random photos with these generative models. You can make random cats. These cats do not exist. And that's really cool, but we already have billions of photos of cats, right? So that's not exactly what is special about generative data. Generative data is different than images. Images are snapshots of some underlying continuous world. When the samples from a generative model actually model that continuous world. So this is what generative data looks like. It's not just making a fake photo of a cat, it's making this new type of data that is alive. And I'll show exactly how this can be done. 
Okay, so the type of generative models that produce this kind of data are generative models that have latent variables z. These latent variables are random noise vectors that get mapped through um, a neural network layer by layer until the output looks like an image. So the generator G maps random noise Z into images X such that the image looks like a natural image and it lies somewhere on this manifold of natural image uh, images on the right. A different random noise vector, it's a different set of latent variables, will generate a different random image. Okay, so generative data is a, a term that I'm going to give to data sampled from generative models, and it's not like normal data. Normal data X is a photo of a volcano. Generative data is a photo of a volcano along with the generative process that produced that photo and the latent variables Z underlying that physical continuum. If I manipulate those latent variables, I can manipulate the output photo, and I can manipulate them in different directions to capture an entire kind of snippet of the manifold of natural images around that volcano. Okay, so I like to think of this generative data as just like data, it looks like data, but it has more structure. Uh, it's data plus plus. And you can imagine defining different types of structured objects, making this data into this first class object, where you have not just the data point x, but also the, the latent variables z that generated that data, uh, the mapping from z to x, which we call the generator g, and the inverse mapping from x to z, which we call the inverse generative model or the encoder g inverse. And with the, these kinds of structured objects, I can now do things that I couldn't do as easily with just regular data. Uh, you can interpolate these objects in ways that become meaningful. Uh, you can manipulate them to create interesting graphical effects. You can compose them. Uh, you can optimize over them. And essentially, this can lead to really interesting applications for computer graphics, uh, but also for computer vision, where manipulating this data opens up new analytical techniques. So a lot of people have been working on this. I'm giving some of the citations of work that I and my group have done over the last few years on this topic, but there's really uh, you know, hundreds of researchers that are working with generative data and showing the cool things that you can do with it. Okay, so let me explain uh, exactly how we're going to use these structured objects to do something that looks qualitatively different than what you could do with regular data. So I'll take the example of interpolation. So let's imagine first that I'm going to be interpolating between two images in pixel space. Pixels are the raw data, so in the raw data space. Here's what it looks like. We start with a bird. We want to end up with a fly. If we interpolate between these two images in pixel space, we get these kind of alpha blended intermediate images. And these intermediate images just fall off the, the manifold. They don't look like natural photos. If we define interpolation on generative data, on these data plus plus structured objects, we can define it in the latent space of the generative model. The latent variable z that maps to some image x can be interpolated linearly with another latent variable that maps to another image. And the result looks like that. Essentially what happened is that every single point in latent space was trained to map to and generate a natural looking image. So that means that a line in latent space has to stick to the manifold of natural images. And you get these intervening images that look natural, even though they're a bird fly and they don't really exist. So we uh, have been studying that property for a few years, along with many other authors. And in one project uh, called the On the Steerability of Generative Adversarial Networks, we looked at these models, GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks. These are one of these generative models. And we asked, in the latent space of the GAN, can we perform manipulations that correspond to interesting um, image editing operations? And this work was led by Ali Jahanian and Lucy Chai. Okay, so this idea is reminiscent of the idea of word embeddings, where people have found that neural embeddings of words end up having these emergent properties where there exists a direction in the neural embedding space that corresponds to semantic and syntactic operations. 
For example, there exists a direction that corresponds to making a word become past tense. So it turns out then in, that in the neural representation, the latent representation given by a deep generative model of images, you also get directions that are physically and semantically meaningful. For example, you get a direction that corresponds to zooming in the camera. There's a zoomed in vector in the latent space of cans. Okay, here's what it looks like. If you zoom in on this photo of the cat, you get, it, it zooms in. Um, it's a little shaky, but it's okay. Uh, you can also find a direction in latent space that corresponds to shifting the cat back and forth. There's another direction that corresponds to making this image become brighter or darker. And notice that this is different than a darkening operation on pixels. If I just took Photoshop and I made the pixels darker, the volcano would not explode. So essentially, these operators snap to the, sem sem the semantics of the category you apply them to. Because the model was trained on photos of volcanoes and the photos of volcanoes at night were exploding, uh, darkening the image ends up forcing the volcano to explode. This is a really interesting property. It can also be an undesirable property. It could be a bias. We might not want that to happen. Uh, but nonetheless, this is just structurally different than what happens in Photoshop. Okay, so those are some interesting graphical uh, tricks that you can do with this type of data. But I want to talk about vision applications now. And the really important property, as far as I'm concerned, is that these generative data points, these data plus plus points, support counterfactual reasoning. That means they support asking, what would this image have looked like if something were different, if the lighting conditions were changed, if the camera angle were changed? What would this robin have looked like if I moved the camera in or out? Okay, there's a lot of work using generative models for counterfactual reasoning. Some of it is cited at the bottom. Uh, and I think it's an exciting and growing area of research. I'm going to talk about two of our projects in this direction. So one was published at CVPR this year uh, called Ensembling with Deep Generative Views. This is work that was led again by Lucy Chai, along with collaborators at Adobe, Junyan, Ellie, and Richard. So we took a classifier and we wanted to ask, can we um, improve the performance of the classifier by using this property of generative data that you can manipulate it. Okay, let's suppose that this cat is a sample from a GAN, a sample from a generative model. We can hallucinate what that sample would look like under different camera positions using the same kinds of techniques that I showed so far in this talk. Okay, here are four different, three different hallucinations. We can then pass that those images through the classifier and we get a set of predictions. We can ensemble those predictions, average them all together, and make an aggregate prediction that is hopefully better than the original prediction from just the single input image. Okay, we imagine these counterfactual hallucinations, these alternative ways the image could have looked like, and that can then um, let the classifier have kind of more chances to see an image that makes sense to it. Okay, so of course, you don't want to do this on just a random sample from a generative model. You want to do this on your own cat. So how do you do that? You take your photo of a cat. This photo lives in data space, and you project it into the latent space of your generative model. Okay, you project it into the latent space by training a neural network encoder E, or it's the inverse of G, G inverse function. You train it to map this cat into the latent space of the generative model, such that if I generate a photo from the inferred latent variable, it will match the appearance of my query cat. Okay, we can then search locally in latent space to improve, um, uh, to find a vector z, or a latent variable z, that it actually, when I pass it through the generator, uh, makes an image which is closer to, to my query cat. Uh, so this optimization problem at the bottom is showing that uh, here we call the latent variables w, it's a slightly different latent space, but essentially we want g of w to equal x. My query x should be equal to g of my inferred latent variable w. 
Okay, we can do that with cats. We can do it with faces too. Uh, let's take this face and on some classification problem, we get an accuracy of 93%. Now, if we encode that face into the latent space of my generative model, perturb the latent variables, we can change the lighting conditions and get these counterfactual views of what she might have looked like under different lighting conditions. We can then ensemble those predictions together and we get performance which is actually a little bit worse. So something went wrong here, right? Well, it turns out that the generative model is not perfect. There's kind of a subtle differences in how natural images look and how these reconstructed GAN generated images look. And because of those subtle differences, the classifier won't perform as well on the GAN generated counterfactual visualizations. Okay, to help make the system work better, it turns out it's sufficient to simply ensemble your predictions from the original image and your predictions from the GAN generated counterfactual images, and then you do get a boost in performance over if you had just used the original image. So this is a system that uses these counterfactual visualizations in order to improve recognition performance. Now I'm going to talk about another system that uses those counterfactual visualizations not to improve performance, but to try to improve interpretability. And this is a project that we called Explaining in Style, Training Again to Explain a Classifier. This is a big collaboration with a bunch of co-authors at Google, uh, and this was presented just last week at ICCV. Okay, we take our classifier, it's a cat versus dog classifier. We try to predict why, we try to explain why was this image classified as a cat. Okay, so first we have our cat photo. It's a photo in pixel space. We want to convert it to a photo, uh, a generative data point instead of a data point, a data plus plus point instead of a data point. So how do we do that? We encode that cat into our generative model to find a latent variable coupled with a generator that produces that photo, a matching photo of the cat. Now that object is something we can navigate, manipulate, and study. Okay, so the classifier predicts that this is a cat. But if we manipulate the latent variables uh, coupled with this photo of the cat, we can change the appearance of that cat until the classifier will think that it's a dog. We're going to manipulate latent variables that are in a space called style space. It's a particularly nice set of latent variables in the model uh, that produce disentangled visual attributes. So we call our system StyleX, and the goal is to find the top k directions in the latent space in style space that most affect the classification, uh, the prediction that this is a cat. Essentially, we want to come up with a counterfactual explanation. We want to say, how would this image have to change in order for our classification to change? Okay, here is one of the attributes that we discover. There's a latent variable that if I change it, will open up the mouth of the cat. And when the cat mouth opens, the classifier increases its probability of thinking it's not a cat, instead it's actually a dog. Okay, so closed mouth, cat, open mouth, dog. We can flip back and forth and we can visualize that this classifier is sensitive to the mouth shape and under the counterfactual intervention that the mouth were open, then the classifier would begin thinking that this is a dog. You can do that on other attributes. So it turns out that increasing the size of the pupils changes the probability to be more likely to be dog. And if the ear is full, then the classifier again thinks this is more likely to be a dog. So these are three attributes that affect the decision of cat versus dog. And they serve as a counterfactual explanation for why the classifier thought it was a cat rather than a dog. So this is a kind of class specific explanation. We can apply it to another domain. What about the perceived age? Uh, so we have a classifier that tries to predict how old a person is. And here are going to be the top four attributes discovered by this style X system. So one is skin pigmentation, and we alternate back and forth between the original image and then the counterfactual visualization, what would have to change in order for me to predict the person is older. It turns out that this kind of darkening of the skin 
ends up making the classifier think the person is older. So you can imagine how important it would be to be able to understand that that is a variable that the classifier is sensitive to. Maybe it's something that we don't want it to be sensitive to. Okay, another attribute is eyebrow thickness. Another one is the appearance of glasses. So if you add glasses to your face, then this classifier will think you're older. That's a real correlation that exists in the training data. People who are older have a tendency to wear glasses. But we might not find it to be a very robust classifier if simply putting on glasses changes how you perceive my age, how that classifier perceives my age. And the last attribute discovered is the hair color. Okay, I'm especially excited about how this kind of method could be used for medical diagnosis. Suppose I have an automated, automated diagnosis system that will try to classify if a retina is diseased or not, a binary classification problem. Now, a doctor probably wants to know why did you say that this is a diseased retina? And the Stylex system will visualize its decision via the following counterfactuals. It'll say, if that retina did not have these yellow dots, it would not be diseased. Uh, if the retina had these kind of blobby white areas, I would think it is diseased. This is alternating in each of these visualizations back and forth between um, what the image would have to look like in order for it to be considered diseased and what it would have to look like in order for it to be considered not diseased. And there's two more attributes we have here. Okay, just quickly fix this thing. Okay. Okay. Um, so the hope is that a doctor looking at this can understand why the classifier came to the decisions that it came to, perhaps gain more confidence that it's either doing the right thing or potentially it's doing the wrong thing. So, so far I've talked about using generative models to create this kind of generative data that's alive, that can be manipulated, that has structure. Um, now I want to say, tell a story about a slightly different kind of data that's is a little bit crazy, but it turns out works, which is what if we have a model that doesn't produce photos, but produces random noise? And the inspiration here, the reason why we thought this might make sense is because it turns out that in the developing mammalian brain, there are top-down activations of the retina before the animal has ever encountered light, its retina is stimulated with random noise patterns that are thought to train up the connectivity of its visual cortex. So we wondered, can you train up a visual system in AI using similar techniques? So this is a project that we called Learning to See by Looking at Noise. This is with Manel Beradad, Jonas Wolf, Tang Jo Wong, and Antonio Toralba at MIT. And this is work that will appear at NOREPS 2021. Okay, so there is a long history of using computer graphics, procedural computer graphics to make randomized images, uh, but we really wanted to push it to the extreme where we're making kind of noise processes from very simple Python code. One nice prior piece of work in this direction was this work that trained vision systems on fractal images. Um, so I think this, this was just a really nice um, work uh, and that we're trying to push beyond just the fractals that they looked at to more, more kinds of noise processes. So in this work, we basically went through the literature of classical models of natural image statistics. So there's a bunch of old models, like the dead leaves model, that say that natural images, one of the characteristics is that they have occlusion. They look like just layered random objects, and that captures a lot of the important structure of, of images, but it can be written in just a few lines of Python. Okay, another natural image generator is the generative models that we already saw in this talk, the GANs. Okay, so style GAN can make photos of faces via some procedure, but all of the parameters of that neural network have been fit to data. What if you just randomize the parameters of that network? What will it make? Turns out it makes structured noise. Now, it's not fit to any data, never saw any natural data. It's a very simple program that generates this. 
an untrained program. Uh, and if you sample from that program, you get these interesting random noise images. Okay, so this is a new type of uh, structured data generator. Uh, but rather than sampling from some latent variables and making images, uh, you define code that acts as the latent variables that generates the images. Okay. So we wanted to evaluate, is this useful for anything? And what we looked at is um, the standard procedure of pre-training a visual representation on some images and then uh, transferring that pre-trained representation to solve a new task. Okay, so you pre-train some features and then you measure how well they can linearly classify a new task like the ImageNet 100 prediction problem. So on the y-axis is classification accuracy on the ImageNet 100 data set, classifying animals. And on the x-axis is a bunch of different pre-training data sources. If you don't pre-train at all, and you just start with and randomly initialized neural network, you get about 20% performance at ImageNet classification. If you pre-train on natural images, so you do quite well, you get about up to 60% performance. And if you pre-train on different types of noise processes, you get somewhere in between. The best we have is around 45% performance on the style GAN generated images, the randomly generated images from a randomly initialized style GAN. And I totally expect that in the next few years, this could be made better and better. Maybe we can come up with a simple Python script that generates data, that generates this synthetic randomized data that can actually train a vision system as well as if you trained on natural images. Okay, so in this talk, I've um, talked about kind of two new kinds of data. Um, that have become available over the last decade or so. Uh, one is data samples from generative models. And I'd like to think of this as just like normal data, except better. It's normal data, except it has these latent variables that give it structure uh, that make it act more like data plus plus. And then the other type of data I've talked about is procedural noise data. And interestingly enough, it turns out these images can train good visual representations, but maybe this gets around some of the concerns that we have about privacy, copyright, and dataset bias that encumbers real data sets. So I'll end there, and I would like to thank all of my co-authors on these projects at MIT, Adobe, CMU, and Google. And thank you for listening. Hi, my name is Judy Hoffman. I'm an assistant professor in the College of Computing at Georgia Tech. And today I'm going to be talking about building trustworthy computer vision systems. Today's talk is going to focus on visual recognition, where the goal is to be able to understand the semantics of a scene. So for an application like self-driving cars, we want to know where are the pedestrians on the road, where are the other cars, and where is the road itself? These kinds of applications have high impact on people's lives, as we want to make sure that they're as trustworthy as possible. And to do this, this talk is going to focus on two key aspects of trustworthiness. The first is robustness, which means that we want to be able to maintain performance of our system, even in response to diverse visual circumstances. But the world will change over time, and so we also need to be able to be adaptive as we encounter novel visual circumstances. Let's get started with robustness. To understand why a visual system might need to be robust, and this might result in some change over the standard visual recognition protocol, let's first talk about the standard pipeline that people use for training vision systems. What we do is we start by collecting some data, usually a lot of data. We then manually annotate it, so for example, we might ask people to label that there are dogs in these images. We then train an end-to-end -end deep model in order to be able to predict these annotations that people have provided. And this protocol is so standard and so used across the community that there have been lots of benchmarks that have been created, lots of data sets that have been curated for solving these visual recognition tasks 
In classification, we have ImageNet and Places. And for detection and segmentation, we have data sets like COCO, Cityscapes, and Elvis, and many others. And overall, what happens is, after we've trained this pipeline, we then want to validate our model. And this talk is going to focus a lot on how we validate these models and ways in which we might be able to change our validation procedure in order to encode more robustness and reliability. So existing systems are evaluated and trained in the same benchmark data sets. Here's one data set example, the ImageNet data set, which was widely used throughout the computer vision community. It has millions of images and it encodes a challenge to be able to recognize a thousand different object categories. This seems like a big, complicated task. And so naturally, as we measured performance on this task over time and saw that we increased, culminating in ultimately the retirement of this as a challenge task, we gained some sort of trust or some sort of thought that there was reliability to systems, especially this system up here that had near perfect performance on this task. The problem, of course, is that when we take a system that was trained on a static data set like ImageNet and try to evaluate whether or not it works on related but still distinct visual recognition tasks, like recognizing a dog in this video from YouTube, what we find is that that big ResNet system can't recognize the dog. So why would this happen? To understand that, we need to talk about data set bias. In data set bias, it simply means that when we have a static collection of images, they're going to be highly susceptible to the particular curation and collection procedures that were used in order to create this data set. So for example, with ImageNet, these images were collected from scraping social media sharing sites. And these sites have a particular bias because people only want to share certain types of images with one another. So if these are images of animate objects like dogs, you might find that you're mostly sharing images of dogs' faces. You might also find that you take a few photos and upload the photo that has the best composition and lighting. So this means that a lot of the dogs appear in the center of the frame. It also means that they have high resolution and are less susceptible to things like blur. Now, when we move to YouTube and we see the types of still frames that appear in these action data sets, we find lower resolution images, motion blur, and a wider variety of poses than we would have seen in that still image database. Now, a natural question to ask is, well, if the visual appearance has changed, if the data set bias has changed with where we want to deploy our system, why don't we just collect new annotations? Why don't we just create an additional data set that satisfies our current needs? Well, this procedure turns out to be quite costly, and there have been a number of different companies and startups that have arisen in order to solve this labeling task. For one such recognition task that I mentioned before of understanding all of the pixels in a road scene for a self-driving application, collecting annotations such as the one shown on the right costs between $10 to $12 for a single frame. And when we start to think about all the potential variation that you need to be able to capture to solve this task, such as weather changes, moving between different cities, or changing the sensors on a car, you realize that there's a vast amount of data and it's perhaps infeasible to collect all of the annotations that you might need to solve this task. Let's look at one example of how this might fail. If we trained our visual recognition system primarily on sunny scenes like this one shown here, and then asked how well we could recognize simple object tasks like the road in front of us once there's snow on the ground, we found that our systems failed miserably. So they confused the road and the sidewalk here, these surfaces that are covered with snow, with the buildings they knew how to recognize before. And then the last example I want to mention is that even our systems can be susceptible to small visual corruptions. So changes like that motion blur example I mentioned before, but also changes like compression artifacts or noise that could be introduced into the scene. In one such study, they found that recognition performance could drop from 94 down to 72 as corruptions were introduced on the CIFAR 10 data set. 
So these problems that exist in visual recognition and learning from static data sets, they exist even when visual recognition is used as a tool towards other downstream tasks. And to understand that, we introduced this new benchmark called RobustNav. And the point of RobustNav is to be able to study how much visual corruptions or other visual perturbations might influence the performance of a downstream embodied agent task. We studied two tasks, point nav and object nav. And in these tasks, what we did was we wanted to ask the question, how much does performance differ as we encode different visual corruptions? A successful agent might take as input RGB or perhaps another sensor like depth and be able to successfully navigate to either desired goal location or to a desired object of interest. What we did was we introduced a suite of seven visual corruptions and four dynamics corruptions. And we used this as a test bed to be able to evaluate how systems that were trained under clean conditions might degrade when they experience corrupt conditions at test time. RobustNav's seven visual corruptions look like this. We have two types of blur, spatter, lower lighting conditions, camera crack, lower field of view, as well as speckle noise. And what we find is that even in a situation where our system is able to navigate successfully under clean conditions, the system is not able to navigate under corrupt conditions. So in this case, we'd like to be able to adapt our systems. We'd like to be able to continue working correctly, even as the systems are degrading in response to new visual conditions. And for that, we use the formalism of domain adaptation. In domain adaptation, we have access to a large labeled source data set. This could be the ImageNet data set that I mentioned previously. It could be a collection of images that are available from a product warehouse, or it could be simulated imagery. In all of these cases, we have access to substantial label data in order to train a strong supervised learning model. The problem though, is that when we'd like to deploy our system, the visual conditions change, and we don't necessarily have the time or resources to collect new labeled data in order to retrain our model. And instead, we'd like to find a way to reuse components of that learning system for these new visual circumstances. So perhaps reusing a model that was trained on static images for use in this video domain, or learning to recognize products from an image warehouse, but then deploying it to recognize those products as they appear in the wild, or training on simulated data in order to recognize road scenes, but then deploying the system in the real world. What we want to do is we want to design learning systems that can adapt information that was trained in a condition where we had access to lots of labeled data and reuse it or transfer it for use in a new visual circumstance where there's not substantial labeled data available. One such approach that I've taken to solve this task is called domain adversarial adaptation. And in domain adversarial adaptation, what we do is we start by training a strong source recognition model. On our source data, we have access to lots of labels, so we can train a strong visual recognition system. The problem arises when we want to deploy the system in a new visual circumstance that we call the target domain. And more specifically, there's an issue that arises if the distribution of the latent features between the source distribution and the target distribution differ, then the classifier that we trained on the source data is less likely to perform well on the target data. We'd like to fix this problem. And to do that, we're going to optimize for aligning these two distributions or minimizing the discrepancy between them. And one such approach to doing this is by first training a domain classifier to distinguish between source latent features and target latent features, 
Intuitively, if we can distinguish between these two sources of data, it means that their distributions are far apart. And we'd like to optimize against this criteria, and so we introduce an adversarial loss that optimizes to confuse the domain classifier, or in other words, to render the two domains indistinguishable. Once we do that, we can evaluate the performance of such a system on tasks like transferring from learning in simulated driving imagery and then recognition in real-world driving imagery, like from this Grand Theft Auto dataset to the German Cityscapes driving dataset. And first, we apply domain adversarial learning at the pixel level, meaning that we want to make our simulated images look more realistic. And once we do that, we get this image as output. There are some subtle changes, but a lot of the main changes occur on things like the road or the center line between the lanes. But these have a dramatic impact on the performance of our system. And we can apply them across a variety of images from both data sets in order to produce an adaptive model that we can further align in the lane representation space. Our overall system then recognizes on real world images despite never seeing human annotations for the real world. In the upper right hand corner, we have the desired ground truth output of this system. When we only train in simulation and try to deploy directly in the real world, we get the output shown in the bottom left. And after we adapt both at the pixel level and at the latent feature level, we get the output in the bottom right. So both the road sees dramatic improvement after adaptation, as well as we start to find this new pedestrian and the street sign in the background. And these alignment techniques using either domain adversarial learning or a whole suite of other benchmarks that, that really focus on statistical alignment between the source and target data sets, these have proven to be quite effective at solving this task. The problem, though, is that they really rely on marginal statistical alignment. So they model the entire source distribution and entire target distribution. And this is based off an implicit assumption that you have a balance across the categories that you'd like to recognize. And when that assumption breaks, when we instead have imbalanced data, such as these different distributions shown on the right, well, now when we try to align between two marginal statistical models, we have a problem where we're mostly aligning the heads of the distribution or the common classes. Now, when we have access to labels, we can start to mitigate this problem by resampling our data to um, have an artificially more balanced data set. But in the target domain, this is uncurated data, and we don't necessarily have access to labels in order to do this type of resampling. So what we find is we have a mismatch between the label distributions between our source and target data, and the goal that we'd like to accomplish is to be able to adapt both as the appearance changes between source and target data, as well as this label distribution shift. Common approaches to handling unsupervised or semi-supervised learning under imbalanced data include self-training approaches, things like entropy minimization or optimizing towards pseudo-labels. And these approaches have been successfully used within the adaptation literature specifically for handling this long tail adaptation task. Importantly, they don't require that the source and target have a matching label distribution. But these types of approaches still suffer from um, reinforcing errors that I'll explain next. Let's consider the simple case of having two classes we want to recognize, circles and triangles. In our source data set, we have lots of labels available to us, which means that we can train a classifier to distinguish between the circles and the triangles quite easily. But when we have a domain shift, it means that the data in our new visual appearance circumstance isn't necessarily aligned with the original training domain, the, the red points that are shown here. And so in practice, what this means is that the circles and triangles once we extract their representations as trained on the source data, they don't necessarily fall on the correct side of the hyperplane to recognize them using our off-the-shelf classifier. 
And now when we try to train using a self-training approach, what we're doing is we're going to be reinforcing the errors that already existed in the model. Meaning that if a triangle was already misclassified as a circle, after we adapt using an entropy minimization or more generally a self-training approach, what happens is we're going to reinforce these errors. So we're going to make the classifier more confident on its incorrect predictions. This is a limitation that exists precisely because we are using self-training over all samples indiscriminately. And we wanted to fix this procedure, and so we introduced this work called Sentry. In Sentry, we use a selective entropy optimization criteria that's based off of existing work that looks at measuring differences as you encode images through various augmentations. One such work that used this for detecting adversarial examples from 2019 looked at manipulating images using standard off-the-shelf image augmentation techniques and then measured deviations in predictive outputs. These kind of augmentations are also used extensively in the self-supervised learning literature. But we're going to use them here as a way to identify whether or not instances are reliable. So the key idea is that we're going to use a notion of predictive consistency to determine reliability of instances in our target domain. These are unlabeled instances. Once we've identified those instances, we're going to increase the confident confidence only on those instances and not on all instances. So ideally, we would find that just these highlighted target unlabeled images are reliable under our current model, and then we update the underlying representation to increase the confidence on those instances. Altogether, the way that Sentry works is we start by training a source model using supervised learning. We then imagine passing our target instances drawn from a different data distribution through this learned model. We can do this for a variety of augmentation strategies pass all of them through the model and gain multiple predictive outputs through which we can optimize with a selective entropy loss. The selective entropy loss is going to start by evaluating whether or not the predictions are consistent using simple metrics like majority vote. And if they're consistent, we want to optimize to increase the confidence of the model on that instance. If it's inconsistent, we'd like to maximize the entropy, or in other words, decrease the model's confidence. We have a lot of results in the paper if you're interested in seeing more, and I'm going to present one highlight result here. On this mini domain net data set that has six domains to study and a number of object categories to recognize, what we find first and foremost is that the label distribution across the different domains in this data set are not aligned, meaning that the distribution over the categories that are represented in one domain, like clipart, doesn't match the distribution of categories in another domain, like sketch. So this means that we have, we really do have this label um, misalignment problem in this data set. And so now we can look at some results. Overall, as averaged across all 12 shifts in this data set, a model that does no adaptation would achieve 66 per, um, percent. Distribution matching techniques, which don't take into account the fact that there has been label distribution shift, sometimes can achieve a bit of performance improvement over this baseline, but sometimes not. A model that just encodes label shift and doesn't account for appearance shift really actually degrades performance below the out-of-the-box model. And then there's a number of approaches that try to address it, both appearance and label distribution shift, like FDAN that has a relaxed distribution matching approach, Cole that does self-training on confident pseudo-labels, and InstaPBM that does entropy minimization together with self-supervised learning techniques. Altogether, our approach Sentry outperforms the competing baselines, both on all of these 12 shifts as well as 27 out of the 31 shifts that we studied in our paper. So altogether, my goal is to create trustworthy vision systems. We do this by first 
benchmarking and improving the robustness of our systems, meaning that we'd like to make sure that these systems work in a variety of visual circumstances out of the box as well as possible. When domains change, we then want to further adapt our systems to be able to really incorporate new observations at test time and make minor modifications so as to continue to be reliable even as the visual circumstances change in novel ways. Between these two, both establishing more robust recognition systems and then making them more adaptive, we should be able to produce systems that are more reliable and trustworthy throughout the diversity of the visual world. I want to thank all of my lab members, as well as my collaborators, both at Georgia Tech and other institutions, for all of their hard work, um, both in terms of the projects that I got the chance to present today, as well as many others. And I want to thank the Samsung AI Forum for this opportunity to speak to you about my work. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Jaren Gall. I'm an associate professor in machine learning at the University of Oxford. Today I'm going to talk about interpretable AI and uncertainty in deep learning. This is based on a talk I gave at an ASA workshop on AI in science and scientific and strategic planning. So first of all, what is AI? Well, at least what the media refers to as AI is what we call deep learning. Deep learning is built of conceptually simple models. You give me some data, x1, x2, x3, and y1, y2, y3, let's say images and labels, I'm going to, de I'm going to build a model. Basically, I'm going to build some function that takes some x's, take those images of cats and dogs, and spits out labels. This image is a cat, this image is a dog, and so on. My task in deep learning is to find this sort of function, these sort of w's, for which the model output, the model's prediction, will be as close as possible to the actual labels for these cats and dogs. Deep learning is really useful. It is simple and modular, which got huge amount of attention from practitioners and engineers, which in turn gave us pretty good software tools that scale well with data and with compute. But deep learning also has lots of limitations. Uh, we can't really tell what our models know, what we don't know. It is uninterpretable. It is often perceived as uninterpretable black boxes which are easily fooled, causing uh, concerns in AI safety. This deep learning lacks solid mathematical foundations. It is mostly developed on, based on ad hoc uh, developments, and it crucially relies on big data. Uh, interestingly enough, if we had something called uh, uncertainty at hand, we could try to tackle all of these interesting problems. So what is uncertainty? The language of uncertainty is probability theory. And specifically, I'm going to talk about Bayesian probability theory that has its foundations in the 1750s. When applied to information engineering, we get what is called Bayesian modeling, which is another big pillar in machine learning. Bayesian modeling is built on solid mathematical foundations and traditionally has been seen as fairly orthogonal to deep learning, rather than uh, as fairly orthogonal to deep learning. Over the past few years, we had we've had a lot of work on how to combine these different tools together from Bayesian modeling, from deep learning, in order to answer questions that we couldn't answer before. For example, to try to tackle questions about interpretability, about uh, scaling to uh, uh, being able to work with small data, building solid mathematical foundations. And to give you an idea for what basically the Bayesian perspective means, Let's say that you give me the CO2 levels in Mauna Lua, Hawaii. Over the past 40 years, I take that, center that, normalize it, fit some neural network on top of that, and you ask me, what will be the CO2 level in 20 years' time? A normal neural network will predict that, which makes no sense whatsoever. Same neural network from a Bayesian perspective will predict that each shade of blue over here is half a standard deviation, which basically means that at 20 years time the prediction still doesn't make sense, but the model also tells me I have no idea. It has very wide error bars and it says the CO2 level could, could be anywhere over here. If you were to ask the model what would be the CO2 levels in two years time over here, 
it will say it will be more it will say it will be this value and it will be more confident about that. So we're gonna look at three example test cases of using this sort of Bayesian perspective in deep learning. We're going to look at interpretable AI, we're gonna look at safe AI, we're gonna look at AI with small data. So first of all, let's look at interpretable AI. So this is based on a project that we did with collaborators at NASA, where we looked at exoplanet atmospheric retrieval. So let's say that we want, we have a telescope pointing into space, and we want to say, what is the atmospheric composition of a faraway planet? So from the telescope, we're going to read the spectrum uh, of the exoplanet. So this is, for example, the spectrum of WASP-12b. Uh, at the moment, what people do in order to find the uh, in order to find the uh, uh, atmospheric composition for the exoplanet, they would guess some possible atmospheric parameters. Will fit that into some forward physics model that will generate what we expect the spectrum to look like, and then they would basically try to use a what is called. Uh, a nested uh, Monte Carlo sampling to try to feed it with these parameters until the general spectrum looks like what we observed. Instead of that, what we did in this uh, project uh, was build an inverse model, which basically takes the spectrum, maps that back into a possible hypothesis about the atmospheric parameters that we then could use as a way to uh, to initialize the sampling or in order to get a distribution of a uh, in order to get a distribution of atmospheric parameters or in order to initialize the sampler. So the idea over here is to generate lots of possible atmos atmospheres, feed them through the Ford model, for the physics model, and observe what is the, uh, the spectrum that would have been observed for them. And we take that and we flip the order. We take the spectrum and as the x's, the atmospheric parameters as y's, and we train a neural network that given a spectrum has to predict the atmospheric parameters. Now, if the ob observed spectrum uh, wasn't in the training set, uncertainty in our prediction will be able to indicate this. So we're not gonna make false scientific claims. We know we, we will know whenever we can't trust the model's predictions about uh, what the atmospheric parameters should be for a given observed spectrum from our uh, telescope. So this allows us to speed up scientific discovery while preserving scientific interpretability because what we get out of this model is a distribution of a possible uh, atmospheric parameters, uh, which we can then take through the forward dynamics model and make sure that we indeed uh, be able, we indeed are able to reconstruct the correct, uh, uh, the correct uh, observed spectrum. And if we can't, then at least we can use it as an initialization for the sampler in order to speed up the sampling procedure, which is very expensive. So this was published at the Astronomical Journal in 2019 with Adam Cobb, a work done with NASA Goddard at NASA FDL. Uh, another example of interpretability and safety is safe autonomous driving. Let's say that we have a, a car, a, we have a dash cam in our car, which drives through the streets of Cambridge in this case, and we want to use uh, this uh, dash cam as part of our autonomous driving pipeline. So. Part of the first step in the pipeline is perception, which is trying to figure out what is actually in the environment around us. So for example, we would want for each pixel over here, we would want to label that as this pixel belongs to the road, this pixel belongs to the sidewalk, this pixel belongs to the traffic light, uh, traffic light buildings over here, and so on. Now, this is what we would want our model to say in order for us to be able to build an internal representation of what uh, what is in the environment around us so we can basically drive safely on the road and not run into traffic lights. Uh, and this is what the model sees on a, as an input. This is what goes into the input. This is what you would want the model to output. Sometimes models make mistakes and they would give us this as an output. Now over here, if you look closely, you will see that the model basically thinks that part of the sidewalk over here is part of the road and a car using this representation will take a hard left into the traffic light, which is not going to be that good. Um, if we use the same Bayesian perspective we talked about before, we can actually see that the model has high uncertainty 
over this uh, over this part uh, of the image when it gives us the segmentation map. So it basically says this thing over here could be part of the road, could be part of the sidewalk, but I have no idea. So maybe slow down, collect more data, or maybe alert the driver to take control over the car. So this basically allows us to build safer uh, autonomous systems, so safer autonomous driving in this case, uh, which allows us to, well, hopefully will save lives. A uh, last example is empowering citizen science projects. So by the way, the previous one was uh, work with Alex Kendall, published at NIPS 2017. This thing is work uh, with uh, Lois Smith, uh, Mike Walmsley, Chris Lintot in the Zuniver Citizen Science Project, published at the Royal Astronomical Society. So the idea over here, so over here we worked with the Zuniver uh, project, which is one of the largest citizen science projects in the world, where they take uh, images of galaxies and they ask volunteers to label these images. Is that a smooth galaxy? Is it a featured galaxy? And so on. And based on the volunteers, they, each image gets sent to multiple volunteers. And based on those uh, labels that they get from the multiple volunteers, we decide whether to classify the image. And if so, then they add it to the astronomical catalog. And then these catalogs are used uh, in order to validate or test different hypotheses about, uh, the, uh, about the development of the universe and so on, development of galaxies and so on. Um, the main issue, as you can imagine, is that uh, with bigger telescopes, we have more data. And over the past 100 years, uh, things have evolved very quickly from the point where a single person would make an observation, would find a new galaxy, take a, bunch of, take a nice record of the properties of that galaxy, and submit that to the Royal Astronomical Society saying, I found a new galaxy, which is smooth, and so on. Uh, we get newer telescopes that are able to find hundreds and thousands of galaxies every night, uh, which at which point the Citizen Science Project was born in order to be able to label this. We can't get science scientists to see, like, we don't have enough capacity to get scientists to sit down and label all of them one by one. With the newest wave of telescopes, we have billions of galaxies observed every night, and we can't even get volunteers to sit down and label them anymore, so we need to find a smarter way to do that. So what we do over here is we use machine learning to try to classify the easy cases, ones that we saw before, and we use a human-in-the-loop approach to get uh, the difficult ones, or the interesting ones, or the ones that we didn't see before. We only get these sent to volunteers to label. So how we do that? Uh, how do we? Do? So that's called active learning. And how do we do that? We train a model on the existing set of galaxies that we have so far. Let's say it's the ones on the left over here. We have some information about uh, featured smooth, featured smooth, and so on. We train a machine learning model of this. And on the right hand side, we have billions of galaxies which we haven't labeled yet. We evaluate an acquisition function uh, on the unlabeled uh, galaxy. So we select a thousand out of this, and then we validate the model. We look at the model uncertainty to see which ones of these galaxies we can predict and we are very confident about the prediction and, sh and which, one of this, which one of these galaxies, which ones of those galaxies, if we try to predict the model will tell us, I don't know, like in the first example that we saw with the CO2 level, the CO2 levels in Mauna Lua, Hawaii. And then we're gonna take only the galaxies with the highest uncertainty and we're gonna ask, uh, we're gonna ask the volunteers to label only those points with the highest uncertainty. We're going to add them, we're going to move them from the right hand side to the training set. We're going to update, increase the training set size with the volunteer labels. We're going to update the model on the larger training set size, and then we're going to repeat the process. We're going to go over the unlabeled images again. I'm going to ask the model, find the ones that you're most uncertain or most confused about again. Um, I talked only about a couple of examples of where we use uh, uncertainty in deep learning or what we call basically the field uh, Bayesian deep learning. Uh, there's so much more, there's causal inference going beyond correlations. In uh, recent work, we looked at how do we combine causal inference with these tools of talking about when we don't, when being able to know when we don't know. Uh, there's generative models and AI scale, there's real-time interpretability and so much more. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Jacob Andreas. 
I'm an assistant professor at MIT, and I'm very honored to be participating in the Samsung AI Forum as a recipient of the AI Researcher of the Year Award. I mostly work on natural language processing, but what I wanted to talk about today is using language as a tool for training machine learning models, not just in natural language processing, but actually across application areas of AI. And I want to start with a very big question, which is the question of how people learn. One of the distinguishing features of human cognition is the ease with which we learn new skills and concepts. And we do this in a number of different ways. When we're lying in the crib, before we can even control our environments, we learn just to compress what we've seen and to predict what's going to happen next. Once we gain the ability to interact with our environment, we learn a huge amount from interaction, from exploration and trial and error. Once we understand our social environment, we can learn via paying attention to our teachers, via explicit labeling and demonstration from other people. And finally, once we have it, we can learn from language. And it's the last of these that I really want to focus on today. The number of things that we can learn about the world from language is enormous, both factual knowledge and procedures, and even information that extends our language, our knowledge of language itself. Most of us learned the things that got, them to the, got us to this forum today uh, by listening to lectures or by reading books or by talking to colleagues. It's of course very difficult to get to the point where we can do this and our ability to do so relies on all of these other kinds of learning. But once we learn language, we can use it to learn all these other really complicated skills. And the ability to learn from language is one of the key things that separates us from all of the other learning systems that nature has ever produced. It also separates us from most of the learning systems that humans have ever produced. All of the other categories that we had on this previous slide are sort of major overarching topics in machine learning research that are the subject of their own textbooks, of conferences, etc. Except for this point on the right of the slide. And so what I'm going to be talking about today is a couple of first steps that we can take towards making language a first class approach for training intelligent systems, just like all of these other ones are. Now, first off, why has it taken us longer to get to natural language supervision than all of these other things? And, you know, the main reason is that there's a bunch of other skills that you need in order to start learning from language, of which I want to highlight two. The first of those is, unsurprisingly, the ability to understand language, to know what words mean and how they fit together. If we're going to use language to learn other things about the world, we have to first be able to use language itself. The second thing, is the ability to learn representations, and especially multimodal representations of concepts that integrate, for example, linguistic information and visual information and information about behavior or control. If we're going to use language to supervise other machine learning tasks, we need to be able to figure out how language grounds out in all these other domains that we're trying to model. And it's really just in the last couple of years that these tools have become mature but we now have general purpose machinery for predicting structured linguistic representations from text, things that look like parse trees or logical forms that represent meaning. And we have general purpose machine learning tools for building shared representation spaces in which representations of sentences and images and control policies can live together. And sure enough, we've started to see some initial approaches to language-based supervision building on both of these tools in specific problem domains. Uh, both work, for example, on using semantic parsers to train text classifiers, and work in the computer vision literature on using representations of words and sentences to train image classifiers. And so our project today, in some sense, is just to take this foundation and scale it up, uh, and to turn language into a tool that we can use for tackling all of the other problems that we tackle with the rest of the machine learning toolkit. And one of those problems is the problem of learning models that don't just make one-off decisions, but that actually interact with the world and reason about their future actions. This shows up everywhere from dialogue systems to robotics. So we're gonna start by looking at a technique for using language to learn reusable skills for planning and acting in the world. In addition to decision-making, another core problem in artificial intelligence is the following. Given only noisy observations of what the world looks like, can we actually figure out the rules governing uh, the process that generated those observations, the rules that, that underlie the world? And today we're going to be looking at this problem through the lens of program induction 
and using language to build procedures that can infer programs given only inputs and outputs. Finally, if we really want to reproduce all of the tools that humans use uh, f for learning from language, uh, we need to give our learners the ability to generate language too, to describe their current understanding of problems, and to ask questions, and so on. And so we'll conclude with some very first steps in this direction, uh, specifically about getting models to generate natural language descriptions of the features that they've learned. And let's just dive into this, starting with the problem of learning skills from demonstrations. Now, we briefly showed a picture of a cookbook before, and cooking is a sort of canonical example of a family of skills that we learn, at least in part, from natural language guidance, right, from recipes and cookbooks. And if we're going to do big, complicated things, like cooking in the real world, we need to start with even simpler tasks in household environments. Finding our way around, manipulating objects, interacting with appliances and containers, and so on. Um, and so here's an example from the Alfred environment, which is a recently released simulation environment designed to do exactly that. Alfred tasks involve, you know, picking up objects in kitchens, doing things like cleaning them or heating them, while moving around in, in realistic household environments. But even very simple tasks, like the one we just looked at, have a lot of moving parts. At the very lowest level, they require agents to be able to recognize objects, to plan paths between visible locations, and so on. And at the very highest level, they require agents to reason about the long-term consequences of those low-level actions. Even a task as innocuous as put the knife in the drawer requires finding a knife and grasping it and then finding the drawer and opening it and then setting the knife down and then closing the drawer. And this is a real challenge for modern machine learning tools. If we don't try to explicitly model any of this high-level structure and say we just go out and collect 10,000 demonstrations and train some deep network policy to map directly from high-level goals like getting the knife in the drawer and observations into these low-level actions, uh, this actually doesn't work at all. So what might a more effective procedure for solving this problem look like? Well, it might look something like this. We might start by building one model that decomposes our top-level goal, like getting the knife into the drawer, into a sequence of high-level subtasks. And then we'll build a second model that decomposes each of these subtasks into a sequence of low-level actions. And sure enough, there's a huge literature on agent architectures that work this way, but they all require a lot of work to actually get set up. They require you either to formalize your entire sort of world symbolically and hand engineer some sort of symbolic planning mechanism that can take actions, or to predefine just like a fixed number of actions that an agent can take and collect a bunch of specialized training data that exhibits each of those actions in isolation. So building hierarchical agents that sort of decompose acting into high-level planning and, and low-level action taking, even after decades of research, uh, is still pretty hard. But if we could train models for solving these tasks, the way we train people using language, we could potentially get the best of both of these worlds, getting sort of fine-grained control over the kinds of strategies that learned agents use to complete these tasks without having to pre-commit to special skills or formal domain representations. And one way to go about this might look something like the following. We'll start with a data set of demonstrations, right, of these high-level goals paired with low-level sequences of observations and actions. But rather than trying to predefine a fixed skill set or domain representation, we'll just ask people to annotate these demonstrations with instructions. There are several important things to note about this data collection paradigm. What we're going to get from people is just free-form language, right, with no guarantee, guarantee of consistency in how things are described across or even within individual tasks. Second, we're not going to have any information about the correspondence between these instructions and individual parts of action sequences. We're just going to ask people to describe the steps that they see demonstrated in sort of free-form natural language. So this is a pretty lightweight data collection uh, paradigm. You can get crowd workers to do it. And most importantly, we're going to use this language data only at training time. We're not trying to solve an instruction following problem. At the end of the day, we want to build an agent that gets only you know, a high level goal like this as input and produces the right sequence of low level actions as output. But we're going to use language in the training loop to help us do that better. And finally, even though these individual annotations are easy to collect, uh, getting a lot of them is expensive. 
So the last assumption that we're going to make about this natural language supervision that we're using is that we actually don't have very much of it. For the experiments that we're going to look at now, we're going to assume that we only have annotations for, you know, 10 or maybe even only 5% of the actual demonstrations that we have for our agent. So here finally is our problem formulation. We have an environment, we have some goals, we have some demonstrations, and at training time only, we're going to have a few instructions. And what we want to do is use these instructions to build some sort of automated agent that can get from high-level goals to low-level actions on its own. Now, how are we going to use this data? And here's a picture of the policy that we're going to try to train. Um, and this picture should look familiar, right? We start with a high-level goal, we generate a plan. But now that plan consists of a sequence of natural language instructions. So rather than defining any kind of formal planning language or fixed set of skills, we're going to let this agent use the language that it learns from training data to generate plans for itself and to reason about its own future, future actions. And conditioned on this language valued plan and also observations of the environment will then take low level actions. And so far this is straightforward, but how are we actually going to go about training this agent? After all, our training data looks like this. We don't even have these natural language annotations for most of our demonstrations. And when we do, we don't know how this language lines up with the low-level actions that we've been given. In other words, what we have is some kind of latent variable problem. We have some annotated demonstrations where the correspondence between individual instructions and low-level actions is latent. And we have some unannotated demonstrations, most of the data set, where these plans themselves are late too. So at a high level, our learning algorithm is going to look something like this. We'll make an initial guess about all of these values, and then we'll alternate between finding better alignments, finding better descriptions of each aligned segment of these unannotated demonstrations, and finding better parameters for the actual agent policies that translate our high-level goals into mid-level plans and plans into low-level actions. Now, I'm not going to be able to talk too much about the technical details of how this learning procedure works, um, but the important thing is that it does work. Uh, so, for example, here's an, here's an example of what it does at training time on one of those unannotated demonstrations that we had in the training set. And you can see that just given a sequence of low-level actions, this model is able to segment those low-level actions into sort of reusable skills exhibiting high-level actions like finding a knife uh, or cutting a tomato into slices and labeling each of those segments with an actual natural language description of the high-level skill that's being exhibited. So if somebody else gives this model a demonstration, it can figure out what the latent structure of that demonstration was and sort of express that demonstration as a high-level plan. And because it's able to do this, it's able to generate its own plans at training time as well. So here's what happens when we take an agent that we've trained this way and we actually set it loose in the environment, uh, given a high-level goal of placing a washed pan on the counter. The first thing that it does is generate, in natural language, a high-level description of its plan, and then it goes out and it navigates the environment and actually executes the steps of that plan that it generated in natural language. And so given only this high-level goal as input, we're producing the right low-level actions as output, and we're producing those actions because we're able to use language to give us an intermediate representation of the high-level steps needed to accomplish this goal. And effectively what we've done here is used our natural language supervision to induce a library of reusable skills that this agent can deploy when interacting with the environment. But in contrast to the way that we usually think about hierarchical policy learning, this skill set is open-ended. It's compositional, we can build new skills from new words that we've never seen put together before, it's extensible, and it lets us hook into all of the amazing things that modern language models can do to reason about the relationships between strings and other strings. Um, now, we can do some numerical evaluations of this, and the important thing to notice here is that using just 10%, uh, or labeling just 10% of this data set, we can do substantially better at one of these tasks uh, than an ordinary um, policy learning approach that tries to go directly from high-level goals to low-level goals, or to low-level actions. And in fact, if we actually compare it to existing work on an easier version of this task, where models have access to ground truth information about these plans during testing time, where they're seeing at test time human-generated detailed plans, we can actually match several state-of-the-art approaches there. 
Uh, we mentioned before that, you know, sort of having access to uh, language-based skills gave us a compositional library or sort of some amount of open-endedness. Uh, and one fun thing that we can ask this model to do is to generalize to new objects or tasks that aren't part of this Alfred environment at all. Um, and in many cases, the plans that it generates, even for verbs like scrub that it's never seen before at training time, actually look quite sensible. So to summarize this section, we described how to train a hierarchical policy, a hierarchical agent that region, reasons over sequences of high-level skills parameterized by natural language strings. And we showed that agents built in this way could be trained very, very efficiently by treating these natural language skill descriptions as latent and inferring the sort of latent language descriptions of demonstrations jointly with the parameters of an agent model itself. Uh, and it works. The resulting models are competitive with things that have access to much stronger supervision and generalize in non-trivial ways to new goals and new actions. The next question that we're going to ask here is whether we can take this machinery that we've developed and apply it to other problems, especially problems where we really care about the value of these latent variables themselves rather than the final predictions from these models. A canonical example of this is program synthesis. Rather than going from goals to actions, we start with some kind of specification, like an image that we want to figure out how to draw or a set of test cases for some string processing routines. And we want to turn these specifications into programs. And these kinds of program induction problems come up all the time. They come up in text editing. They come up in inverse graphics applications, like this sort of drawing thing that we have on the left, and many, many other problem domains. And as before, Inferring programs from input-output pairs or programs from just outputs is all about abstraction and composition. Just like, program, or just like plans are compositional, programs are compositional. If I have a family of related tasks, I expect that there are going to be pieces of programs that solve all of those tasks. They get used over and over again. And if I can identify and name those pieces, the space of programs that I have to search over to produce one that gets the right answer is very small. And the state of the field of program synthesis is actually very similar uh, to hierarchical policy learning. There are things that work well if you carefully design a domain-specific programming language, and things that work sort of OK in a fully unsupervised way, starting from a very low-level programming language. But there aren't good procedures for automating the discovery of reusable functions, like the functions that we've labeled F1 and F2 on this slide, that align with the abstractions that humans actually use when humans write computer programs. But as before, the human-like abstractions, the sort of functions that humans tend to generate when they write programs, are exactly those things that tend to get names in natural language, right? If we think about how a programmer might write programs to generate each of these shapes that we're looking at on the slide, they might start by defining a kind of pinwheel function uh, and then an end ground drawing function. Uh, and both of these are things uh, that we know are useful because they already have names in natural language. So language can again provide lightweight, distant supervision about the compositional structure of the world uh, that's exactly, exactly the compositional structure that we want to infer for programs. Um, and in fact, we can tackle this program induction problem using a model that looks very similar to the one that we used for the previous task. We imagine that our natural language annotations are going to give rise to reusable program fragments via unobserved alignments between language and pieces of programs, and that will then execute these composed programs to produce the outputs that we observe. One very important difference between this program induction problem and the previous problem is that we're going to observe only the outputs. These programs are actually the things that we're trying to infer, and even at training time, we're going to assume that we don't have any gray, that we don't have access to any ground truth programs. This is sort of the defining feature of program synthesis and other latent variable problems. And it means that we have one more variable to deal with here, namely the programs themselves, when we actually try to go about training this model. Nevertheless, the high-level structure of our learning algorithm is going to be basically the same. We're going to make some initial guesses about what these programs are, about the correspondences between programs and language, uh, and the you know, sort of probabilistic process by which natural language strings turn into programs. And then we'll just alternate between improving each of these things in turn. We'll fix our programs and try to find better correspondence between language and programs. We'll fix our language and alignments and try to find better programs that solve these tasks, and so on and so forth. And again, what we'll get out is a sort of implicit library that links fragments of the programs that we're inferring 
to individual words in natural language. So effectively what we're building up is a sort of library of program fragments tagged with natural language descriptions that sort of look like comments describing what those program fragments do. Uh, we've evaluated this approach on a bunch of different data sets. I'm just going to show you examples for one, uh, which are these computer graphics problems that we've been using as running examples uh, so far. Uh, and so we have a bunch of natural language annotations generated by real humans for this data set that range you know, from very simple things like just a big circle to really complicated things like seven-sided snowflake with triangles and lines. And here are some of the examples of the kinds of programs that we can infer uh, that draw these different shapes. Um, and notice that we can actually infer some pretty complicated programs, uh, and they bottom out in terms of clean functional abstractions that we can attach names to, uh, like semicircle, which is this function that has been labeled F5 on the slide, and snowflake, like the one on the right. So practically speaking, uh, this approach, using natural language annotations, is able to solve a huge number of these graphics programs, substantially more uh, than a sort of state-of-the-art approach to program synthesis that doesn't use language at all, uh, and it's able to solve these much faster, with much less search time. And the most important thing, as we said before, is that what we get out of this is not just a model that sort of maps from images to programs that generate those images, but actually a library of reusable functions that we can label with natural language descriptions that do things that we as humans actually have name for names for, right? A function that draws circles, a, functions that, a function that places objects next to each other, a function that draws a bunch of copies of the same shape in a line, and more complicated things like these snowflakes and staircases. So what we've done in this section is we've shown that we can take this approach that we used for policy learning and extend it to do program learning as well. Uh, in particular, that we can sort of hook it up to existing program synthesis engines and use it to do language-guided induction of programs uh, that produce particular input-output pairs or just particular target outputs. And even with very, very tiny amounts of training data, you know, hundreds of examples labeled with natural language descriptions, we can solve a substantial fraction of really challenging program induction problems. And I want to close this talk uh, with a pretty different problem, which is the problem of generating natural language descriptions of things that models have already learned. Because if we're going to use language as a teaching talk tool, we should also be able to use language to probe how well our teaching is actually working. You know, giving ourselves the ability to ask questions like, what has this entire neural network actually learned about the task that I'm time trying to train it to do? Now, that's a really hard question, so let's start with something a little bit simpler um, and ask about individual features, right? Individual neurons inside deep neural networks and see if we can build some procedure that allows a human user, or a human teacher, uh, to answer questions like, what is the function of this individual neuron uh, that my deep network, my trained deep network contains? So how might we go about answering this question? Um, and to start off with here, uh, let's ask, how might we understand, as people, what an individual neuron does? What does a neuron do? It responds to inputs or in computer vision applications where we have convolutional networks to particular regions of those inputs. And so one way of understanding what an individual neuron does is to sort of pluck it out of a network and look at the set of inputs to a model or regions of inputs to a model that cause that neuron to light up, to sort of take on a large activation value. And, you know, for example, if we take a state-of-the-art uh, place classification network and we pick up an individual neuron in it, we can find one that responds to these four images that we've drawn on the screen. And you can see from these images that this individual neuron is pretty clearly doing something interpretable, namely that it's functioning as a lamp detector. But trying to sort of figure these things out based on uh, just visualizations uh, is a pretty limited paradigm for understanding models. Uh, it's cognitively quite demanding for humans to figure out what groups of images like this have in common. Um, and it means that if we want to answer large-scale questions about model behavior, saying things like, what, is, what kinds of things does this network pay attention to? What kinds of features in the aggregate does this model have? This process is very hard to automate and would basically require a human to go through and manually describe a bunch of individual units. So to the extent that we think we need more complicated labels or want to automate the process uh, of assigning sort of human interpretable descriptions to individual uh, neurons in a network, what a reasonable way to go about doing this is to think about labeling these groups of exemplars. Uh, so, you know, 
to explain an individual neuron, we'll first find the regions uh, of model inputs that that neuron responds to, and then we'll just generate natural language descriptions of those regions. Um, and this is a problem that we actually know how to do pretty well using other learned models, uh, in particular the really well-studied problem of image captioning. Uh, and so I'm, you know, again, going to skip over a ton of technical details here, and there are a bunch of details in making this work actually right. Um, but at a high level, what we're going to do is we're going to train a model that looks at image regions that an individual feature responds to, or you know, more generically, input regions that an individual feature responds to, um, and automate the process of generating natural language descriptions of those features just by starting with a data set of images or image regions that humans have labeled with descriptions of what they are. And the important thing is that what we get out of this is an automated labeling procedure that can take in a new neural network that it's never seen before, containing a bunch of neurons whose function we've never seen before, and automatically label these neurons with descriptions uh, of the actual input regions that they respond to and more generically to their role in the larger computation performed by a network. And we find all kinds of incredibly fine-grained things in this paradigm. Uh, we find, you know, edge detectors, and very, in particular, very specific ed edge detectors, things that respond to top boundaries of horizontal objects, as well as, you know, sort of super high-level semantic things, uh, like neurons that respond to classes like keyboards, and everything in between. Textures like ridges, sort of gross morphological things like long slender objects, uh, and, and various other sort of parts and holes and, and actions and things like that. Okay. So what is a, a neuron labeling procedure like this actually useful for? Why might we, as users of a model, want to be able to generate descriptions of individual features? Uh, we're going to look at a couple of examples of this. Uh, one thing that has been recently discovered about models, you know, sort of big models trained on images and text together, um, is that they're susceptible to a very specific kind of adversarial attack, where if you just sort of write text uh, on top of images, uh, many state-of-the-art image classification models will now classify those images according to the text rather than according to the underlying image. Uh, and so, you know, we can trick models into classifying apples as iPods by just writing the word iPod on apples, and so on and so forth. Um, and if we look inside these models, we can see that this is because they actually contain individual neurons that are specialized for recognizing text. Um, and this neuron labeling procedure that we just described is able to find these neurons, right? And so here's uh, one whose activation patterns we're visualizing that we're able to automatically label as a neuron that recognizes words and letters. And so a reasonable hypothesis is that this, you know, these, this kind of vulnerability, this sensitivity to natural language text, could be removed from these models if we could only remove the individual neurons that were responsible for recognizing text. Um, and sure enough, this is actually true, and that we can sort of increase model robustness to these text-based attacks just by deleting a subset of the neurons in them uh, that we are able to automatically label as text recognizers. So, you know, as an example of what this looks like in practice, uh, here's two images that an image classifier labels as images of cars and chihuahuas, and after automatically deleting the neurons that we've automatically labeled as text detectors, we're able to correctly classify these now as an image of a ship and an image of a frog. Uh, so we can use these kinds of natural language-based descriptions of computations in deep networks to make those networks more robust uh, to spurious feature correlations or adversarial attacks or things like that. Another way we can use this tool is just to really help us understand whether, uh, for example, steps that we take to uh, remove information from data sets or to anonymize models or, or be more sensitive to privacy to see whether those steps are actually working. Uh, and so, as an example, uh, there's recently come out a version of the ImageNet data set uh, in which all of the faces have been blurred out in order to make this data set more sensitive to sort of privacy information. Um, and it's reasonable to ask, if we train a model on this data set of blurred faces, how much does this model actually learn about human faces anyway? Uh, and, you know, it might learn things about faces because information about face shape is still reconstructable from the sort of uh, low frequency information in these blurred regions, or because the blurring procedure doesn't totally work and that there are some unblurred faces that wind up in this data set, and many other reasons. Anyway, if we go out and we train a model on this blurred ImageNet data set, uh, we do in fact automatically label some neurons inside these trained models as face detectors. And if we look at uh, the regions of 
of inputs, just like we did before, that these neurons respond to, we see that they really are face detectors. And in some cases, detectors for even finer grade demographic information, right, like this one on the top, uh, that when it responds to pictures of faces, seems to preferentially respond to faces that are sort of female presenting. And so we can use this tool to help us understand how much these kinds of techniques uh, for anonymizing data actually achieve their goals and to figure out what kinds of features models are still able to, er, to extract uh, from data sets that have been cleaned in this way. And most importantly, what I think this gives us is a tool that allows us to take steps towards answering the sort of bigger question that we started this talk with, uh, or this section with, uh, which is the question of how we might understand what entire networks have learned uh, by taking these sort of descriptions of individual features and automatically pulling out the ones that are suspicious or involve sensitive or protective attributes uh, and might require more careful auditing or more focused training. But I will wrap up here. Uh, so just to sort of summarize today's talk, I've presented methods for using language as a tool for training uh, and at least beginning to understand deep networks. We saw that we could use language, natural language annotations, uh, to train automated agents that can act in the world, to infer programs that describe the structure of the world, and to label neurons in deep networks with descriptions of their functions. And I think this at least lays out a path uh, toward that sort of bigger picture at the beginning of the talk of making, uh, scaling these tools up and making them more general and making them interactive, um, and ultimately making language a general purpose tool for training arbitrary models uh, for arbitrary tasks uh, in the same way that we train people to accomplish complex skills in the real world. I'm very honored to be here to share my work on socially aware natural language processing. Before getting started, I want to introduce my research lab called the Social and the Language Technology Lab, SALT. On the left side are my group of students. Um, many of the work I'm going to talk about today should, should be credited to them. Uh, our research lab works on machine learning for low-resourced natural language processing, especially in low-resourced data, dialect, and language settings. We also look at how to make a generation, like natural language generation, more user-centric. Recently, we have been looking at the dialogue summarization um, around how to turn a natural language-based conversation into a very short one. Um, we also look at how to measure and mitigate the biases in NLP models, as well as identifying hate speech from social media posts. Uh, let's get started. Over the last few years, NLP has made a great progress and uh, produced industry applications such as internet search, machine translation, dialogue systems, question answering, many of those. The field has also moved from rule-based systems to statistical machine learning, and most recently to deep learning, um, deep neural network. Since 2018, um, language model has progressed a lot in terms of model size and the task performance. On translation, it's approaching human level accuracy, as well as in speech recognition and the reading comprehension. So the question is, are we done solving NLP? Apparently not. Current systems um, still cannot uh, figure out uh, social norms, value, and the culture encoded language. Uh, models don't do a good job at uh, recognizing meaning, semantics, let alone in-depth reading here. How can we enable NLP systems to understand the language and make inference like a human? The world has over six to seven thousand languages. Currently, we only focus on a few of them, especially uh, with the emphasis on English. Um, NLP fails when it comes to low-resourced settings. Moreover, fairness and the biases continue to, to be problems. Our current language technologies are limited to a few use scenarios. How can we make sure those technology solutions can reach a much broader population, 
and without delay in implementation to the corresponding community to be served. My research aimed to look at those three challenges um, through three perspectives. Uh, first, uh, as I mentioned, uh, people use language as a tool to accomplish their goal. Thus, for um, NLP systems to understand a language like a human, we must pay attention to the social factors in language. How can our resulting systems be aware of social factors and structures in our interaction? Second, uh, most social contexts have a lot of data, but not a very much well-labeled data. Can we do learning with limited data for those low-resource scenarios? Third, uh, um, current NLP systems may behave with biases and hatred towards others. To address those and also to make sure NLP can reach a broader audience, we choose to work on responsible NLP for social good. In this talk, I will go through some quick examples to, to give you a flavor of what is um, social NLP and how we approach those challenges. Before going into details of socially aware language understanding, um, the question we want to ask is, why do we need it? I argue that uh, social factors are key to ultimate language understanding. Let's look at one example on the left. Think about uh, if you are going to write a message, writing an email to the president of a company versus messaging your friend on Twitter. Are the messages going to be the same from those two scenarios? No, we know it's not the same. Even the content could be same in some cases, the language style, the politeness, how you call others in those uh, messages are very different. In another scenario here, if we think about uh, a child, a seven-year-old, uh, asking a question to our AI in a question-answering fashion, where does the sound go at night? Apparently, AI can do it correct from a question-answering perspective. However, the language returned here may not be understandable by a child. So how can we make sure such language or such technologies can be delivered to user in a more appropriate way? Uh, one very extreme case here is that uh, AI do not understand our social norm or culture here. Um, if in any case, in a very extreme case, it's been asked to help with a eulogy here. Um, we know there are certain norms we need to follow to give such a speech, but apparently something I put here is not much of such a speech. I want to argue that language contains both social and the content information. Getting content correct is not enough, such as answering question correct. The next level of language understanding needs to be aware of social context of language, what is said, who says it, in what context, and for what goals. We cannot do this through um, deeper and bigger neural network. We need to think about something else. Um, as one of the initial effort and the building on systemic functional linguistics with my collaborator, we propose a set of practical social factors that could enable NLP systems to be aware of social aspects of language. Um, as you can probably see from this colorful diagram, we provide a more practical conceptual taxonomy of a wider range of social factors in language, including who is a speaker, who is a receiver, what's the social relation between them, what is the context that enables such conversation, what are the social norms guiding the entire conversation, what is the culture and ideology behind this interaction, and what is the community goal here for the entire uh, interaction? 
My research has started to address some aspects, such as um, leveraging personalized information for better response generation, recognizing humor and annoying behaviors uh, in online social media, um, detecting the social role people occupy uh, by looking at their language. We also uh, analyze how long words uh, work in multilingual contexts, as well as how people use language to exchange social support or persuade others. In one study, um, we actually look at uh, what makes language persuasive. Persuasion is everywhere in human interaction, um, from a mother convincing her four-year-old to eat a vegetable, to advertisers trying to sell us a camera. People look to influence others through language. But if we look at the example here, why they are persuasive? Are there any patterns or tactics people use to work on those messages? To this end, we translate the social theories uh, from social science, especially the dual information processing theory um, into a set of language cues, uh, such as mentioning and uh, emphasizing scarcity, urgency, talking about authority, um, or simply being emotional. We then build the machine learning models uh, with limited supervision to model persuasion here. Um, on the right, uh, this is the architecture we did for predicting persuasive strategy in language. We assume that each sentence only occupy or only use one persuasion strategy. For each sentence in a document or in a paragraph, uh, we then aggregate all those persuasion strategies together to predict the overall persuasiveness that is, how many people get convinced. Our model achieved a state of art performance when predicting persuasion strategy and also offer great interpretability in terms of why a specific message is persuasive. If it's not, how can we improve it? Building socially aware language technologies also require extracting structures from social interaction and incorporating them into different tasks. Our recent work focusing on uh, summarizing daily conversations, uh, like what we are seeing on the left, into a short summary. This is a more challenging task compared to traditional document summarization, as conversations are often uh, informal with important information scattered in the whole chat. We propose to extract an explicit structure from conversation to better represent the conversation and then generate summary compared to simply rely on end-to-end -end black box neural networks. So here um, we uncover four types of structures. We look at how conversation topic shift um, how conversation progress from a conversation stage perspective. Also, like discourse relations between different utterance returned by uh, discourse parsing. And action graph that capture who did what through open information extraction. To give a quick example here, let's look at those two sentences highlighted in blue and highlighted in red. As human, it's clear to us that uh, uh, Hannah is trying to answer the question that James uh, posted. So in this case, we know that this two has very direct connection versus this right sentence may be very weakly related to um, what are you up to. So how can we teach our computers what is the relation between those two authors here? And more importantly, who is available um, on Saturday for what type of event? To increase the factualness in generation and also reduce hallucination of AI models memorizing something from the history. Um, here we 
introduce two type of graph type of information. The first is from this discourse graph, where we model the uh, relation between any two utterance here. We also look at uh, who did what type of triplets, trying to extract uh, such factual information from people's utterance. We build a sequence to sequence neural network here. Um, basically, we encode each utterance through a transformer encoder. Um, we then uh, process the discourse relation graph and action graph through graph attention network. For the decoding part, we actually introduce this multi-granularity decoder, uh, which generates summaries based on all level of information here, uh, including utterance, including action graph, and the discourse graph. Our uh, neural conversation summarization model um, actually worked very well um, on this daily chat conversation summarization data set called Samsung. Um, it's actually achieving a state of art performance. Not only on in-domain benchmark, we also look at uh, zero-shot generalization, that is out-of-domain generalization. Um, we pick a corpus called argumentative dialogue, which is a different domain compared to where the model is trained. We found that adding discourse and action information help improve the zero-shot performance. As you can see from this table, it's actually almost double the performance. We performed the human evaluation as well and received a consistent improvement. Moving forward, um, we aim to bridge the gap between current NLP systems and the social intelligence um, for pushing NLP to the next level. We plan to do so by having a better representation of tax and the social factors um, to try to model uh, how humans do certain tasks. We want to enable systems to do in-depth understanding and reasoning over massive user data, and also by uh, utilizing social knowledge and common sense reasoning uh, beyond any fixed corpus or benchmark. The second direction of my work is around the learning with limited supervision. As mentioned, um, NLP has achieved a great performance in most supervised settings. However, for low resource data settings, such models often fail. To this end, we develop a novel learning algorithm such as data augmentation and semi-supervised learning to reduce the dependency of supervised model on labeled data. Um, for text classification, inspired by a technique called uh, mix-up from computer vision, we introduce a text mix-up, which is a linguistically informed technique to create augmented data. It does this by doing interpolation of text representation in the hidden space, like the xi and xj here to create a, a virtual augmented data point. In this way, we can create a lot of augmented data to enlarge the training corpus. Our text mix-up technique significantly outperform current pre-trained and fine-tuned models on text classification benchmark. Not only learning with limited data, um, Recently, we have also been thinking about uh, how to only use a very small portion of tunable parameters to achieve equally accurate performance on some task. Um, for structure prediction, a sequence labeling, a, a different uh, fundamental task in natural language processing. Um, here, we look at the named entity recognition um, basically, the goal is to pick up the text span that refers to a named entity here. We extended the mix-up augmentation method uh, we introduced earlier to create a virtual samples by doing linear interpolation of sequences 
strategically. So here, um, we are doing it either by sampling from nearest neighbor in the semantic meaning space or within the same sentences. We extend it to a semi-supervised setting together with a consistent loss for unlabeled data. We achieve state-of-art performance. As we can see from this table, even when we use 5% data or 10% data, we can do a decent job compared to when we use a lot of the data. Um, for low resource, the language and dialects, uh, my students found that uh, current NLP models on hate speech detection and the natural language inference perform poorly on African American vernacular English. And we are working on mitigating such racial disparity by constructing benchmark and performing language agonistic representation learning. Looking ahead, we aim to advance algorithms of learning with limited supervision for both low-resourced data and the language settings. Last but not least, um, we apply and extend the NLP method for social good in a variety of domains such as crowdfunding or, and mental health. Um, for example, we study ill-intentioned language use, uh, developing algorithms to mitigate biases in text. Um, we also work with a mental health platform called the Seven Cups of Tea to empower volunteer therapists with algorithm-mediated feedback to help with online therapy, especially um, in a recent work, we actually uh, look at uh, how to build an interactive intelligent system to offer feedback for users with their CV and the job search, uh, especially for people from underrepresented groups that are marginalized from expensive career services. Um, to give a quick example here, uh, we look at how to neutralize a uh, buyer statement into neutral point of view. Um, we offer a large-scale parallel corpus of buyers and tech, uh, neutral taxpayers, and uh, our model can rewrite a buyer statement into neutral ones with decent performance. We also evaluate it across four dimensions, and we found that uh, it's it's actually offering very interesting modifications into some of the uh, subjectively biased statement. Uh, in another work, we build interventions to help people who use online cancer support groups to better communicate with others. We formulate it as a novel recommendation problem design a feature-based matrix factorization model to predict uh, users' preference over questions. So basically, who are interested in what type of questions or topics on a forum. We then build a um, max cost flow model to manage practical constraints such as load balancing and expertise matching. In this way, we can guarantee uh, users are not overwhelmed with the uh, type of information they receive, and they are uh, referred to or redirected to the content they feel comfortable of talking about. With its good offline performance, we further deploy it to connect patients with appropriate information providers and caregivers on the left side of American Cancer Society's Cancer Survivor Network. Over 11,000 people have signed up and uh, used our deployed intervention. Um, results show that a recommendation increase people's reading behavior, especially encourage people to look outside of their favorite forum. Um, with that, I would like to conclude my talk. Um, the three directions or the three themes I want to share with you all are around the socially aware language understanding, learning with limited supervision, and the responsible NLP for social good. Thank you for watching this video.